all appearance and disappearance presupposes a change against some changeless background. Some seed consciousness must be existing even during sleep or swoon. On waking up, the experience runs, I am the body in the world. It may appear to arise in succession, but in fact, it is all simultaneous. A single idea of having a body in a world. Can there be the sense of I am without being somebody or other? Don't you see that all your problems are your body's problems? Food, clothing, shelter, family, friends, name, fame, security, survival, all these lose their meaning the moment you realize that you may not be a mere body. In a way, you are all the bodies, hearts and minds, and much more. Go deep into the sense of I am, and you will find it. How do you find a thing you have mislaid or forgotten? You keep it in your mind until you recall it. The sense of being, of I am, is the first to emerge. Ask yourself whence it comes, or just watch it quietly. When the mind stays in the I am, Without moving, you enter a state which cannot be verbalized, but which can be experienced. All you need to do is to try and try again. After all, the sense I am is always with you. Only you have attached all kinds of things to it body, feelings, thoughts, ideas, possessions, and so on. All these self-identifications are misleading. Because of them, you take yourself to be what you are not. What you are cannot be described except as total negation. All you can say is, I am not this, I am not that. You are nothing perceivable or imaginable. Yet, without you, there can be neither perception nor imagination. You observe the heart feeling, the mind thinking, the body acting. The very act of perceiving shows that you are not what you perceive. Can there be perception, experience, without you? It is the experiencer that imparts reality to experience. An experience which you cannot have, of what value is it to you? In every experience, there arises the experiencer of it. Memory creates the illusion of continuity. 
identity, and continuity are not the same. Just as each flower has its own color, but all colors are caused by the same light, so do many experiencers appear in the undivided and indivisible awareness, each separate in memory, identical in essence. This essence is the root, the foundation, the timeless and spaceless possibility of all experience. You need not get at it, for you are it. It will get at you if you give it a chance. Let go of your attachment to the unreal, and the real will swiftly and smoothly step into its own. Stop imagining yourself being or doing this or that and the realization that you are the source and heart of all will dawn upon you. With this realization will come great love, which is not choice or predilection nor attachment, but a power which makes all things love worthy and lovable. My life is a succession of events, just like yours. Only I am detached and see the passing show as a passing show, while you stick to things and move along with them. I trusted my guru. He told me, I am nothing but myself, and I believed him. Trusting him, I behaved accordingly and ceased caring for what was not me nor mine. Things happen without cause and reason. Why attach importance to opinions, even your own? Everything is a miracle. As to my mind, there is no such thing. There is consciousness in which everything happens. Your mind is all with things, people, and ideas, never with yourself. Bring yourself into focus. Become aware of your own existence. See how you function. Watch the motives and the results of your actions. Study the prison you have built around yourself by inadvertence. By knowing what you are not, you come to know yourself. The only way back to yourself is through refusal and rejection. One thing is certain. The real is not imaginary. It is not a product of the mind. Even the sense I am is not continuous, though it is a useful pointer. It shows where to seek 
but not what to seek. Just have a good look at it. Once you are convinced that you cannot say truthfully about yourself anything except I am, and that nothing that can be pointed at can be yourself, the need for the I am is over. You are no longer intent on verbalizing what you are. All you need is to get rid of the tendency to define yourself. All definitions apply to your body only and to its expressions. Once this obsession with the body goes, you will revert to your natural state spontaneously and effortlessly. Between the banks of pain and pleasure, the river of life flows. It is only when the mind refuses to flow with life and gets stuck at the banks that it becomes a problem. By flowing with life, I mean acceptance, letting come what comes and go what goes. Desire not, fear not, observe the actual, as and when it happens. For you are not what happens, you are to whom it happens. Ultimately, even the observer you are not. You are the ultimate potentiality of which the all-embracing consciousness is the manifestation and expression. There is something exceptional, unique, about the present event, which the previous or the coming do not have. There is a livingness about it, an actuality. It stands out as if illumined. There is the stamp of reality on the actual, which the past and future do not have. I am real. For I am always now, in the present, and what is with me now shares in my reality. The past is in memory, the future in imagination. It is my own reality that I impart to the present event. We consider memories only when they come into the present. The forgotten is not counted until one is reminded, which implies bringing the past into the now. Desire is the memory of pleasure, and fear is the memory of pain. Both make the mind restless. Moments of pleasure are merely gaps in the stream of pain. How can the mind be happy? The universe is complete. And where there is completeness, where nothing lacks, what can give pain? The mind, by its very nature, divides and opposes.
but there is another mind in going beyond the limiting, dividing, and opposing mind, in ending the mental process as we know it, when this comes to an end, that mind is born. Joy and sorrow exist no longer, not as we know them, as desirable or repugnant. It becomes rather a question of love, seeking expression, and meeting with obstacles. The inclusive mind is love in action, battling against circumstances, initially frustrated, ultimately victorious. The mind creates the abyss the heart crosses it. Like everything mental, the so-called law of causation contradicts itself. No thing in existence has a particular cause. The entire universe contributes to the existence of even the smallest thing. Nothing could be as it is without the universe being what it is. When the source and ground of everything is the only cause of everything, to speak of causality as a universal law is wrong. The universe is not bound by its content, because its potentialities are infinite. Besides, it is a manifestation or expression of a principle fundamentally and totally free. There is a lot of activity going on because of ignorance. Would people know that nothing can happen unless the entire universe makes it happen? They would but achieve much more with less expenditure of energy. When the past and future are seen in the timeless now as parts of a common pattern. The idea of cause and effect loses its validity and creative freedom takes its place. Your own mother was not needed to give you birth. You could have been born from some other woman but you could not have been born without the sun and the earth. Even these could not have caused your birth without the most important factor, your own desire to be born. The real world is beyond the mind's ken. We see it through the net of our desires divided into pleasure and pain, right and wrong, inner and outer. To see the universe as it is, you must step beyond the net. It is not hard to do so, for the net is full of holes. Look at the net and its many contradictions. You do and undo at every step. You want peace, love, happiness, and work hard to create pain, hatred, and war. You want longevity and overeat. You want friendship and exploit. See your net as made of such contradictions and remove them. Your very seeing them will make them go.
for everything there are innumerable causal factors but the source of all that is is the infinite possibility the supreme reality which is in you and which throws its power and light and love on every experience but this source is not a cause and no cause is a source because of that I say everything is uncaused you may try to trace how a thing happens but you cannot find out why a thing is as it is a thing is as it is because the universe is as it is is the witness consciousness permanent or not it is not permanent the knower rises and sets with the known that in which both the knower and the known arise and set is beyond time the words permanent or eternal do not apply the absence of experience too is experience it is like entering a dark room and saying I see nothing just as the knower of the body appears at birth so he disappears at death and nothing remains life remains consciousness needs a vehicle and an instrument for its manifestation when life produces another body another knower comes into being is there a causal link between the successive body knowers or body minds yes there is something that may be called the memory body or causal body a record of all that was thought wanted and done it is like a cloud of images held together what is this sense of a separate existence it is a reflection in a separate body of the one reality in this reflection the unlimited and the limited are confused and taken to be the same to undo this confusion is the purpose of yoga does not death undo this confusion in death only the body dies life does not consciousness does not reality does not die and the life is never so alive as after death but does one get reborn what was born must die only the unborn is deathless find what is it that never sleeps and never wakes and whose pale reflection is our sense of I how do you go about finding anything by keeping your mind and heart on it interest there must be and steady remembrance to remember what needs to be remembered is the secret of success you come to it through earnestness be free from contradictions the goal and the way must not be on different levels life and light must not quarrel behavior must not betray belief call it honesty integrity wholeness you must not go back undo uproot abandon the conquered ground tenacity of purpose and honesty in pursuit will bring you to your goal all will come as you go on take the first step 
all blessings come from within. Turn within. I am, you know. Be with it all the time you can spare, until you revert to it spontaneously. There is no simpler and easier way. What is the purpose of meditation? We know the outer world of sensations and actions, but of our inner world of thoughts and feelings we know very little. The primary purpose of meditation is to become conscious of and familiar with our inner life. The ultimate purpose is to reach the source of life and consciousness. Incidentally, practice of meditation deeply affects our character. We are slaves to what we do not know. Of what we know, we are masters. Whatever vice or weakness in ourselves, we discover and understand its causes and its workings. We overcome it by the very knowing. The unconscious dissolves when brought into the conscious. The dissolution of the unconscious releases energy. The mind feels adequate and becomes quiet. When the mind is quiet, we come to know ourselves as the pure witness. We withdraw from the experience and ex experiencer and stand apart in pure awareness, which is between and beyond the two. The personality based on self-identification, on imagining oneself to be something, I am this, I am that, continues but only as a part of the objective world. Its identification with the witness snaps. The sattva is pure and strong always. It is like the sun. It may seem obscured by clouds and dust, but only from the point of view of the perceiver. Deal with the causes of obscuration, not with the sun. Whatever happens, I must be there to witness it. What begins and ends is mere appearance. The world can be said to appear, but not to be. The appearance may last very long on some scale of time, and be very short on another, but ultimately it comes to the same. Whatever is time-bound is momentary and has no reality. I see the world as it is, a momentary appearance in consciousness. The supreme state is uncaused, independent, unrelated, undivided, uncomposed, unshakable, unquestionable, unreachable by effort. Every positive definition is from memory and therefore inapplicable, and yet my state is supremely actual and therefore possible, realizable, attainable. Past and future are in the mind only. I am now. My world is real, true, 
as it is perceived, while yours appears and disappears according to the state of your mind. Your world is something alien, and you are afraid of it. My world is myself. I am at home. As long as the mind is there, your body and your world are there. Your world is mind made, subjective, enclosed within the mind, fragmentary, temporary, personal, hanging on the thread of memory. I live in a world of realities, while yours is of imaginings. Your world is personal, private, unshareable, intimately your own. In your world, you are truly alone, enclosed in your ever-changing dream, which you take for life. My world is an open world, common to all, accessible to all. In my world, there is community, insight, love, real quality. All are one, and the one is all. I appear to hear and see and talk and act, but to me it just happens, as to you digestion or perspiration happens. The body-mind machine looks after it, but leaves me out of it. I need not worry about words and actions. In my world, nothing ever goes wrong. It is the nature of the mind to roam about. All you can do is to shift the focus of consciousness beyond the mind. Refuse all thoughts except one, the thought, I am. The mind will rebel in the beginning, but with patience and perseverance, it will yield and keep quiet. Once you are quiet, things will begin to happen spontaneously and quite naturally, without any interference on your part. Live your life as it comes but alertly, watchfully, allowing everything to happen as it happens, doing the natural things the natural way, suffering, rejoicing, as life brings, this also is a way. Pleasure and pain alternate inexorably. Happiness comes from the self and can be found in the self only. Find your real self and all else will come with it. It is not your real being that is restless, but its reflection in the mind appears restless because the mind is restless. The true self stands beyond the mind, aware but unconcerned.
You are the self, here and now. Leave the mind alone. Stand aware and unconcerned, and you will realize that to stand alert but detached, watching events come and go, is an aspect of your real nature. The aspects of your real nature are infinite in number. Realize one, and you will realize all. Want what you have, and care not for what you don't have. The very search for pleasure is the cause of pain. Your confusion is only in your mind. Be alert. Question. Observe. Investigate. Learn all you can about confusion how it operates, what it does to you and others. By being clear about confusion, you become clear of confusion. Nothing is permanent. All wears out breaks down, dissolves. Notice how little you remember, even when fully awake. You cannot say that you were not conscious during sleep, you just don't remember. A gap in memory is not necessarily a gap in consciousness. You will be aware that you are asleep. You want to eternalize the mind, which is not possible. You cannot eternalize a transient thing. Only the changeless is eternal. If you want peace, you must ask with an undivided heart and live an integrated life. Detach yourself from all that makes your mind restless. Renounce all that disturbs its peace. If you want peace, deserve it. Seek a clear mind and a clean heart. All you need is to keep quietly alert inquiring into the real nature of yourself. This is the only way to peace. Stay open and quiet. That is all. The world you can perceive is a very small world indeed and it is entirely private. Take it to be a dream and be done with it. In fact, all you know is your own private world, however well you have furnished it with your imaginations and expectations.
perception, imagination, expectation, anticipation, illusion, all are based on memory. There are hardly any borderlines between them. They just merge into each other. All are responses of memory. It is not so bad. You do remember a lot. Unconscious memory makes the world in which you live so familiar. But with you, it is all. With me, it is almost nothing. Knowing the world to be a part of myself, I pay it no more attention than you pay to the food you have eaten. I have eaten up the world, and I need not think of it anymore. How can I hurt something which is one with me? On the contrary, without thinking of the world, whatever I do will be of benefit to it, just as the body sets itself right unconsciously, so am I ceaselessly active in setting the world right. I am aware of the immense suffering of the world much more than you are. I look at it through the eyes of God and find that all is well. All these sufferings are man-made, and it is within man's power to put an end to them. Karma is the law that works for righteousness. It is the healing hand of God. When you desire the common good, the whole world desires with you. Make humanity's desire your own and work for it. There you cannot fail. Desires that lead to sorrow are wrong, and those which lead to happiness are right. Use your mind. Remember. Observe. You are not different from others. Most of their experiences are valid for you too. Think clearly and deeply. Go into the entire structure of your desires and their ramifications. To go beyond yourself, you must know yourself. What you are, you already are. By knowing what you are not, you are free of it and remain in your own natural state. It all happens quite spontaneously and effortlessly. You discover that there is nothing to discover. You are what you are, and that is all. You are the pure awareness that illumines consciousness and its infinite content. Realize this and live accordingly. Focus your mind on I am, which is pure and simple being.
purify yourself by a well-ordered and useful life. Watch over your thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. This will clear your vision. Every grain of sand is God. To know it is important, but that is only the beginning. Discover all you are not, body, feelings, thoughts, ideas, time, space, being and not being, this or that. Nothing concrete or abstract you can point out to is you. Go within and discover what you are not. Nothing else matters. The world is but a reflection of my imagination. The world is in me. The world is myself. Awareness is primordial. It is the original state, beginningless, endless, uncaused, unsupported, without parts, without change. Consciousness is on contact, a reflection against a surface a state of duality. There can be no consciousness without awareness, but there can be awareness without consciousness, as in deep sleep. Awareness is absolute. Consciousness is relative to its content. Consciousness is always of something. Consciousness is partial and changeful. Awareness is total, changeless, calm, and silent. It is the common matrix of every experience. Interest in your stream of consciousness takes you to awareness. It is not a new state. It is at once recognized as the original, basic existence, which is life itself, and also love and joy. Instead of seeing things as imagined, learn to see them as they are. The thought, I am, is the polishing cloth. Use it. I met my guru when I was 34 and realized by 37. Pleasure and pain lost their sway over me. I was free from desire and fear. I found myself full, needing nothing. I saw that in the ocean of pure awareness, on the surface of the universal consciousness, the numberless waves of the phenomenal worlds arise and subside beginninglessly and endlessly. As consciousness, 
they are all me. As events, they are all mine. There is a mysterious power that looks after them. That power is awareness, self, life, God, whatever name you give it. It is the foundation, the ultimate support of all that is, just like gold is the basis for all gold jewelry. And it is so intimately ours. Abstract the name and shape from the jewelry, and the gold becomes obvious. Be free of name and form, and of the desires and fears they create. Then what remains? The void remains, but the void is full to the brim. It is the eternal potential as consciousness is the eternal actual. When life and death are seen as essential to each other, as two aspects of one being, that is immortality. To see the end in the beginning, and the beginning in the end, is the intimation of eternity. Definitely, immortality is not continuity. Only the process of change continues. Nothing lasts. The mind looks after the body. I need not interfere. What needs to be done is being done in the normal and natural way. You may not be quite conscious of your physiological functions, but when it comes to thoughts and feelings, desires and fears, you become acutely self-conscious. To me, these two are largely unconscious. I find myself talking to people or doing things quite correctly and appropriately, without being very much conscious of them. It looks as if I live my physical waking life automatically, reacting spontaneously and accurately. Devotion to your goal makes you live a clean and orderly life given to search for truth and to helping people. And realization makes noble virtue easy and spontaneous. By removing for good the obstacles in the shape of desires and fears and wrong ideas. A tremendously complex work is going on all the time in your brain and body. Are you conscious of it? Not at all. What is normal? Is your life obsessed by desires and fears, full of strife and struggle? meaningless and joyless normal? To be acutely conscious of your body, is it normal? A healthy body, a healthy mind, live largely unperceived by their owner. Only occasionally, through pain or suffering, they call for attention and insight.
The entire purpose of a clean and well-ordered life is to liberate man from the thrall of chaos and the burden of sorrow. Once you realize that the person is merely a shadow of the reality, but not reality itself, you cease to fret and worry. You agree to be guided from within, and life becomes a journey into the unknown. Your mind is focused in the world. Mine is focused in reality. The universe works by itself. That I know. What else do I need to know? The Supreme gives existence to the mind. The mind gives existence to the body. However long a life may be, it is but a moment and a dream. I am timeless and spaceless. Nothing happens to me. Everything just happens. What is beyond both, supporting both, is the supreme state, a state of utter stillness and silence. Whoever goes there disappears. It is unreachable by words or mind. You may call it God or Parabrahman or Supreme Reality, but these are names given by the mind. It is the nameless, contentless, effortless and spontaneous state beyond being and not being. The only way of knowing it is to be it. God is not running the world. All happens by itself. All is a play in consciousness. It is what is the timeless reality, unbelievably hard and solid. When you believe yourself to be a person, you see persons everywhere. In reality, there are no persons, only threads of memories and habits. At the moment of realization, the person ceases. Identity remains, but identity is not a person. It is inherent in the reality itself. The person has no being in itself. It is a reflection in the mind of the witness, the I am, which again is a mode of being. Energy comes first, for everything is a form of energy. Consciousness itself is the source of everything.
in reality only the ultimate is the rest is a matter of name and form what is real is nameless and formless pure energy of life and light of consciousness the world and the mind are states of being the supreme is not a state it pervades all states but it is not a state of something else it is entirely uncaused independent complete in itself beyond time and space mind and matter it leaves no traces there is nothing to recognize it by it must be seen directly by giving up all search for signs and approaches plurality and diversity are the play of the mind only reality is one it is deep and dark mystery beyond mystery all states and conditions are of the mind not making use of one's consciousness is samadhi you just leave your mind alone you want nothing neither from your body nor from your mind everything is uncaused the world has no cause i see only consciousness and know everything to be but consciousness as you know the picture on the cinema screen to be but light the light does not move at all what moves is the film which is the mind everything is interlinked and therefore everything has numberless causes the entire universe contributes to the least thing a thing is as it is because the world is as it is you see you deal in gold ornaments and i in gold all is only gold why worry so much about causation what do causes matter when things themselves are transient let come what comes and let go what goes why catch hold of things and inquire about their causes there is only light and the light is all everything else is but a picture made of light the picture is in the light and the light is in the picture life and death self and non-self abandon all these ideas they are of no use to you when the mind is still absolutely silent the waking state is no more a world of which you are the only source and ground is fully within your power to change what is created can always be dissolved and recreated 
All will happen as you want it, provided you really want it. All is due to your having forgotten your own being. Having given reality to the picture on the screen, you love its people and suffer for them and seek to save them. It is just not so. You must begin with yourself. There is no other way. Work, of course. There is no harm in working. To take appearance for reality is a grievous sin and the cause of all calamities. You are the all-pervading, eternal, and infinitely creative awareness consciousness. You pray to save one while thousands die. And if all stop dying, there will be no space on earth. All is God's doing, no doubt. What is it to me, since I want nothing? What can God give me or take away from me? What is mine, is mine, and was mine even when God was not. Of course, it is a very tiny little thing, a speck, the sense, I am, the fact of being. This is my own place. Nobody gave it to me. The earth is mine. What grows on it is God's. I am is the root. God is the tree. Whom am I to worship and what for? Am I the devotee? or the object of devotion, I am neither. I am devotion itself. You got into the world by forgetting what you are, and you will get out of it by knowing yourself as you are. When you are free of the world, you can do something about it. As long as you are a prisoner of it, you are helpless to change it. On the contrary, whatever you do will aggravate the situation. Righteousness will undoubtedly make you and your world a comfortable, even happy place. But what is the use? There is no reality in it. It cannot last. A man willing to die for truth will get it. The Yani is the supreme and also the witness. He is both being and awareness. In relation to consciousness, he is awareness. In relation to the universe, he is pure being. The person is a very small thing. Actually, it is a composite. It cannot be said to exist by itself. Unperceived, it is just not there. It is but the shadow of the mind, the sum total of memories.
the supreme is the sun. It is the life which contains both consciousness and unconsciousness and is beyond both. In reality, there is only consciousness. All life is conscious, all consciousness alive. You would be wiser to deny the existence of what you imagine. It is the imagined that is unreal. The unexpected and the unpredictable are real. One is always free. You are both conscious and free to be conscious. Nobody can take this away from you. Do you ever know yourself non-existing or unconscious? There is no how here. Just keep in mind the feeling I am. Merge in it till your mind and feeling become one. By repeated attempts, you will stumble on the right balance of attention and affection, and your mind will be firmly established in the thought feeling I am. Correct your attitude to your body and leave it alone. Don't pamper, don't torture, just keep it going. Most of the time below the threshold of conscious attention. The state of craving for anything blocks all deeper experience. Nothing of value can happen to a mind which knows exactly what it wants, for nothing the mind can visualize and want is of much value. Want the best, the highest happiness, the greatest freedom. Desirelessness is the highest bliss. Your aims are small and low. They do not call for more. Only God's energy is infinite because he wants nothing for himself. Be like him and all your desires will be fulfilled. The higher your aims and vaster your desires, the more energy you will have for their fulfillment. Desire the good of all and the universe will work with you. What shall I find beyond the mind? the direct experience of being, knowing, and loving. I trusted my guru. I did what he told me to do. He told me to concentrate on I am, and I did. He told me that I am beyond all perceivables and conceivables. I believed. I gave my heart and soul, my entire attention, 
and the whole of my spare time. As a result of faith and earnest application, I realized myself within three years. Establish yourself firmly in the awareness of I am. This is the beginning and also the end of all endeavor. Awareness is my nature. Ultimately, I am beyond being and non-being. Meditation will help you to find your bonds, loosen them, untie them, and cast your moorings. When you are no longer attached to anything, you have done your share. The rest will be done for you. By the same power that brought you so far, that prompted your heart to desire truth and your mind to seek it. It is the same power that keeps you alive. You may call it life or the Absolute Supreme. To realize the Eternal is to become the Eternal, the Whole, the Universe with all it contains. Every event is the effect and the expression of the whole and is in fundamental harmony with the whole. All response from the whole must be right, effortless and instantaneous. To be a person, you must be self-conscious. Are you so always? Not when I sleep. During your waking hours, are you continually self-conscious? No. Are you a person during the gaps in self-consciousness? So, to be a person, you need memory. And without memory, what are you? Surely you can exist without memory. Can you tell me what you are in the intervals in between experiencing yourself as a person? Shall we call it impersonal existence? Do you remember every second of yesterday? Of course not. Were you then unconscious? Of course not. So you are conscious and yet you do not remember? Yes. Maybe you were conscious in sleep and just do not remember. Even a dream has existence when it is cognized and enjoyed or endured. Whatever you think and feel has being, but it may not be what you take it to be. What you think to be a person may be something quite different. Your ideas about yourself change from day to day and from moment to moment. Your self-image is the most changeful thing you have. 
it is utterly vulnerable at the mercy of a passerby, a bereavement, the loss of a job, an insult, and your image of yourself, which you call your person, changes deeply. To know what you are, you must first investigate and know what you are not. The clearer you understand that on the level of the mind you can be described in negative terms only, the quicker you will come to the end of your search and realize your limitless being. Consciousness Consciousness itself is the greatest painter. The entire world is a picture. The painter is in the picture. I see a painter painting a picture, the picture I call the world, the painter I call God. I am neither. I do not create, nor am I created. I contain all. Nothing contains me. As you learn to watch your mental world, you will find it even more colorful and perfect than what the body can provide. Remember that language is an instrument of the mind. It is made by the mind for the mind. It is like entering a dark room. You see nothing. You may touch, but you do not see no colors, no outlines. The windows open and the room is flooded with light. Colors and shapes come into being. The window is the giver of light, but not the source of it. The sun is the source. Similarly, matter is like the dark room. Consciousness, the window flooding matter with sensations and perceptions, and the supreme is the sun, the source both of matter and of light. The window may be closed or open, the sun shines all the time, it makes all the difference to the room, but none to the sun. Yet all this is secondary to the tiny little thing which is the I am. Without the I am, there is nothing. All knowledge is about the I am. False ideas about this I am lead to bondage. Right knowledge leads to freedom and happiness. To exist means to be something, a thing, a feeling, a thought, an idea. All existence is particular. Only being is universal, in the sense that every being is compatible with every other being. Existences clash. Being never. Existence means becoming, change, birth and death and birth again, while in being there is silent peace. If I create the world, 
Why have I made it so bad? Everyone lives in his own world. Not all the worlds are equally good or bad. What determines the difference? The mind that projects the world colors it its own way. When you meet a man, he is a stranger. When you marry him, he becomes your own self. When you quarrel, he becomes your enemy. It is your mind's attitude that determines what he is to you. Reality lies in objectivity. Everything is subjective, but the real is objective. It does not depend on memories and expectations, desires and fears, likes and dislikes. All is seen as it is. The person is never the subject. You can see a person, but you are not the person. You are always the supreme, which appears at a given point of time and space as the witness. A bridge between the pure awareness of the supreme and the manifold consciousness of the person. Once you realize that whatever appears before you cannot be yourself and cannot say I am, you are free of all your persons and their demands. The sense I am is your own. You cannot part with it, but you can impart it to anything, as in saying I am young, I am rich, and so on. But such self-identifications are patently false and the cause of bondage. To know the source is to be the source. When you realize that you are not the person, but the pure and calm witness, and that fearless awareness is your very being, you are the being. It is the source, the inexhaustible possibility. The Supreme makes everything possible, that is all. Everything is its own cause. Consciousness contains all. In consciousness all is possible. The root cause is one. The sense I am. The Supreme is the easiest to reach, for it is your very being. It is enough to stop thinking and desiring anything but the Supreme. The world is full of desires. Everybody wants something or other. Who is the desirer, the person, or the self? The self. All desires, holy and unholy, come from the self. They all hang on the sense, I am. All desires aim at happiness. O 
only desires motivated by love, goodwill, and compassion are beneficial to both the subject and object and can be fully satisfied. Passion is painful, compassion never. The entire universe strives to fulfill a desire born of compassion. The source of all has all. Whatever flows from it must be there already in seed form. And as a seed is the last of innumerable seeds and contains the experience and the promise of numberless forests, so does the unknown contain all that was or could have been and all that shall or would be. The entire field of becoming is open and accessible. Past and future coexist in the eternal now. I am fully conscious, but since no desire or fear enters my mind, there is perfect silence. Who knows the silence? Silence knows itself. Freedom from desire means this. The compulsion to satisfy is absent. Desires arise because you imagine that you were born and that you will die if you do not take care of your body. Desire for embodied existence is the root cause of trouble. To know itself the self must be faced with its opposite, the not-self. Desire leads to experience. Experience leads to discrimination, detachment, self-knowledge, liberation. And what is liberation after all? to know that you are beyond birth and death. Outside of the self, there is nothing. All is one, and all is contained in I am. In the waking and dream states, it is the person. In deep sleep and turiya, it is the self. All is one in essence and related in appearance. Truth is simple and open to all. Why do you complicate it? Truth is loving and lovable. 
It includes all, accepts all, purifies all. It is untruth that is difficult and a source of trouble. It always wants, expects, demands. Being false, it is empty, always in search of confirmation and reassurance. It is afraid of and avoids inquiry. Pursue any desire, it will always give you trouble. Nothing can set you free because you are free. See yourself with desireless clarity, that is all. How can time help you? Time is a succession of moments. Each moment appears out of nothing and disappears into nothing, never to reappear. How can you build on something so fleeting? Look to yourself for the permanent. Dive deep within and find what is real in you. Give up all questions except one. Who am I? After all, the only fact you are sure of is that you are. The I am is certain. The I am this is not. Struggle to find out what you are in reality. I am itself is God. The seeking itself is God. The consciousness in you and the consciousness in me, apparently two, really one, seek unity, and that is love. What do you love now? The I am. Give your heart and mind to it. Think of nothing else. This, when effortless and natural, is the highest state. In it, love itself is the lover and the beloved. All desire has its source in the self. It is all a matter of choosing the right desire. Only what liberates you from desire and fear and wrong ideas is good. As long as you worry about sin and virtue, you will have no peace. Sin and virtue refer to a person only. Without a sinful or virtuous person, what is sin or virtue? 
At the level of the Absolute, there are no persons. The ocean of pure awareness is neither virtuous nor sinful. Sin and virtue are invariably relative. The impersonal is real. The personal appears and disappears. I am is the impersonal being. I am this is the person. The person is relative and the pure being the fundamental. Go beyond the personal and see. I do not ask you to stop being that you cannot. I ask you only to stop imagining that you were born, have parents, are a body, will die and so on. Just try. Make a beginning. It is not as hard as you think. The impersonal cannot be described in terms of good and bad. It is being, wisdom, love, all absolute. Where is the scope for sin there? And virtue is only the opposite of sin. What you are really is your virtue. But the opposite of sin, which you call virtue, is only obedience born out of fear. Then why all the effort at being good? It keeps you on the move. You go on and on till you find God. Then God takes you into himself and makes you as he is. Whatever you do against your better knowledge is sin. To the spirit, there is no second. When the psyche is perfect, duality is no longer seen. A man who moves with the earth will necessarily experience days and nights. He who stays with the sun will know no darkness. My world is not yours. As I see it, you all are on a stage performing. There is no reality about your comings and goings, and your problems are so unreal. Stop. Stop hurting yourself and others. Stop suffering. Wake up.
When you begin to question your dream, awakening will not be far away. There is nothing to do, just be. Do nothing, be. I do not even say be yourself, since you do not know yourself, just be. Having seen that you are neither body nor mind, just be. Unconscious sadhana, spiritual practice, is most effective because it is spontaneous and steady. What a man appears to do or not to do is often deceptive. His apparent lethargy may be just a gathering of strength. The causes of our behavior are very subtle. One must not be quick to condemn, not even to praise. Remember that yoga is the work of the inner self on the outer self. All that the outer does is merely in response to the inner. The inner is the source of inspiration, the outer is moved by memory. The mistake of students consists in their imagining the inner to be something to get hold of and forgetting that all perceivables are transient and therefore unreal. Only that which makes perception possible, call it life, or Brahman, or what you like, is real. The body seeks to live. It is not life that needs the body. It is the body that needs life. Life is love, and love is life. What keeps the body together but love? What is desire but love of the self? What is fear but the urge to protect? And what is knowledge but the love of truth? The means and forms may be wrong, but the motive behind is always love, love of the me and the mine. The me and the mine may be small or may explode and embrace the universe, but love, love remains. Steady faith is stronger than destiny. Destiny is the result of causes mostly accidental and is therefore loosely woven. Confidence and good hope will overcome it easily.
The guru, the yani, thinks, feels, and acts integrally and in unity with all that lives. He may not even know the theory and practice of self-realization, and be born and bred free of religious and metaphysical notions, but there will not be the least flaw in his understanding and compassion. The Yani does not identify himself with name and shape. He uses memory, but memory cannot use him. All desire is born from memory and is within the realm of consciousness. What is beyond is clear of all striving. The very desire to go beyond consciousness is still in consciousness. Even pure awareness is a form of consciousness. Emptiness refers only to consciousness. Fullness and emptiness are relative terms. The real is really beyond. Beyond not in relation to consciousness, but beyond all relations of whatever kind. The difficulty comes with the word state. The real is not a state of something else. It is not a state of mind or consciousness or psyche, nor is it something that has a beginning and an end, being and not being. All opposites are contained in it, but it is not in the play of opposites. You must not take it to be the end of a transition. It is itself, after the consciousness as such is no more. Then words, I am man, or I am God, have no meaning. Only in silence and in darkness can it be heard and seen. Your world is transient, changeful. My world is perfect, changeless. You can tell me what you like about your world. I shall listen carefully, even with interest. Yet, not for a moment shall I forget that your world is not, that you are dreaming. My world has no characteristics by which it can be identified. You can say nothing about it. I am my world. My world is myself. It is complete and perfect. Every impression is erased. Every experience rejected. I need nothing not even myself, for myself I cannot lose. My world is single and very simple. In my world, nothing happens.
mine is a non-verbal world. My world is real, while yours is made of dreams. Talk is in your world. In mine, there is eternal silence. My silence sings. My emptiness is full. I lack nothing. You cannot know my world until you are there. I am alone, for I am all. You should consider more closely your own world. Examine it critically, and suddenly, one day you will find yourself in mine. What do we gain by it? You gain nothing. You leave behind what is not your own and find what you have never lost, your own being. There are no ruler and ruled here. There is no duality whatsoever. Still, you have a name and shape, display consciousness and activity. In your world, I appear so. In mine, I have being only, nothing else. You people are rich with your ideas of possession, of quantity and quality. I am completely without ideas. You are free to leave your world for mine. How? See your world as it is, not as you imagine it to be. Discrimination will lead to detachment. Detachment will ensure right action. Right action will build the inner bridge to your real being. Action is a proof of earnestness. Do what you are told, diligently and faithfully and all obstacles will dissolve. Are you happy? In your world I would be most miserable to wake up, to eat, to talk, to sleep again. What a bother! So you do not want to live even, to live to die, what meaningless words are these? When you see me alive, I am dead. When you think me dead, I am alive. All the sorrows of our world are as nothing to you. I am quite conscious of your troubles. Then what are you doing about them? There is nothing I need do. They come and they go.
My world is real. Yours is of the mind. Investigate your world. Apply your mind to it. Examine it critically. Scrutinize every idea about it. That will do. My experience is that everything is bliss, but the desire for bliss creates pain. Thus, bliss becomes the seed of pain. The entire universe of pain is born of a desire. Give up the desire for pleasure and you will not even know what pain is. For the sake of pleasure, you are committing many sins, and the fruits of sin are suffering and death. If the world is false, then God's plan and God are also false. Your mistake lies in your belief that you are born. You were never born, nor will you ever die. Salvation is to see things as they are. My guru said, deny existence to everything except yourself. Through desire you have created the world with its pains and pleasures. Pain is the background of pleasure. All seeking of pleasure is born in pain and ends in pain. It is the mind that is dull or restless, not you. Look, all kinds of things happen in this room. Do I cause them to happen? They just happen. So it is with you. The role of destiny unfolds itself and actualizes the inevitable. You cannot change the course of events, but you can change your attitude. And what really matters is the attitude and not the bare event. The world is the abode of desires and fears. You cannot find peace in it. For peace you must go beyond the world. The root cause of the world is self-love. Because of it, we seek pleasure and avoid pain. Replace self-love by love of the self, and the picture changes. Brahma God, the creator, is the sum total of all desires. The world is the instrument for their fulfillment.
souls take whatever pleasure they desire and pay for them in tears. Time squares all accounts. The law of balance reigns supreme. A day will come when you have amassed enough and must begin to build. Then, sorting out and discarding are absolutely necessary. Everything must be scrutinized and the unnecessary ruthlessly destroyed. Believe me, there cannot be too much destruction. For in reality, nothing is of value. Be passionately dispassionate. That is all. My stand, I take where nothing is. Words do not reach there, nor thoughts. To the mind, it is all darkness and silence. Then, consciousness begins to stir and wakes up the mind, which projects the world, built of memory and imagination. Once the world comes into being, all you say may be so. It is in the nature of the mind to imagine goals, to strive towards them, to seek out means and ways, to display vision, energy, and courage. These are divine attributes, and I do not deny them. But I take my stand where no difference exists, where things are not, nor the mind that creates them. There, I am at home. Whatever happens does not affect me. Things act on things, that is all. Free from memory and expectation, I am fresh, innocent, wholehearted. Mind is the great worker, and it needs rest. Needing nothing, I am unafraid. Whom to be afraid of? There is no separation. We are not separate selves. There is only one self, the absolute supreme reality, in which the personal and the impersonal are one. Even a small desire can start a long line of action. What about a strong desire? Desire can produce a universe its powers are miraculous. Just as a small matchstick can set a huge forest on fire, so does a desire light the fires of manifestation. The very purpose of creation is the fulfillment of desire. The desire may be noble or ignoble. Space is very neutral. One can fill it with what one likes. You must be very careful as to what you desire. And as to the people you want to help, they are in their respective worlds for the sake of their desires. 
there is no way of helping them except through their desires. You can only teach them to have right desires so that they may rise above them and be free from the urge to create and recreate worlds of desires, abodes of pain and pleasure. Just as a sleeping man forgets all and wakes up for another day, or he dies and emerges into another life, so do the worlds of desire and fear dissolve and disappear. But the universal witness, the absolute supreme self, never sleeps and never dies. Eternally, the great heart beats, and at each beat, a new universe comes into being. He is beyond all that the mind conceives. He is beyond being and not being. He is the yes and no to everything beyond and within, creating and destroying, unimaginably real. God is the all-doer. The yani is a non-doer. God himself does not say, I am doing all. To him, Things happen by their own nature. To the Yani, all is done by God. He sees no difference between God and nature. Both God and the Yani know themselves to be the immovable center of the movable, the eternal witness of the transient. The center is a point of void, and the witness a point of pure awareness. They know themselves to be as nothing. Therefore, nothing can resist them. Being nothing, I am all. Everything is me. Everything is mine. Just as my body moves by my mere thinking of the movement, so do things happen as I think of them. Mind you, I do nothing. I just see them happen. I accept and am accepted. I am all and all is me. Being the world, I am not afraid of the world. Being all, what am I to be afraid of? Water is not afraid of water, nor fire of fire. Also, I am not afraid because I am nothing that can experience fear or can be in danger. I have no shape nor name. It is attachment to a name and shape that breeds fear. I am not attached. I am nothing. And nothing is afraid of no thing. On the contrary, everything is afraid of the nothing. For when a thing touches nothing, it becomes nothing. It is like a bottomless well. Whatever falls into it disappears. Is God a person? As long as you think yourself to be a person, he too is a person. 
When you are all, you see him as all. Can I change facts by changing attitude? The attitude is the fact. Take anger. I may be furious, pacing up and down the room. At the same time, I know what I am, a center of wisdom and love, an atom of pure existence. All subsides and the mind merges into silence. Still, you are angry sometimes. With whom am I to be angry? And for what? Anger came and dissolved on my remembering myself. It is all a play of gunas qualities of cosmic matter. When I identify myself with them, I am their slave. When I stand apart, I am their master. Can you influence the world by your attitude, by separating yourself from the world you lose all hope of helping it? How can it be? All is myself. Can't I help myself? I do not identify myself with anybody in particular, for I am all, both the particular and the universal. Can you then help me, the particular person? But I do help you always from within. Myself and yourself are one. I know it, but you do not. That is all the difference, and it cannot last. And how do you help the entire world? Mahatma Gandhi is dead yet his mind pervades the earth. The thought of a yani pervades humanity and works ceaselessly for good. Being anonymous, coming from within, it is the more powerful and compelling. That is how the world improves, the inner aiding and blessing the outer. When a yani dies, he is no more, in the same sense in which a river is no more when it merges into the sea. The name, the shape, are no more, but the water remains and becomes one with the ocean. When Ayani joins the universal mind, all his goodness and wisdom become the heritage of humanity and uplift every human being. Unmanifested, manifested, individuality, personality, all these are mere words, points of view, mental attitudes. There is no reality in them. The real is experienced in silence. You cling to personality but you are conscious of being a person only when you are in trouble. When you are not in trouble, you do not think of yourself. You did not tell me the uses of the unmanifested. Surely you must sleep in order to wake up. You must die in order to live. 
you must melt down to shape anew. You must destroy to build, annihilate before creation. The Supreme is the universal solvent. It corrodes every container. It burns through every obstacle. Without the absolute denial of everything, the tyranny of things would be absolute. The Supreme is the great harmonizer, the guarantee of the ultimate and perfect balance of life in freedom. It dissolves you and thus reasserts your true being. The daily life is a life of action. Whether you like it or not, you must function. Whatever you do for your own sake accumulates and becomes explosive. One day it goes off and plays havoc with you and your world. When you deceive yourself that you work for the good of all, it makes matters worse. For you should not be guided by your own ideas of what is good for others. A man who claims to know what is good for others is dangerous. How is one to work then? Neither for yourself nor for others, but for the work's own sake. A thing worth doing is its own purpose and meaning. Make nothing a means to something else. Bind not. God does not create one thing to serve another. Each is made for its own sake. Because it is made for itself, it does not interfere. You are using things and people for purposes alien to them, and you play havoc with the world and yourself. You are always the Supreme. But your attention is fixed on things, physical or mental. When your attention is off a thing and not yet fixed on another, in the interval, you are pure being. How does one bring to an end this sense of separateness? By focusing the mind on the I am, on the sense of being. I am so and so dissolves. I am a witness only remains, and that too submerges in I am all. Then, the all becomes the one, and the one yourself, not to be separate from me. Abandon the idea of a separate I, and the question of whose experience will not arise. You speak of my experience as different from your experience because you believe we are separate, but we are not. On a deeper level, my experience is your experience. Dive deep within yourself and you will find it easily and simply. Go in the direction of I am. When I see something pleasant, I want it. Who exactly wants it? The self? 
or the mind? The question is wrongly put. There is no who. There is desire, fear, anger, and the mind says, this is me, this is mine. There is no thing which could be called me or mine. Desire is a state of the mind, perceived and named by the mind. Without the mind perceiving and naming, where is desire? Naming cannot go beyond the mind, while perceiving is consciousness itself. When somebody dies, what exactly happens? Nothing happens. Something becomes nothing. Nothing was. Nothing remains. Why do you fret at one man dying? and care little for the millions dying every day. Entire universes are imploding and exploding every moment. Am I to cry over them? One thing is quite clear to me. All that is, lives and moves and has its being in consciousness and I am in and beyond that consciousness. I am in it as the witness. I am beyond it as being. Surely you care when your child is ill, don't you? I don't get flustered. I just do the needful. I do not worry about the future. A right response to every situation is in my nature. I do not stop to think what to do. I act and move on. Results do not affect me. I do not even care whether they are good or bad. Whatever they are, they are. If they come back to me, I deal with them afresh, or rather, I happen to deal with them afresh. There is no sense of purpose in my doing anything. Things happen as they happen, not because I make them happen, but it is because I am that they happen. In reality, nothing ever happens. When the mind is restless, it makes Shiva dance. Like the restless waters of the lake make the moon dance. It is all appearance due to wrong ideas. Just as the taste of salt pervades the great ocean, and every single drop of seawater carries the same flavor. So every experience gives me the touch of reality, the ever fresh realization of my own being. Do I exist in your world as you exist in mine? Of course. You are, and I am, but only as points in consciousness. We are nothing apart from consciousness. This must be well grasped. The world hangs on the thread of consciousness. No consciousness, no world.
there are many points in consciousness, are there as many worlds? Take dream for an example. In a hospital, there may be many patients, all sleeping, all dreaming, each dreaming his own private, personal dream, unrelated, unaffected, having one single factor in common, illness. Similarly, we have divorced ourselves in our imagination from the real world of common experience and enclosed ourselves in a cloud of personal desires and fears, images and thoughts, ideas and concepts. All the dreams are superimposed over a common world. To some extent, they shape and influence each other. The basic unity operates in spite of all. At the root of it all lies self-forgetfulness, not knowing who I am. Cling to one thing that matters. Hold on to I am and let go all else. This is sadhana, spiritual practice. In realization, there is nothing to hold on to and nothing to forget. Everything is known. Nothing is remembered. Bodies are born and bodies die. But what is it to me? Bodies come and go in consciousness. And consciousness itself has its roots in me. I am life. And mine are mind and body. Reality can neither be proved nor disproved. Within the mind, you cannot. Beyond the mind, you need not. In the real, the question, what is real, does not arise. The manifested and unmanifested are not different. I am all. As myself, all is real. Apart from me, nothing is real. The world has no existence apart from you. At every moment, it is but a reflection of yourself. You create it, you destroy it. To improve the world, you must disprove it. One must die to live. There is no rebirth except through death. Your personal universe does not exist by itself. It is merely a limited and distorted view of the real. It is not the universe that needs improving, but your way of looking. The universe is a stage on which a world drama is being played. The quality of the performance is all that matters. Not what the actors say and do, but how 
they say and do it. You take it too seriously. What is wrong with play? You have a purpose only as long as you are not complete. Till then, completeness, perfection is the purpose. But when you are complete in yourself, fully integrated within and without, then you enjoy the universe. You do not labor at it. To the disintegrated, you may seem to be working hard, but that is their illusion. Athletes seem to make tremendous efforts, yet their sole motive is to play and display. God is not only true and good, he is also beautiful. He creates beauty for the joy of it. Why do you introduce purpose? Purpose implies movement, change, a sense of imperfection. God does not aim at beauty. Whatever he does is beautiful. Would you say that a flower is trying to be beautiful? It is beautiful by its very nature. Similarly, God is perfection itself, not an effort at perfection. Be fully aware of your own being, and you will be in bliss consciously. Because you take your mind off yourself and make it dwell on what you are not, you lose your sense of well-being, of being well. What is your happiness worth when you have to strive and labor for it? True happiness is spontaneous and effortless. Pleasure and pain alternate. Happiness, joy is unshakable. What you can seek and find is not the real thing. Find what you have never lost. Find the inalienable. Give up all questions except one. Who am I? After all, the only fact you are sure of is that you are. The I am is certain. The I am this is not. Discover all that you are not. Body, feelings, thoughts, time, space this or that, nothing, concrete or abstract, which you perceive can be you. Have firm conviction that you are pure consciousness.
weak desires can be removed by introspection and meditation. But strong, deep-rooted ones must be fulfilled and their fruits, sweet or bitter, tasted. On the human scale of values, deliberate effort is considered praiseworthy. In reality, both the yogi and bogi follow their own nature according to circumstances and opportunities. The yogi's life is governed by a single desire to find the truth. The bogey serves many masters, but the bogey becomes a yogi, and the yogi may get a rounding up in a bout of boga. The final result is the same. The good news of enlightenment will, sooner or later, bring about a transformation. Yes, first hearing, then remembering, pondering, and so on. The man who heard the news becomes a yogi, while the rest continue in their boga. Before the world was, consciousness was. In consciousness, it comes into being. In consciousness, it lasts, and into pure consciousness, it dissolves. At the root of everything is the feeling I am, the state of mind there is a world is secondary. For to be, I do not need the world. The world needs me. As you are now, the personality is only an obstacle. Self-identification with the body may be good for an infant, but true growing up depends on getting the body out of the way. Normally, one should outgrow body-based desires early in life. As long as you do not see that it is mere habit, built on memory, prompted by desire, you will think yourself to be a person, living, feeling, thinking, active, passive, pleased or pained. Question yourself. Ask yourself, is it so? Who am I? What is behind and beyond all this? And soon you will see your mistake. And 
It is in the very nature of a mistake to cease to be when seen. Living in spontaneous awareness, consciousness of effortless living, being fully interested in one's life, all this is implied in the marriage of life and mind. Humility and silence are essential for a sadaka, however advanced. Only a fully ripened yani can allow himself complete spontaneity. The inner fruit must ripen. Until then, the discipline, the living in awareness, must go on. Gradually, the practice becomes more and more subtle until it becomes altogether formless. The world itself is contact. The totality of all contacts actualized in consciousness. The spirit touches matter and consciousness results. Such consciousness, when tainted with memory and expectation, becomes bondage. Pure experience does not bind. Experience caught between desire and fear is impure and creates karma. There is nothing wrong with duality as long as it does not create conflict. Multiplicity and variety without strife is joy. In pure consciousness there is light for warmth, contact is needed. Above the unity of being is the union of love. Love is the meaning and purpose of duality. The five senses and the three qualities are your eight steps in yoga. And I am is the great reminder. You can learn from them all you need to know. Be attentive. Inquire ceaselessly. That is all. All are being liberated. It is not what you live, but how you live that matters. The idea of enlightenment is of utmost importance. Just to know that there is such a possibility changes one's entire outlook. It acts like a burning match in a heap of sawdust. All the great teachers did nothing else. A spark of truth can burn up a mountain of lies. The opposite is also true. The sun of truth remains hidden behind the cloud of self-identification with the body. The very hearing of enlightenment is a promise of enlightenment. The very meeting with a guru is the assurance of liberation. Perfection is life-giving and creative. Just 
be aware and affectionate intensely. A realized man is not rich, for he has nothing. He is not poor, for he gives abundantly. He is just propertyless. Similarly, the realized man is egoless. He has lost the capacity of identifying himself with anything. He is without location, placeless, beyond space and time, beyond the world. Beyond words and thoughts is he. It is you who are deep, complex, mysterious, hard to understand. I am simplicity itself compared to you. I am what is, without any distinction whatsoever, into inner and outer, mine and yours, good and bad. What the world is, I am. What I am, the world is. How does it happen that each man creates his own world? When a number of people are asleep, each dreams his own dream. Only on awakening, the question of many different dreams arises and dissolves when they are all seen as dreams, as something imagined. Even dreams have a foundation in memory. Even then, what is remembered is but another dream. The memory of the false cannot but give rise to the false. There is nothing wrong with memory as such. What is false is its content. Remember facts, forget opinions. What is a fact? What is perceived in pure awareness, unaffected by desire and fear, is fact. To sit in judgment and a lot marks is ridiculous. Everything contributes to the ultimate perfection. Let each act according to his nature. The ultimate purpose will be served in any case. One and all are the same to me. The same consciousness appears as being and as bliss. Chit in movement is ananda. Chit motionless is being. Non-distinction speaks in silence. Words carry distinctions. The unmanifested has no name. All names refer to the manifested. It is useless to struggle with words to express what is beyond words. Consciousness is spirit. Consciousness is matter. Imperfect spirit is matter. Perfect matter is spirit. 
in the beginning as in the end, all is one. All division is in the mind. There is none in reality. Movement and rest are states of mind and cannot be without their opposites. By itself, nothing moves, nothing rests. It is a grievous mistake to attribute absolute existence to mental constructs. Nothing exists by itself. Beyond the mind, there is no such thing as experience. Experience is a dual state. You cannot talk of reality as an experience. Once this is understood, you will no longer look for being and becoming as separate and opposite. In reality, they are one and inseparable, like roots and branches of the same tree. Both can exist only in the light of consciousness, which again arises in the wake of the sense I am. This is the primary fact. If you miss it, you miss all. Whatever is spoken is speech only. Whatever is thought is thought only. The real meaning is unexplainable though experienceable. The Mahavakya is true, but your ideas are false. For all ideas are false. Is the conviction I am that false? Of course. Conviction is a mental state. In that, there is no I am. With the sense I am emerging, that is obscured. As with the sun rising, the stars are wiped out. But as with the sun comes light, so with the sense of self comes bliss. The cause of bliss is sought in the not I, and thus the bondage begins. In your daily life, are you always conscious of your real state? Neither conscious nor unconscious. I do not need convictions. I live on courage. Courage is my essence, which is love of life. I am free of memories and anticipations, unconcerned with what I am and what I am not. I am not addicted to self-descriptions. Soham and Brahmasmi, I am he, I am the supreme, are of no use to me. I have the courage to be as nothing and to see the world as it is, nothing. It sounds simple, just try it. Anxiety and hope are born of imagination. 
I am free of both. I am simple being, and I need nothing to rest on. Being shines as knowing. Knowing is warm in love. It is all one. You imagine separations and trouble yourself with questions. Don't concern yourself over much with formulations. Pure being cannot be described. You are dragging down reality to the level of experience. How can reality depend on experience when it is the very ground of experience? Reality is in the very fact of experience, not in its nature. Experience is, after all, a state of mind, while being is definitely not a state of mind. The separation is an appearance just as the dream is not apart from the dreamer, so is knowing not apart from being. The dream is the dreamer, the knowledge is the knower, the distinction is merely verbal. The undisturbed state of being is bliss. The disturbed state is what appears as the world. In non-duality there is bliss, in duality, experience. What comes and goes is experience with its duality of pain and pleasure. Bliss is not to be known. One is always bliss, but never blissful. Bliss is not an attribute. There are no others to help. A rich man, when he hands over his entire fortune to his family, has not a coin left to give a beggar. So is the wise man, stripped of all his powers and possessions. Nothing, literally nothing can be said about him. He cannot help anybody, for he is everybody. He is the poor, and also his poverty, the thief, and also his thievery. How can he be said to help when he is not a part? Who thinks of himself as separate from the world, let him help the world. The only thing that can help is to wake up from the dream. I am self-concerned, but the self is all. In practice, it takes the shape of goodwill, unfailing and universal. You may call it love, all-pervading, all-redeeming. Such love is supremely active without the sense of doing. What is love? When the sense of distinction and separation is absent, you may call it love. Why so much stress on love between man and woman? Because the element of happiness in it is so prominent. Is it not so in all love? Not necessarily. Love may cause pain. 
you then call it compassion. What is happiness? Harmony between the inner and the outer is happiness. On the other hand, self-identification with the outer causes is suffering. How does self-identification happen? The self, by its nature, knows itself only. For lack of experience, whatever it perceives it takes to be itself. Battered, it learns to look out and to live alone. When right behavior becomes normal, a powerful inner urge makes it seek its source. The candle of the body is lighted, and all becomes clear and bright. What is the real cause of suffering? Self-identification with the limited. Sensations as such, however strong, do not cause suffering. It is the mind, bewildered by wrong ideas, addicted to thinking, I am this, I am that, that fears loss and craves gain and suffers when frustrated. Noble friendship, satsang, is the supreme remedy for all ills, physical and mental. Seek within, your own self is your best friend. Why is life so full of contradictions? It serves to break down mental pride. We must realize how poor and powerless we are. As long as we delude ourselves by what we imagine ourselves to be, to know, to have, to do, we are in a sad plight indeed. Only in complete self-negation is there a chance to discover our real being. You must be serious, intent, truly interested to examine yourself. You must be full of goodwill for yourself. I am selfish, all right. You are not. You are all the time destroying yourself and your own by serving strange gods, inimical and false. By all means, be selfish the right way. Wish yourself well. Labor at what is good for you. Destroy all that stands between you and happiness. Be all. Love all. Be happy. Make happy. No happiness is greater. Why is there so much suffering in love? All suffering is born of desire. True love is never frustrated. How can the sense of unity be frustrated? What can be frustrated is the desire for expression. Such desire is of the mind. As with all things mental, frustration is inevitable. What is the place of sex in love? 
Love is a state of being. Sex is energy. Love is wise. Sex is blind. Once the true nature of love and sex is understood, there will be no conflict or confusion. There is so much sex without love. Without love, all is evil. Life itself without love is evil. Who can make me love? You are love itself, when you are not afraid. He who could not complete his yoga for some reason is called failed in yoga. Such failure is only temporary, for there can be no defeat in yoga. This battle is always won, for it is a battle between the true and the false. The false has no chance. There is no question of failure, neither in the short run nor in the long. It is like traveling a long and arduous road in an unknown country. Of all the innumerable steps, there is only the last which brings you to your destination. Yet, you will not consider all previous steps as failures. Each brought you nearer to your goal even when you had to turn back to bypass an obstacle. In reality, each step brings you to your goal, because to be always on the move, learning, discovering, unfolding, is your eternal destiny. Living is life's only purpose. The self does not identify itself with success or failure. The very idea of becoming this or that is unthinkable. The self understands that success and failure are relative and related, that they are the very warp and weft of life. Learn from both and go beyond. If you have not learned, repeat. What am I to learn? To live without self-concern. For this, you must know your own true being as indomitable, fearless, ever victorious. Once you know with absolute certainty that nothing can trouble you but your own imagination, you come to disregard your desires and fears, concepts and ideas, and live by truth alone. Nobody ever fails in yoga. It is all a matter of the rate of progress. It is slow in the beginning and rapid in the end. When one is fully matured, realization is explosive. It takes place spontaneously or at the slightest hint.
The quick is not better than the slow. Slow ripening and rapid flowering alternate. Both are natural and right. Yet all this is so in the mind only. As I see it, there is really nothing of the kind. In the great mirror of consciousness, images arise and disappear, and only memory gives them continuity. And memory is material, destructible, perishable, transient. On such flimsy foundations, we build a sense of personal existence, vague, intermittent, dreamlike, this vague persuasion, I am so-and-so, obscures the changeless state of pure awareness and makes us believe that we are born to suffer and to die. There is progress all the time. Everything contributes to progress. In reality, nothing ever happened. The sun is always there. There is no night to it. Even effort is a part of the process. When ignorance becomes obstinate and hard and the character gets perverted, effort and the pain of it become inevitable. In complete obedience to nature, there is no effort. The seed of spiritual life grows in silence and in darkness until its appointed hour. Consciousness and unconsciousness, while in the body, depend on the condition of the brain. But the self is beyond both, beyond the brain, beyond the mind. The fault of the instrument is no reflection on its user. Why should a liberated man necessarily follow conventions? The moment he becomes predictable, he cannot be free. His freedom lies in his being free to fulfill the need of the moment, to obey the necessity of the situation, freedom to do what one must, what is right, is real freedom. He who knows himself has no doubts about it, nor does he care whether others recognize his state or not. Rare is the realized man who discloses his realization, and fortunate are those who have met him, for he does it for their abiding welfare. People's destiny is what happens. There is no thwarting of destiny. Do you mean to say everybody's life is totally determined at his birth? What a strange idea. Were it so, the power that determines would see to it that nobody should suffer. What about cause and effect? 
Each moment contains the whole of the past and creates the whole of the future. Let past and future exist in the mind only. Time is in the mind. Space is in the mind. The law of cause and effect is also a way of thinking. In reality, all is here and now, and all is one. Multiplicity and diversity are in the mind only. I flow with life faithfully and irresistibly. I can help. You too can help. Everybody can help. But the suffering is all the time recreated. Man alone can destroy in himself the roots of pain. Others can only help with the pain, but not with its cause, which is the abysmal stupidity of mankind. Will this stupidity ever come to an end? In man, of course, any moment. In humanity, as we know it, after very many years. In creation, never, for creation itself is rooted in ignorance. Matter itself is ignorance. Not to know, and not to know that one does not know, is the cause of endless suffering. We are told of the great avatars, the saviors of the world. Did they save? They have come and gone, and the world plods on. Of course, they did a lot and opened new dimensions in the human mind. But to talk of saving the world is an exaggeration. Is there no salvation for the world? Which world do you want to save? The world of your own projection? Save it yourself. My world? Show me my world and I shall deal with it. I am not aware of any world separate from myself, which I am free to save or not to save. What business have you with saving the world when all the world needs is to be saved from you? Get out of the picture and see whether there is anything left to save. Must people suffer? As long as they are as they are, there is no escape from suffering. Remove the sense of separateness and there will be no conflict. The dreams are not equal, but the dreamer is one. I am the insect. I am the poet in dream. But in reality, I am neither. I am beyond all dreams. I am the light in which all dreams appear and disappear. I am both inside 
and outside the dream. Just as a man suffering a headache knows the ache and also knows that he is not the ache, so do I know the dream, myself dreaming and myself not dreaming, all at the same time. I am what I am before, during and after the dream, but what I see and dream, I am not. What is the way out of the dream? There is no need of a way out. Don't you see that a way out is also part of the dream? All you have to do is to see the dream as a dream. If I start the practice of dismissing everything as a dream, where will it lead me? Wherever it leads you, it will be a dream. The very idea of going beyond the dream is illusory. Why go anywhere? Just realize that you are dreaming a dream you call the world, and stop looking for ways out. The dream is not your problem. Your problem is that you like one part of the dream, and not another. Love all of it, or none of it, and stop complaining. When you have seen the dream as a dream, you have done all that needs be done. Is dreaming caused by thinking? Everything is a play of ideas. In the state free from ideation, nothing is perceived. The root idea is I am. It shatters the state of pure consciousness and is followed by the innumerable sensations and perceptions, feeling and ideas, which in their totality constitute God and his world. The I am remains as the witness, but it is by the will of God that everything happens. Theories are neither right nor wrong. They are attempts at explaining the inexplicable. It is not the theory that matters, but the way it is being tested. It is the testing of the theory that makes it fruitful. Experiment with any theory you like. If you are truly earnest and honest, the attainment of reality will be yours. It is the earnestness that liberates and not the theory. Your sincerity will guide you. Devotion to the goal of freedom and perfection will make you abandon all theories and systems and live by wisdom, intelligence, and active love. Theories may be good as starting points, but must be abandoned. The sooner, the better.
whatever name you give it, will or steady purpose or one pointedness of the mind, you come back to earnestness, sincerity, honesty. When you are in dead earnest, you bend every incident, every second of your life to your purpose. You do not waste time and energy on other things. You are totally dedicated, call it will, or love, or plain honesty. We are complex beings at war within and without. We contradict ourselves all the time, undoing today the work of yesterday. No wonder we are stuck. A little bit of integrity would make a lot of difference. What is more powerful, desire or destiny? Desire shapes destiny. You are free now. What is it that you want to desire? Desire it. You can start only from where you are. You are here and now. You cannot get out of here and now. What can I do here and now? You can be aware of your being here and now. That is all. That is all. There is nothing more to it. All my waking and dreaming, I am conscious of myself. It does not help me much. You were aware of thinking, feeling, doing. You were not aware of your being. What is the new factor you want me to bring in? The attitude of pure witnessing, of watching the events without taking part in them. There is no chaos in the world, except the chaos which your mind creates. It is self-created in the sense that at its very center is the false idea of oneself as a thing different and separate from other things. In reality, you are not a thing, nor separate. You are the infinite potentiality, the inexhaustible possibility. Because you are, all can be. The universe is but a partial manifestation of your limitless capacity to become. To be a living being is not the ultimate state. There is something beyond, much more wonderful, which is neither being nor non-being, neither living nor not living. It is a state of pure awareness beyond the limitations of space and time. Once the illusion that the body-mind is oneself is abandoned, death loses its terror, it becomes a part of living. Your true nature is beyond description. It cannot be known with mind, yet it exists. 
your true state is ever existent. The mind is simply the collection of impressions that have been recorded since birth. It is occupied by thoughts which are based upon its predominant concept. Be the witness of thoughts. Catch hold of the knower of the mind. I am experiencing pleasure and pain in consciousness, but I am neither consciousness nor its content. How is it that your experience is so different from ours? My actual experience is not different. It is my evaluation and attitude that differ. I see the same world as you do, but not in the same way. There is nothing mysterious about it. Everybody sees the world through the idea he has of himself. As you think yourself to be, so you think the world to be. If you imagine yourself as separate from the world, the world will appear as separate from you, and you will experience desire and fear. I do not see the world as separate from me, and so there is nothing for me to desire or fear. There is absolutely no difference between me and others, except in my knowing myself as I am. I am all. I know it, for certain, and you do not. So we differ all the same? No, we do not. The difference is only in the mind and temporary. I was like you. You will be like me. God made a most diversified world. The diversity is in you only. See yourself as you are and you will see the world as it is, a single block of reality, indivisible, indescribable. Your own creative power projects upon it a picture, and all your questions refer to the picture. Gods and their universes come and go. Avatars follow each other in endless succession. And in the end, we are back at the source. I talk only of the timeless source of all the gods with all their universes, past, present, and future. Do you know them all? Do you remember them? When a few boys stage a play for fun, what is there to see and to remember? Why is half humanity male and half female? For their happiness. The impersonal becomes the personal for the sake of happiness in relationship. By the grace of my guru, I can look with equal eye on the impersonal as well as the personal. Both are one to me. In life, the personal merges in the impersonal. The two are but aspects of one reality. It is not correct to talk of one preceding the other. 
All these ideas belong to the waking state. What brings in the waking state? At the root of all creation lies desire. Desire and imagination foster and reinforce each other. The fourth state, Turiya, is a state of pure witnessing, detached awareness, passionless and wordless. It is like space unaffected by whatever it contains. Both the subjective and the objective are changeful and transient. There is nothing real about them. Find the permanent in the fleeting, the one constant factor in every experience. First, purify your vision. Learn to see instead of staring. Also, you must be eager to see. You need both clarity and earnestness for self-knowledge. You need maturity of heart and mind, which comes through earnest application in daily life of whatever little you have understood. Go on pondering, wondering, being anxious to find a way. Be conscious of yourself. Watch your mind. Give it your full attention. Don't look for quick results. There may be none within your noticing. Unknown to you, your psyche will undergo a change. There will be more clarity in your thinking, charity in your feeling, purity in your behavior. You need not aim at these. You will witness a change all the same. For what you are now is the result of inattention, and what you become will be the fruit of attention. Attention, alertness, awareness, clarity, liveliness, vitality are all manifestations of integrity, oneness with your true nature. Do not undervalue attention. It means interest and also love, to know, to do, to discover, or to create, you must give your heart to it, which means attention. All the blessings flow from it. Give your undivided attention to the most important in your life, yourself. Of your personal universe, you are the center. Without knowing the center, what else can you know? As you cannot see your face, but only its reflection in the mirror, so you can know only your image reflected in the stainless mirror of pure awareness. How am I to get such a stainless mirror? Obviously by removing stains. See the stains and remove them. The ancient teaching is fully valid.
is the universe of value. It is of tremendous value. By going beyond it, you realize yourself. But why did it come into being in the first instance? You will know it when it ends. Will it ever end? Yes, for you. When did it begin? Now. When will it end? Now. It does not end now. You don't let it. I want to let it. You don't. All your life is connected with it. Your past and future, your desires and fears, all have their roots in the world. Without the world, where are you? Who are you? Each man suffers alone and dies alone. Numbers are irrelevant. There is as much death when a million die as when one perishes. Humanity's problem lies in this misuse of the mind only. All the treasures of nature and spirit are open to man who will use his mind rightly. Fear and greed cause the misuse of the mind. The right use of mind is in the service of love, of life, of truth, of beauty. You can spend an eternity looking elsewhere for truth and love, intelligence and goodwill, imploring God and man all in vain. You must begin in yourself, with yourself. This is the inexorable law. You cannot change the image without changing the face. First, realize that your world is only a reflection of yourself and stop finding fault with the reflection. Tend to yourself. Set yourself right, mentally and emotionally. The physical will follow automatically. You talk so much of reforms, economic, social, political. Leave alone the reforms and mind the reformer. What kind of world can a man create who is stupid, greedy, heartless? You cannot change the world before changing yourself. It is neither necessary nor possible to change others. But if you can change yourself, you will find that no other change is needed. To change the picture, you merely change the film. You do not attack the cinema screen. It is not of myself that I am sure. I am sure of you. All you need is to stop searching outside what can be found only within. Set your vision right before you operate. You are suffering from acute misapprehension. Clarify your mind. Purify your heart. 
sanctify your life. This is the quickest way to a change of your world. Surely there is a factual world common to all. The world of things, of energy and matter. Even if there were such a common world of things and forces, it is not the world in which we live. Ours is a world of feelings and ideas, of attractions and repulsions, of scales of values, of motives and incentives, a mental world altogether. Biologically, we need very little. Our problems are of a different order. Problems created by desires and fears and wrong ideas can be solved only on the level of the mind. You must conquer your mind, and for this, you must go beyond it. What does it mean to go beyond the mind? You have gone beyond the body, haven't you? You do not closely follow your digestion, circulation, or elimination. These have become automatic. In the same way, the mind should work automatically, without calling for attention. This will not happen unless the mind works faultlessly. We are, most of our time, mind and body conscious, because they constantly call for help. Pain and suffering are only the body and the mind screaming for attention. To go beyond the body, you must be healthy. To go beyond the mind, you must have your mind in perfect order. You cannot leave a mess behind and go beyond. The mess will bog you down. Pick up your rubbish seems to be the universal law, and a just law too. Am I permitted to ask you how did you go beyond the mind? By the grace of my guru. What shape did his grace take? He told me what is true. What did he tell you? He told me I am the supreme reality. It was quite a lot to remember the guru and his words. My advice to you is even less difficult than this. Just remember I am is enough to heal your mind and take you beyond. Just have some trust. I don't mislead you. Why should I? Do I want anything from you? I wish you well. Such is my nature. Why should I mislead you? If you want to know your true nature, you must have yourself in mind all the time until the secret of your being stands revealed. Why should self-remembrance bring one to self-realization? Because they are but two aspects of the same state. Self-remembrance is in the mind. Self-realization is beyond the mind. The image in the mirror is of the face beyond the mirror.
It is not the worship of a person or guru that is crucial, but the steadiness and depth of your devotion to the task. Life itself is the Supreme Guru. Be attentive to its lessons and obedient to its commands. Grow in talent and develop in skill. Desire what is worth desiring and desire it well. Just like you pick your way in a crowd, passing between people, so you find your way between events without missing your general direction. It is easy if you are earnest. There are no needs, desires only. To eat, to drink, to shelter one's body, to live. The desire to live is the one fundamental desire. All else depends on it. We live because we must. We live because we crave sensory existence. A thing so universal cannot be wrong. Not wrong, of course. In its own place and time, nothing is wrong. But when you are concerned with truth, with reality, you must question everything, your very life. By asserting the necessity of sensory and intellectual experience, you narrow down your inquiry to search for comfort. Question every urge. Hold no desire legitimate. Empty of possession, physical and mental. Free of all self-concern. Be open for discovery. Have your guru always in your heart and remember his instructions. This is real abidance with the true. Physical proximity is the least important. Make your entire life an expression of your faith and love for your teacher. This is real dwelling with the guru. Does a Yani die? He is beyond life and death. What we take to be inevitable, to be born and to die, appears to him but a way of expressing movement in the immovable, change in the changeless, end in the endless. To the Yani it is obvious that nothing is born and nothing dies. Nothing lasts, and nothing changes. All is as it is, timelessly. You cannot speak of a beginning of consciousness. The very idea of beginning and time are within consciousness. To talk meaningfully of the beginning of anything, you must step out of it. And the moment you step out, you realize that there is no such thing and never was. There is only reality in which no thing has any being on its own. Like waves are inseparable from the ocean, so is all existence rooted in being. Is the mind real? It is but a collection of states, each of them transitory. 
How can a succession of transitory states be considered real? They are all strung on the basic idea, I am the body. But even this is a mental state and does not last. It comes and goes like all the other states. The illusion of being the body-mind is there, only because it is not investigated. Non-investigation is the thread on which all the states of mind are strung. It is like darkness in a closed room. It is there, apparently. But when the room is opened, where does it go? It goes nowhere, because it was not there. All states of mind, all names and forms of existence, are rooted in non-inquiry, non-investigation, in imagination. It is right to say I am, but to say I am this, I am that, is a sign of not inquiring, not examining, of mental weakness or lethargy. There is no darkness in the midst of light. Self-forgetfulness is the darkness. When we are absorbed in other things, in the not-self, we forget the self. There is nothing unnatural about it. The question, who am I, has no answer. No experience can answer it, for the self is beyond experience. It has no answer in consciousness and therefore helps to go beyond consciousness. Here and now I am. Stop there. This is real. Don't turn a fact into a question. There lies your mistake. You are neither knowing nor not knowing, neither mind nor matter. Don't attempt to describe yourself in terms of mind and matter. Setting things right lies in my very nature, which is Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, the true, the good, the beautiful. I am the self. You imagine me as separate, hence your questions. There is no myself and his self. There is the self, the only self of all. Misled by the diversity of names and shapes, minds and bodies, you imagine multiple selves. We both are the self but you seem to be unconvinced. This talk of personal self and universal self is the learner stage. Go beyond. Don't be stuck in duality. Let us come back to the man in need of help. He comes to you. If he comes, he is sure to get help. Because he was destined to get help, he came. There is nothing fanciful about it. I cannot help some and refuse others. All who come are helped, for such is the law. Why must a man come here to get advice? Can't he get it from within? He will not listen. His mind is turned outward, but in fact, 
all experience is in the mind. And even his coming to me and getting help is all within himself. Instead of finding an answer within himself, he imagines an answer from without. To me, there is no me, no man, and no giving. All this is merely a flicker in the mind. I am infinite peace and silence in which nothing appears, for all that appears disappears. Nobody comes for help. Nobody offers help. Nobody gets help. It is all but a display in consciousness. Do you mean to say that you have the power to do everything rightly? There is no power as separate from me. It is inherent in my very nature. Call it creativity. Out of a lump of gold you can make many ornaments. Each will remain gold. Similarly, in whatever role I may appear and whatever function I may perform, I remain what I am, the I am, immovable, unshakable, independent. What you call the universe, nature, is my spontaneous creativity. Whatever happens, happens, but such is my nature that all ends in joy. All things contain their future. I know that it is in the nature of awareness to set things right. All this is one single fact. I am normal. I am sane. I see things as they are, and therefore I am not afraid of them. But you are afraid of reality. The Yanni has died before his death. He saw that there was nothing to be afraid of. The moment you know your real being, you are afraid of nothing. Death gives freedom and power. To be free in the world, you must die to the world. Then the universe is your own. It becomes your body, an expression and a tool. The happiness of being absolutely free is beyond description. On the other hand, he who is afraid of freedom cannot die. As a whole, the world does not need saving. Man makes mistakes and creates sorrow. When it enters the field of awareness, the consciousness of a yani, it is set right. Such is his nature. From my point of view, everything happens by itself quite spontaneously. But man imagines that he works for an incentive towards a goal. 
he has always a reward in mind and strives for it. To watch the universe emerging and subsiding in one's heart is a wonder. When effort is needed, effort will appear. When effortlessness becomes essential, it will assert itself. You need not push life about. Just flow with it and give yourself completely to the task of the present moment, which is the dying now to the now. For living is dying. Without death, life cannot be. Get hold of the main thing, that the world and the self are one and perfect. Only your attitude is faulty and needs readjustment. This process or readjustment is what you call sadhana, spiritual practice. You come to it by putting an end to indolence and using all your energy to clear the way for clarity and charity. But in reality, these all are signs of inevitable growth. Don't be afraid. Don't resist. Don't delay. Be what you are. There is nothing to be afraid of. Trust and try. Experiment honestly. Give your real being a chance to shape your life. You will not regret it. The self does not need to be put to rest. It is peace itself, not at peace. Only the mind is restless. All it knows is restlessness with its many modes and grades. The pleasant are considered superior and the painful are discounted. What we call progress is merely a changeover from the unpleasant to the pleasant. But changes by themselves cannot bring us to the changeless. For whatever has a beginning must have an end. The real does not begin. It only reveals itself as beginningless and endless, all-pervading, all-powerful, immovable, prime mover, timelessly changeless. The personality is but a product of imagination. The self is the victim of this imagination. It is the taking yourself to be what you are not that binds you. The person cannot be said to exist in its own right. It is the self that believes there is a person and is conscious of being it. Beyond the self lies the unmanifested the causeless cause of everything. Even to talk of reuniting the person with the self is not right, because there is no person, only a mental picture 
given a false reality by conviction. Nothing was divided, and there is nothing to unite. Knowledge is but a memory, a pattern of thought, a mental habit. All these are motivated by pleasure and pain. It is because you are goaded by pleasure and pain that you are in search of knowledge. Being oneself is completely beyond all motivation. You cannot be yourself for some reason. You are yourself, and no reason is needed. In life, nothing can be had without overcoming obstacles. The obstacles to the clear perception of one's true being are desire for pleasure and fear of pain. It is the pleasure-pain motivation that stands in the way. The very freedom from all motivation, the state in which no desire arises, is the natural state. Such giving up of desires doesn't need time. If you leave it to time, millions of years will be needed. Giving up desire after desire is a lengthy process with the end never in sight. Leave alone your desires and fears. Give your entire attention to the subject, to him who is behind the experience of desire and fear. Ask, who desires? Let each desire bring you back to yourself. A man who is given a stone and assured that it is a priceless diamond, will be mightily pleased until he realizes his mistake. In the same way pleasures lose their tang and pains their barb when the self is known. Both are seen as they are, conditioned responses, mere reactions, plain attractions and repulsions, based on memories or preconceptions. Usually pleasure and pain are experienced when expected. It is all a matter of acquired habits and convictions. Pain and pleasure go always together. Freedom from one means freedom from both. If you do not care for pleasure, you will not be afraid of pain. But there is happiness which is neither, which is completely beyond. Reality is beyond the subjective and objective, beyond all levels, beyond every distinction. Most definitely, it is not their origin, source, or root. These come from ignorance of reality, not from reality itself, which is indescribable beyond being and not being. The desire to find the self will be surely fulfilled, provided you want nothing else. But you must be honest with yourself and really want nothing else. If in the meantime you want many other things and are engaged in their pursuit, your main purpose may be delayed until you grow wiser 
and cease being torn between contradictory urges. Go within, without swerving, without ever looking outward. Whatever work you have undertaken, complete it. Do not take up new tasks unless it is called for by a concrete situation of suffering and relief from suffering. Find yourself first, and endless blessings will follow. Do not talk of helping another unless you can put him beyond all need of help. You can only cease to be as you seem to be now. There is nothing cruel in what I say. To wake up a man from a nightmare is compassion. You came here because you are in pain, and all I say is, wake up, know yourself, be yourself. The end of pain lies not in pleasure. When you realize that you are beyond both pain and pleasure, aloof and unassailable, then the pursuit of happiness ceases and the resultant sorrow too. For pain aims at pleasure and pleasure ends in pain relentlessly. Freedom from sorrow has no cause and therefore cannot be destroyed. Realize that freedom. Have your being outside this body of birth and death, and all your problems will be solved. They exist because you believe yourself born to die. Undeceive yourself and be free. You are not a person. There are no conditions to fulfill. There is nothing to be done. Nothing to be given up. Just look and remember. Whatever you perceive is not you, not yours. It is there in the field of consciousness, but you are not the field and its contents. Simply look at whatever happens and know that you are beyond it. Does it mean I should abstain from doing anything? You cannot. What goes on must go on. If you stop suddenly, you will crash. Is it a matter of the known and the knower becoming one? Both are ideas in the mind and words that express them. There is no self in them. The self is neither between nor beyond. To look for it on the mental level is futile. Stop searching and see it is here and now. It is that I am you know so well. All you need to do is to cease taking yourself to be within the field of consciousness. Unless you have already considered these matters carefully, listening to me once will not do. Forget your past experiences and achievements Stand naked 
exposed to the winds and rains of life, and you will have a chance. The greatest guru is helpless as long as the disciple is not eager to learn. Eagerness and earnestness are all important. Confidence will come with experience. Be devoted to your goal, and devotion to him who can guide you will follow. The greatest guru is your inner self. Truly, he is the supreme teacher. He alone can take you to your goal, and he alone meets you at the end of the road. Confide in him, and you need no outer guru. Do not waste energy and time on regrets. Learn from your mistakes and do not repeat them. In this violent world, how can one keep away from violence of some kind or another? Forgetting yourself is the greatest injury. All the calamities flow from it. Take care of the most important. The lesser will take care of itself. You do not tidy up a dark room. You open the windows first. Letting in the light makes everything easy. So let us wait to improve others until we have seen ourselves as we are, and have changed. There is no need to turn round and round in endless questioning. Find yourself, and everything will fall into its proper place. In reality, the two are one just like breathing in and out are one. The body exists in time and space, transient and limited, while the dweller is timeless and spaceless, eternal and all-pervading. There is a universal power which is in control and is responsible. Just realize the one mover behind all that moves and leave all to him. If you do not hesitate or cheat, this is the shortest way to reality. Stand without desire and fear relinquishing all control and all responsibility. What is wrong in letting go the illusion of personal control and personal responsibility? Both are in the mind only. Of course, as long as you imagine yourself to be in control, you should also imagine yourself to be responsible. One implies the other. All life on earth depends on the sun. Yet, you cannot blame the sun for all that happens though it is the ultimate cause. 
light causes the color of the flower, but it neither controls nor is responsible for it directly. It makes it possible, that is all. You cannot deny my facts, for you do not know them. Could you know them, you would not deny them. Here lies the trouble. You take your imagining for facts and my facts for imagination. I know for certain that all is one. Differences do not separate. Either you are responsible for nothing or for everything. To imagine that you are in control and responsible for one body is the aberration of the body-mind. Of what use is your arguing for or against God? when you just do not know who is God and what you are talking about. The God born of fear and hope, shaped by desire and imagination, cannot be the power that is, the mind and heart of the universe. When I say I am free, I am merely stating a fact. If you are an adult, you are free from infancy. I am free from all description and identification. Whatever you may hear, see, or think of, I am not that. I am free from being a precept or a concept. I repeat, I was not, am not, shall not be a body. To me, this is a fact. I too was under the illusion of having been born, but my guru made me see that birth and death are mere ideas. Birth is merely the idea I have a body, and death, I have lost my body. Now, when I know I am not a body, the body may be there or may not, what difference does it make? The body-mind is like a room, it is there, but I need not live in it all the time. The power that created the body takes care of the body. There are two levels to consider, the physical of facts and mental of ideas. I am beyond both. Neither your facts nor ideas are mine. What I see is beyond. Cross over to my side and see with me. Because you think you are the body, you want it indestructible. You can extend its life considerably by appropriate practices, but for what ultimate good? By all means, live long, but you are not the master. Can you decide the days of your birth and death? We are not speaking the same language. Yours is make-believe talk. All hangs on suppositions and assumptions. You speak with assurance about things you are not sure of.
you must come to me. Words are of the mind, and the mind obscures and distorts. Hence the absolute need to go beyond words and to move over to my side. Take me over. I am doing it, but you resist. You give reality to concepts, while concepts are distortions of reality. Abandon all conceptualization and stay silent and attentive. Be earnest about it, and all will be well with you. Be content with what you are sure of, and the only thing you can be sure of is I am. Stay with it, and reject everything else. This is yoga. All you need is to listen, remember, and ponder. It is like taking food. All you can do is to bite off, chew and swallow. All else is unconscious and automatic. All is of the mind, and you are not the mind. The mind is born and reborn, not you. The mind creates the world and all the wonderful variety of it. Just like in a good play, you have all sorts of characters and situations, so you need a little of everything to make a world. Don't identify yourself with the world, and you will not suffer. Make your world perfect by all means. If you believe in God, work with Him. If you do not, become one. Either see the world as a play, or work at it with all your might, or both. Identity, individuality, uniqueness, they are the most valuable aspects of the mind, yet of the mind only. I am all there is, too, is an experience equally valid. The particular and the universal are inseparable. They are the two aspects of the nameless, as seen from without and from within. Unfortunately, words only mention, but don't convey. Try to go beyond the words. What dies with death? The idea, I am this body, dies. The witness does not. A liberated man is extremely law-abiding but his laws are the laws of his real self, not of his society. These he observes, or breaks, according to circumstances and necessity. But he will never be fanciful and disorderly. If you look into living process closely, you will find cruelty everywhere, for life feeds on life. This is a fact, but it does not make you feel guilty about being alive. 
you began a life of cruelty by giving your mother endless trouble. To the last day of your life, you will compete for food, clothing, shelter, holding on to your body, fighting for its needs, wanting it to be secure in a world of insecurity and death. From the animal's point of view, being killed is not the worst form of dying, surely preferable to sickness and senile decay. The cruelty lies in the motive, not in the fact. Killing hurts the killer, not the killed. All happens according to your faith, and your faith is the shape of your desire. When I say I am, I do not mean a separate entity with a body as its nucleus. I mean the totality of being, the ocean of consciousness, the entire universe of all that is and knows. I have nothing to desire, for I am complete forever. Can you touch the inner life of other people? I am the people. All beings are in me. The real cannot be described, it must be experienced. All is one, however much we quibble, and all is done to please the one source and goal of every desire, whom we all know as the I Am. What is the root of pain, ignorance of yourself? What is the root of desire, the urge to find yourself? All creation toils for itself and will not rest until it returns to it. It can return whenever you want it. By all means help the world. You will not help much, but the effort will make you grow. There is nothing wrong in trying to help the world. When the time comes for the world to be helped, some people are given the will, the wisdom, and the power to cause great changes. The sense I am is the manifestation of a deeper cause, which you may call self, God, reality, or by any other name. You must realize first of all that you are the proof of everything, including yourself. None can prove your existence because his existence must be confirmed by you first. Your being and knowing you owe nobody. Remember, you are entirely on your own. You do not come from somewhere. You do not go anywhere. You are timeless being and awareness. Give up the idea of being what you think yourself to be, and there will be no gap. By imagining yourself as separate, you have created the gap. You need not cross it, just don't create it. All is you and yours, 
there is nobody else. This is a fact. Words don't matter. What matters is the idea you have of yourself, for it blocks you. Give it up. You must not be compelled to think the same thoughts again and again. Move on. Don't be childish. It's easier to change than to suffer. Grow out of your childishness, that is all. Everything happens all the time, but you must be ready for it. Readiness is ripeness. You do not see the real because your mind is not ready for it. Unready means afraid. You are afraid of what you are. Your destination is the whole, but you are afraid that you will lose your identity. This is childishness, clinging to the toys, to your desires and fears, opinions and ideas. Give it all up and be ready for the real to assert itself. You are moving into the future all the time, whether you like it or not. Your mind does move. In the now, you are both the movable and the immovable. So far, you took yourself to be the movable and overlooked the immovable. Turn your mind inside out. Overlook the movable and you will find yourself to be the ever-present, changeless reality, inexpressible, but solid like a rock. Pain is transient. You are not. You are conscious. Hold on to it. In the abeyance of the mind, even the sense I am dissolves. There is no I am without the mind. All experience subsides with the mind. Without the mind, there can be neither experiencer nor experience. All consciousness is limited and therefore painful. At the root of consciousness lies desire the urge to experience. Beyond pain and pleasure, there is bliss. Body means burden. Sensations, desires, thoughts, these are all burdens. All consciousness is of conflict. To know that pain and pleasure are one is peace. As long as there is consciousness, there must be pleasure and pain. It is in the nature of the I am of consciousness to identify itself with the opposites.
pain and pleasure are both bliss. Here I am, sitting in front of you and telling you, from my own immediate and unchanging experience, pain and pleasure are the crests and valleys of the waves and the ocean of bliss. Deep down, there is utter fullness. Is your experience constant? It is timeless and changeless. What the mind created, the mind must destroy. Listen, remember, ponder, visualize, experience. Also, apply it in your daily life. Have patience with me, and above all, have patience with yourself. For you are your only obstacle. The way leads through yourself, beyond yourself. As long as you believe only the particular to be real, conscious and happy, and reject the non-dual reality as something imagined, an abstract concept, you will find me doling out concepts and abstractions. But once you have touched the real within your own being, you will find me describing what for you is the nearest and dearest. The Yani belongs to all. He gives himself tirelessly and completely to whoever comes to him. If he is not a giver, he is not a Yani. Whatever he has, he shares. My teaching is simple. Trust me for a while and do what I tell you. If you persevere, you will find that your trust was justified. You seem to want instant insight, forgetting that the instant is always preceded by a long preparation. The fruit falls suddenly, but the ripening takes time. I claim nothing as my own. When the I is not, where is the mind? I am all yours. Eat me and drink me. But while you repeat verbally, give, give, you do nothing to take what is offered. I am showing you a short and easy way to being able to see what I see. But you cling to your old habits of thought, feeling, and action, and put all the blame on me. I have nothing which you do not have. Self-knowledge is not a piece of property to be offered and accepted. It is a new dimension altogether, where there is nothing to give or take. How does it feel at your end? 
the common things of life. I experience them just as you do. The difference lies in what I do not experience. I do not experience fear or greed, hate or anger. I ask nothing, refuse nothing, keep nothing. In these matters I do not compromise. Maybe this is the outstanding difference between us. I will not compromise. I am true to myself, while you are afraid of reality. Whatever you do for the sake of truth will take you to truth. Only be earnest and honest. The shape it takes hardly matters. Spiritual practice is will asserted and reasserted. Mine is a silent language. Learn to listen and understand. Meet your own self. Be with your own self. Listen to it. Obey it. Cherish it. Keep it in mind ceaselessly. You need no other guide. As long as your urge for truth affects your daily life, all is well with you. Live your life without hurting anybody. Harmlessness is a most powerful form of yoga, and it will take you speedily to your goal. This is what I call Nisarga Yoga, the natural yoga. It is the art of living in peace and harmony, in friendliness and love. The fruit of it is happiness, uncaused and endless. Turn within and you will come to trust yourself. In everything else, confidence comes with experience. It is the mind that creates illusion, and it is the mind that gets free of it. Words may aggravate illusion, words may also help dispel it. There is nothing wrong in repeating the same truth again and again until it becomes reality. The mother's work is not over with the birth of the child. She feeds it day after day, year after year, until it needs her no longer. People need hearing words until facts speak to them louder than words. Just like the one sun is reflected in a billion dewdrops, so is the timeless endlessly repeated. When I repeat, I am, I am, I merely assert and reassert an ever-present fact. You get tired of my words because you do not see the living truth behind them. Contact it, and you will find the full meaning of words and of silence, both. By itself, nothing has existence. Everything needs its own absence. To be is to be distinguishable, to be here and not there, to be now and not then, to be thus and not otherwise. 
Like water is shaped by the container, so is everything determined by conditions. As water remains water regardless of the vessels, as light remains itself regardless of the colors it brings out, so does the real remain real, regardless of conditions in which it is reflected. We can talk of the unreal, the illusory, the transient, the conditioned. To go beyond, we must pass through total negation of everything as having independent existence. All things depend. On what do they depend? On consciousness. And consciousness depends on the witness. The witness is the reflection of the real in all its purity. It depends on the condition of the mind. Without the witness, it becomes unconsciousness, just living. The witness is latent in every state of consciousness just like light in every color. The ordinary man is afraid to die because he is afraid of change. The Yani is not afraid because his mind is dead already. He does not think I live. He knows there is life. There is no change in it and no death. Death appears to be a change in time and space. Where there is neither time nor space, how can there be death? The Yani is already dead to name and shape. He has nowhere to go, nothing to do nothing to become. Do you know God, that you talk of him so freely? What is God to you? A sound? A word on paper? An idea in the mind? You do not know your own powers. You never investigated. Begin with yourself now. To me, you are your own God. But if you think otherwise, think to the end. If there be God, then all is God's and all is for the best. Welcome all that comes with a glad and thankful heart, and love all creatures, this too will take you to yourself. The world is but a show, glittering and empty. It is and yet is not. It is there as long as I want to see it and take part in it. When I cease caring, it dissolves. It has no cause and serves no purpose. It just happens when we are absent-minded. It appears exactly as it looks, but there is no depth in it, nor meaning. Only the onlooker is real. Call him self or atma. To the self, the world is but a colorful show, which he enjoys as long as it lasts and forgets when it is over. Whatever happens on the stage 
makes him shudder in terror or roll with laughter. Yet, all the time he is aware that it is but a show. Without desire or fear, he enjoys it as it happens. He is happy and fully aware that happiness is his very nature and that he need not do anything nor strive for anything to secure it. It follows him more real than the body, nearer than the mind itself. You imagine that without cause there can be no happiness. To me, dependence on anything for happiness is utter misery. Pleasure and pain have causes, while my state is my own, totally uncaused, independent, unassailable. The world just sprouts into being out of nothing and returns to nothing. As long as you are outside my state, you will have creators, preservers, and destroyers. But once with me, you will know the self only and see yourself in all. In reality, I only look. Whatever is done is done on the stage joy and sorrow, life and death. They are all real to the man in bondage. To me, they are all in the show, as unreal as the show itself. At the root of my being is pure awareness, a speck of intense light. This speck, by its very nature, radiates and creates pictures in space and events in time, effortlessly and spontaneously. As long as it is merely aware, there are no problems, but when the discriminative mind comes into being and creates distinctions, pleasure and pain arise. Life creates everything, but the Supreme is beyond all. The Yani seems to be a very lonely being all by himself. He is alone, but he is all. He is not even a being. He is the beingness of all beings. Not even that. No words apply. He is what he is the ground from which all grows. Everybody dies as he lives. I am not afraid of death, because I am not afraid of life. I live a happy life and shall die a happy death. Misery is to be born, not to die. All depends how you look at it. In 
my world, nobody is born and nobody dies. Some people go on a journey and come back. Some never leave. What difference does it make since they travel in dreamlands, each wrapped up in his own dream? Only the waking up is important. It is enough to know the I am as reality and also love. The gospel of self-realization, once heard, will never be forgotten. Like a seed left in the ground, it will wait for the right season and sprout and grow into a mighty tree. Does Narayani feel sorrow when his child dies? Does he not suffer? He suffers with those who suffer. The event itself is of little importance, but he is full of compassion for the suffering being, whether alive or dead, in the body or out of it. After all, love and compassion are his very nature he is one with all that lives, and love is that oneness in action. The Yani is afraid of nothing, but he pities the man who is afraid. After all, to be born, to live, and to die is natural. To be afraid is not. What about the prayers for the dead? By all means, pray for the dead. It pleases them very much. They are flattered. The Yani does not need your prayers. He is himself the answer to your prayers. How does the Yani fare after death? The Yani is dead already. Do you expect him to die again? There are no important events for Yani, except when somebody reaches the highest goal. Then only his heart rejoices. All else is of no concern. The entire universe is his body. All life is his life. As in a city of lights, when one bulb burns out, it does not affect the network. So the death of a body does not affect the whole. Anything you do for the sake of enlightenment takes you near. Anything you do without remembering enlightenment puts you off. But why complicate? Just know that you are above and beyond all things and thoughts. What you want to be, you are it already. Just keep it in mind. Keep in mind what I tell you. Desire nothing, for you lack nothing. The very seeking prevents you from finding. Life and death are all the same to me. Compassion and love are my very core. Void of all predilections, I am free to love.
One can give food, clothes, shelter, knowledge, affection. But the highest gift is the gospel of enlightenment. Once you have it, nobody can take it away from you. The Supreme Reality manifests itself in innumerable ways. Infinite in number are its names and shapes. All arise, all merge in the same ocean. The source of all is one. Looking for causes and results is but the pastime of the mind. What is, is lovable. Love is not a result, it is the very ground of being. Wherever you go, you will find being, consciousness, and love. Why and what for make preferences? All happens as it happens. Calamities, whether natural or man-made, happen, and there is no need to feel horrified. In every event, the entire universe is reflected. The ultimate cause is untraceable. The very idea of causation is only a way of thinking and speaking. We cannot imagine uncaused emergence. The causes of perversity are also natural. Heredity, environment, and so on. You are too quick to condemn. Do not worry about others. Deal with your own mind first. When you realize that your mind too is a part of nature, the duality will cease. Develop the witness attitude and you will find in your own experience that detachment brings control. The state of witnessing is full of power. There is nothing passive about it. The new is the total denial of the old. The permissive new is not really new. It is but a new attitude of the old. The really new obliterates the old completely. The two cannot be together. There is but one self. It is always now. What you call the other self, old or new, is but a modality, another aspect of the one self. The self is single. You are that self, and you have ideas of what you have been or will be. But an idea is not the self. How can there be conflict between what is and what is not? Conflict is the characteristic of the old. When the new emerges, the old is no longer.
anything that implies a continuity, a sequence, a passing from stage to stage, cannot be real. There is no progress in reality. It is final, perfect, unrelated. You can do nothing to bring it about, but you can avoid creating obstacles. Watch your mind, how it comes into being, how it operates. As you watch your mind, you discover yourself as the watcher. When you stand motionless, only watching, you discover yourself as the light behind the watcher. The source of light is dark. Unknown is the source of knowledge. That source alone is. Go back to that source and abide there. It is neither in the sky nor in the all-pervading ether. God is all that is great and wonderful. I am nothing, have nothing, can do nothing. Yet, all comes out of me. The source is me, the root, the origin is me. When reality explodes in you, you may call it experience of God, or rather it is God experiencing you. God knows you when you know yourself. Reality is not the result of a process, it is an explosion. It is definitely beyond the mind but all you can do is to know your mind well. Not that the mind will help you, but by knowing your mind, you may avoid your mind disabling you. You have to be very alert, or else your mind will play false with you. It is like watching a thief. Not that you expect anything from a thief, but you do not want to be robbed. In the same way, you give a lot of attention to the mind without expecting anything from it. Treating everything as a dream liberates. As long as you give reality to dreams, you are their slave. By imagining that you are born as so-and-so, you become a slave to the so-and-so. The essence of slavery is to imagine yourself to be a process, to have past and future, to have history. In fact, we have no history. We are not a process. We do not develop nor decay. Also, see all as a dream and stay out of it. I am calling you back to yourself. All I ask you is to look at yourself, towards yourself, into yourself. To what purpose? You live, you feel, you think. By giving attention to your living, feeling and thinking, you free yourself from them and go beyond them. Your personality dissolves and only the witness remains. Then you go beyond the witness. Do not ask how it happens.
Consciousness does not shine by itself. It shines by a light beyond it. Having seen the dreamlike quality of consciousness, look for the light in which it appears, which gives it being. There is the content of consciousness, as well as the awareness of it. Experience is of change. It comes and goes. Reality is not an event. It cannot be experienced. It is not perceivable in the same way as an event is perceivable. If you wait for an event to take place, for the coming of reality, you will wait forever. For reality never comes, nor goes. It is to be perceived, not expected. It is not to be prepared for and anticipated. But the very longing and search for reality is the movement, operation, action of reality. All you can do is to grasp the central point, that reality is not an event and does not happen, and whatever happens, whatever comes and goes, is not reality. Neither action, nor feeling, nor thought express reality. There is no such thing as an expression of reality. You are introducing a duality where there is none. Only reality is. There is nothing else. All happens as it needs, yet nothing happens. I do what seems to be necessary, but at the same time I know that nothing is necessary, that life itself is only make-belief. Nothing is done by me. Everything just happens. I do not expect. I do not plan. I just watch, events happening, knowing them to be unreal. They just happen. To me, nothing ever happens. There is something changeless, motionless, immovable, rock-like, unassailable a solid mass of pure being, consciousness bliss. I am never out of it. Nothing can take me out of it. No torture, no calamity. If I understand you rightly, this state did not come by cultivation. There was no coming. It was so, always. There was discovery, and it was sudden. Just as at birth you discover the world suddenly, as suddenly I discovered my real being. Is your condition permanent or intermittent? Absolutely steady. Whatever I may do, it stays like a rock, motionless. 
Once you have awakened into reality, you stay in it. A child does not return to the womb. It is a simple state, smaller than the smallest, bigger than the biggest. It is self-evident and yet beyond description. Is there a way to it? Everything can become a way, provided you are interested. Just puzzling over my words and trying to grasp their full meaning is a sadhana quite sufficient for breaking down the wall. You are quite capable of crossing over. Only be sincere. By what is the Yani recognized? There are no distinctive marks of a Yana. Only ignorance can be recognized, not Yana. Nor does a Yani claim to be something special. All those who proclaim their own greatness and uniqueness are not Yanis. They are mistaking some unusual development for realization. The Yani shows no tendency to proclaim himself to be a Yani. He considers himself to be perfectly normal, true to his real nature. Proclaiming oneself to be an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent deity is a dear sign of ignorance. The words of a yani have the power of dispelling ignorance and darkness in the mind. It is not the words that matter, but the power behind them. What is that power? The power of conviction, based on personal realization, on one's own direct experience. If the seeker is earnest, the light can be given. The light is for all and always there, but the seekers are few. And among those few, those who are ready are very rare. Ripeness of heart and mind is indispensable. You see, I was so attuned to my guru, so completely trusting him, there was so little of resistance in me, that it all happened easily and quickly. But not everybody is so fortunate. Laziness and restlessness often stand in the way, and until they are seen and removed, the progress is slow. All those who have realized on the spot, by mere touch, look, or thought, have been ripe for it. But such are very few. The majority needs some time for ripening. Sadhana is accelerated ripening. Integrity will take you to reality. When all the false self-identifications are thrown away, 
what remains is all embracing love. Get rid of all ideas about yourself, even of the idea that you are God. No self-definition is valid. When you demand nothing of the world, nor of God, when you want nothing, seek nothing, expect nothing, then the Supreme State will come to you uninvited and unexpected. Stay open and quiet, that is all. What you seek is so near you that there is no place for a way. Don't concern yourself with others, take care of yourself. Remember that you are. Life is seeking, one cannot help seeking. When all search ceases, it is the supreme state. It is a timeless state, ever present. Sadhana is a search for what to give up. Empty yourself completely. Self-remembrance, awareness of I am, ripens him powerfully and speedily. Give up all ideas about yourself and simply be. In the light of consciousness, all sorts of things happen, and one need not give special importance to any. The sight of a flower is as marvelous as the vision of God. Let them be. Why remember them and then make memory into a problem? Be bland about them. Do not divide them into high and low, inner and outer, lasting and transient. Go beyond. Go back to the source. Go to the self that is the same whatever happens. Your weakness is due to your conviction that you were born into the world. In reality, the world is ever recreated in you and by you. See everything as emanating from the light, which is the source of your own being. You will find that in that light, there is love and infinite energy. See what you are. Don't ask others. Don't let others tell you about yourself. Look within and see. All the teacher can tell you is only this. There is no need for going from one to another. The same water is in all the wells. You just draw from the nearest. In my case, the water is within me, and I am the water. The body appears in your mind. Your mind is the content of your consciousness. You are the motionless witness of the river of consciousness, which changes eternally without changing you in any way. Your own changelessness is so obvious that you do not notice it. 
have a good look at yourself and all these misapprehensions and misconceptions will dissolve. Just as all the little watery lives are in water and cannot be without water, so all the universe is in you and cannot be without you. God is only an idea in your mind. The fact is you. The only thing you know for sure is here and now I am. Remove the here and now. The I am remains unassailable. Examine the motion of change and you will see what can change while you do not change can be said to be independent of you. But what is changeless must be one with whatever else is changeless. For duality implies interaction and interaction means change. In other words, the absolutely material and the absolutely spiritual, the totally objective and the totally subjective are identical, both in substance and essence. The main point to grasp is that you have projected onto yourself a world of your own imagination, based on memories, on desires and fears, and that you have imprisoned yourself in it. Break the spell and be free. See the imaginary as imaginary and be free of fear. When you look at anything, it is the ultimate you see, but you imagine that you see a cloud or a tree. Learn to look without imagination to listen without distortion, that is all. Stop attributing names and shapes to the essentially nameless and formless. Realize that every mode of perception is subjective, that what is seen or heard, touched or smelt, felt or thought, expected or imagined, is in the mind and not in reality. And you will experience peace and freedom from fear. Even the sense of I am is composed of the pure light and the sense of being. The I is there even without the am. So is the pure light there whether you say I or not. Become aware of that light and you will never lose it. The beingness in being, the awareness in consciousness, the interest in every experience, that is not describable, yet perfectly accessible for there is nothing else.
when you realize that you are the light of the world, you will also realize that you are the love of it. That to know is to love, and to love is to know. Of all the affections, the love of oneself comes first. Your love of the world is the reflection of your love of yourself. For your world is of your own creation. Light and love are impersonal, but they are reflected in your mind as knowing and wishing oneself well. We are always friendly towards ourselves, but not always wise. A yogi is a man whose goodwill is allied to wisdom. First words, then silence. One must be ripe for silence. Unselfish work leads to silence. For when you work selflessly, you don't need to ask for help. You just do what needs be done, leaving success and failure to the unknown. For everything is caused by innumerable factors, of which your personal endeavor is but one. Yet, such is the magic of man's mind and heart that the most improbable happens when human will and love pull together. Work on, and the universe will work with you. After all, the very idea of doing the right comes to you from the unknown. Leave it to the unknown as far as the results go. Just go through the necessary movements. You are merely one of the links in the long chain of causation. Fundamentally, all happens in the mind only. When you work for something wholeheartedly and steadily, it happens, for it is the function of the mind to make things happen. In reality, nothing is lacking and nothing is needed. All work is on the surface only. In the depths, there is perfect peace. All your problems arise because you have defined and therefore limited yourself. When you do not think yourself to be this or that, all conflict ceases. There is no such thing as a person. There are only restrictions and limitations. The sum total of these defines the person. You think you know yourself when you know what you are, but you never know who you are. The person merely appears to be like the space within the pot appears to have the shape and volume and smell of the pot. See that you are not what you believe yourself to be. Fight with all the strength at your disposal against the idea that you are nameable and describable. You are not.
What do you know about yourself? You can only be what you are in reality. You can only appear to be what you are not. You have never moved away from perfection. All idea of self-improvement is conventional and verbal. As the sun knows not darkness, so does the self know not the non-self. It is the mind which by knowing the other becomes the other. Yet, the mind is nothing else but the self. It is the self that becomes the other, the not-self, and yet remains the self. Reality is the ultimate destroyer. All separation Every kind of estrangement and alienation is false. All is one. This is the ultimate solution of every conflict. As long as we imagine ourselves to be separate personalities, one quite apart from another, we cannot grasp reality, which is essentially impersonal. First, we must know ourselves as witnesses only, dimensionless and timeless centers of observation and then realize that immense ocean of pure awareness. Time and space are like words written on paper. The paper is real, the words merely a convention. The mind creates time and space and takes its own creations for reality. All is here and now, but we do not see it. Truly, all is in me and by me. There is nothing else. The very idea of else is a disaster and a calamity. That which does not exist cannot have a cause. There is no such thing as a separate person. Even taking the empirical point of view, it is obvious that everything is the cause of everything. That everything is as it is because the entire universe is as it is. Self-limitation is the very essence of personality. But you are universal. You need not and you cannot become what you are already. Only cease imagining yourself 
to be the particular. What comes and goes has no being. It owes its very appearance to reality. You know that there is a world, but does the world know you? Realize that you are the eternal source and accept all as your own. Such acceptance is true love. Having never left the house, you are asking for the way home. Get rid of wrong ideas, that is all. Collecting right ideas also will take you nowhere. Just cease imagining. Reality is neither subjective nor objective, neither mind nor matter, neither time nor space. These divisions need somebody to whom they happen, a conscious, separate center. But reality is all and nothing, the totality and the exclusion, the fullness and the emptiness, fully consistent, absolutely paradoxical. You cannot speak about it. You can only lose yourself in it. When you deny reality to anything, you come to a residue which cannot be denied. Even the idea of God as the creator is false. Do I owe my being to any other being? Because I am, all is. Everyone creates a world for himself and lives in it, imprisoned by one's ignorance. All we have to do is to deny reality to our prison. You yourself are the proof. You have not, nor can you have any other proof. You are yourself. You know yourself. You love yourself. Whatever the mind does, it does for the love of its own self. The very nature of the self is love. It is loved, loving, and lovable. It is the self that makes the body and the mind so interesting, so very dear. The very attention given to them comes from the self. Awareness of being is bliss. To know that you are neither body nor mind, watch yourself steadily and live unaffected by your body and mind, completely aloof, as if you were dead, 
it means you have no vested interests, either in the body or in the mind. I am not asking you to commit suicide, nor can you. You can only kill the body. You cannot stop the mental process. Nor can you put an end to the person you think you are. Just remain unaffected. This complete aloofness, unconcern with mind and body, is the best proof that at the core of your being, you are neither mind nor body. What happens to the body and the mind may not be within your power to change, but you can always put an end to your imagining yourself to be body and mind. Whatever happens, remind yourself that only your body and mind are affected, not yourself. The more earnest you are at remembering what needs to be remembered, the sooner will you be aware of yourself as you are. For memory will become experience. Earnestness reveals being. What is imagined and willed becomes actuality. Here lies the danger as well as the way out. Increase and widen your desires till nothing but reality can fulfill them. It is not desire that is wrong, but its narrowness and smallness Desire is devotion. By all means be devoted to the real, the infinite, the eternal heart of being. Transform desire into love. All you want is to be happy. All your desires, whatever they may be, are expressions of your longing for happiness. Basically, you wish yourself well. By all means, love yourself wisely. What is wrong is to love yourself stupidly so as to make yourself suffer. Love yourself wisely. Both indulgence and austerity have the same purpose in view, to make you happy. Indulgence is the stupid way. Austerity is the wise way. It is the choices you make that are wrong. To imagine that some little thing, food, sex, power, fame, will make you happy is to deceive yourself. Only something as vast and deep as your real self can make you truly and lastingly happy. You are not the body, and dragging the body from place to place will take you nowhere. Your mind is free to roam the three worlds, make full use of it. You are not in the body. The body is in you. The mind is in you. They happen to you. They are there because you find them interesting. 
your very nature has the infinite capacity to enjoy. It is full of zest and affection. It does not know evil nor ugliness. It hopes. It trusts. It loves. That which you are, your true self, you love it, and whatever you do, you do for your own happiness. To find it, to know, to cherish it, is your basic urge. Since time immemorial, you loved yourself, but never wisely. Use your body and mind wisely in the service of the self. That is all. Be true to your own self. Love yourself absolutely. Do not pretend that you love others as yourself unless you have realized them as one with yourself. You cannot love them. Don't pretend to be what you are not. Don't refuse to be what you are. Your love of others is the result of self knowledge, not its cause. Without self realization, no virtue is genuine. When you know beyond all doubting that the same life flows through all that is, and you are that life, you will love all naturally and spontaneously. When you realize the depth and fullness of your love of yourself, you know that every living being and the entire universe are included in your affection. But when you look at anything as separate from you, you cannot love it, for you are afraid of it. Alienation causes fear, and fear deepens alienation. It is a vicious cycle. Only self-realization can break it. Go for it, resolutely. What is done under pressure of society and circumstances does not matter much, for it is mostly mechanical, mere reacting to impacts. The guru demands one thing only, clarity and intensity of purpose, a sense of responsibility for oneself. The very reality of the world must be questioned. Who is the guru after all? He who knows the state in which there is neither the world nor the thought of it. He is the Supreme Teacher. To find Him means to reach the state in which imagination is no longer taken for reality. Please, understand that the Guru stands for reality, for truth, for what is. He is a realist in the highest sense of the term. He cannot and shall not come to terms with the mind and its delusions. He comes to take you to the real. Don't expect him to do anything else.
to Him, your questions about obedience and discipline do not make sense. For in His eyes, the person you take yourself to be does not exist. Your questions are about a non-existing person. What exists for you does not exist for Him. What you take for granted, He denies absolutely. He wants you to see yourself as He sees you. Then, you will not need a guru to obey and follow, for you will obey and follow your own reality. Realize that whatever you think yourself to be is just a stream of events. That while all happens, comes and goes, you alone are the changeless among the changeful, the self-evident among the inferred. Separate the observed from the observer and abandon false identifications. Do your work. When you have a moment free, look within. If you are earnest, you will use your leisure fully. That is enough. Your difficulty lies in your wanting reality and being afraid of it at the same time. You are afraid of it because you do not know it. The familiar things are known, you feel secure with them. The unknown is uncertain and therefore dangerous. But to know reality is to be in harmony with it, and in harmony there is no place for fear. In deep silence, the self contemplates the body. It is like the white paper on which nothing is written yet. Be like that infant. Instead of trying to be this or that, be happy to be. You will be a fully awakened witness of the field of consciousness. When you love the self and nothing else, you go beyond the selfish and the unselfish. All distinctions lose their meaning. Love of one and love of all merge together in love, pure and simple, addressed to none, denied to none. Stay in that love. Go deeper and deeper into it. Investigate yourself and love the investigation, and you will solve not only your own problems, but also the problems of humanity. The main thing is earnestness. Be honest with yourself and nothing will betray you. Virtues and powers are mere tokens for children to play with. They are useful in the world, but do not take you out of it. To go beyond, you need alert immobility, quiet attention.
Your body is food transformed. As your food, gross and subtle, so will be your health. Sex is an acquired habit. Go beyond. As long as your focus is on the body, you will remain in the clutches of food and sex, fear and death. Find yourself and be free. When you sit quiet and watch yourself, all kinds of things may come to the surface. Do nothing about them. Don't react to them. As they have come, so will they go by themselves. All that matters is mindfulness, total awareness of oneself, or rather, of one's mind. The observer is beyond observation. What is observable is not the real self. You can observe the observation, but not the observer. You know you are the ultimate observer by direct insight, not by a logical process based on observation. You are what you are but you know what you are not. The self is known as being. The not-self is known as transient. But in reality, all is in the mind. The observed, observation, and observer are mental constructs. The self alone is. To divide and particularize is the mind's very nature. There is no harm in dividing, but separation goes against fact. Things and people are different, but they are not separate. Nature is one. Reality is one. There are opposites, but no opposition. There is a difference between work and mere activity. All nature works. Work is nature. Nature is work. On the other hand, activity is based on desire and fear, on longing to possess and enjoy, on fear of pain and annihilation. Work is by the whole, for the whole. Activity is by oneself, for oneself. Do what you feel like doing. Don't bully yourself. Violence will make you hard and rigid. Do not fight with what you take to be obstacles on your way. Just be interested in them. Watch them. Observe. Inquire. Let anything happen good or bad, but don't let yourself be submerged 
by what happens. The mind must learn that beyond the moving mind, there is the background of awareness, which does not change. The mind must come to know the true self and respect it and cease covering it up, like the moon which obscures the sun during a solar eclipse. Just realize that nothing observable or experienceable is you, or binds you. Take no notice of what is not yourself. To be aware is to be awake. Unaware means asleep. You are aware anyhow, you need not try to be. What you need is to be aware of being aware. Be aware deliberately and consciously. Broaden and deepen the field of awareness. You are always conscious of the mind, but you are not aware of yourself as being conscious. Look at it this way. The mind produces thoughts ceaselessly, even when you do not look at them. When you know what is going on in your mind, you call it consciousness. This is your waking state. Your consciousness shifts from sensation to sensation, from perception to perception, from idea to idea in endless succession. Then comes awareness, the direct insight into the whole of consciousness, the totality of the mind. The mind is like a river flowing ceaselessly in the bed of the body. You identify yourself for a moment with some particular ripple and call it my thought. All you are conscious of is your mind. Awareness is the cognizance of consciousness as a whole. Don't say, everybody is conscious. Say, there is consciousness, in which everything appears and disappears. Our minds are just waves on the ocean of consciousness. As waves, they come and go. As ocean, they are infinite and eternal. Know yourself as the ocean of being, the womb of all existence. These are all metaphors, of course. The reality is beyond description. You can know it only by being it. While the mind is centered in the body and consciousness is centered in the mind, awareness is free. The body has its urges and mind its pains and pleasures. Awareness is unattached and unshaken. It is lucid, silent, peaceful, alert, and unafraid without desire and fear. Meditate on it as your true being and try to be it in your daily life, and you shall realize it in its fullness.
mind is interested in what happens, while awareness is interested in the mind itself. The child is after the toy, but the mother watches the child, not the toy. By looking tirelessly, I became quite empty, and with that emptiness, all came back to me, except the mind. I find I have lost the mind, irretrievably. I am neither conscious nor unconscious. I am beyond the mind and its various states and conditions. Distinctions are created by the mind and apply to the mind only. I am pure consciousness itself, unbroken awareness of all that is. I am in a more real state than yours. I am undistracted by the distinctions and separations which constitute a person. As long as the body lasts, it has its needs like any other, but my mental process has come to an end. I am not a person, in your sense of the word, though I may appear a person to you. I am that infinite ocean of consciousness in which all happens. I am also beyond all existence and cognition, pure bliss of being. There is nothing I feel separate from. Hence, I am all. No thing is me, so I am nothing. The same power that makes the fire burn and the water flow, the seeds sprout and the trees grow, makes me answer your questions. There is nothing personal about me, though the language and the style may appear personal. A person is a set pattern of desires and thoughts and resulting actions. There is no such pattern in my case. There is nothing I desire or fear. How can there be a pattern? Life will escape, the body will die, but it will not affect me in the least. Beyond space and time, I am uncaused, uncausing, yet the very matrix of existence. My teacher told me to hold on to the sense I am tenaciously and not to swerve from it for even a moment. I did my best to follow his advice and in a comparatively short time I realized within myself the truth of his teaching. All I did was to remember his teaching, his face his words constantly. This brought an end to the mind. In the stillness of the mind, I saw myself as I am, unbound.
the search for reality is itself the movement of reality. In a way, all search is for the real bliss or the bliss of the real. One has to understand that the search for reality or God or Guru and the search for the self are the same. When one is found, all are found. When I am and God is become in your mind indistinguishable, then something will happen and you will know without a trace of doubt that God is because you are, and you are because God is. The two are one. Destiny refers only to name and shape. Since you are neither body nor mind, destiny has no control over you. You are completely free. The cup is conditioned by its shape, material use, and so on. But the space within the cup is free. It happens to be in the cup only when viewed in connection with the cup. Otherwise, it is just space. As long as there is a body, you appear to be embodied. Without the body, you are not disembodied. You just are. To be free from thoughts is itself meditation. You begin by letting thoughts flow and watching them. The very observation slows down the mind till it stops altogether. Once the mind is quiet, keep it quiet. Don't get bored with peace. Be in it, go deeper into it. Watch your thoughts and watch yourself watching the thoughts. The state of freedom from all thoughts will happen suddenly and by the bliss of it, you shall recognize it. illness begins in the mind. Take care of the mind first by tracing and eliminating all wrong ideas and emotions. Then live and work disregarding illness and think no more of it. With the removal of causes, the effect is bound to depart. Man becomes what he believes himself to be. Abandon all ideas about yourself, and you will find yourself to be the pure witness, beyond all that can happen to the body or the mind. People come to you for advice. How do you know what to answer? As I hear the question, 
so do I hear the answer. And how do you know that your answer is right? Once I know the true source of the answers, I need not doubt them. From a pure source, only pure water will flow. I am not concerned with people's desires and fears. I am in tune with facts, not with opinions. Man takes his name and shape to be himself, while I take nothing to be myself. Were I to think myself to be a body known by its name, I would not have been able to answer your questions. Were I to take you to be a mere body, there would be no benefit to you from my answers. No true teacher indulges in opinions. He sees things as they are and shows them as they are. If you take people to be what they think themselves to be, you will only hurt them, as they hurt themselves so grievously all the time. But if you see them as they are in reality, it will do them enormous good. If they ask you what to do, what practices to adopt, which way of life to follow, answer, do nothing, just be. In being, all happens naturally. Science deals with names and shapes, quantities and qualities, patterns and laws. It is all right in its own place. But life is to be lived. There is no time for analysis. The response must be instantaneous. Hence, the importance of the spontaneous, the timeless. It is in the unknown that we live and move. The known is the past. Reality is good and beautiful. We create the chaos. What was never lost can never be found. Your very search for safety and joy keeps you away from them. Stop searching. Cease losing. The disease is simple and the remedy equally simple. It is your mind only that makes you insecure and unhappy. Anticipation makes you insecure, memory unhappy. Stop misusing your mind and all will be well with you. You need not set it right. It will set itself right as soon as you give up all concern with the past and the future and live entirely in the now. As nothing and nobody, you are safe and happy. Only in the mind of man there is chaos. The mind does not grasp the whole. Its focus is very narrow.
all must change. You are what does not change. When the I am myself goes, the I am all comes. When the I am all goes, I am comes. When even I am goes, reality alone is, and in it, every I am is preserved and glorified. Diversity without separateness is the ultimate that the mind can touch. Beyond that, all activity ceases, because in it, all goals are reached and all purposes fulfilled. The Supreme State is universal, here and now. Everybody already shares in it. It is the state of being, knowing, and liking. Who does not like to be, or does not know his own existence? But we take no advantage of this joy of being conscious. We do not go into it and purify it of all that is foreign to it. This work of mental self-purification, the cleansing of the psyche, is essential. Just as a speck in the eye, by causing inflammation, may wipe out the world, so the mistaken idea I am the body-mind, causes the self-concern, which obscures the universe. It is useless to fight the sense of being a limited and separate person, unless the roots of it are laid bare. Selfishness is rooted in the mistaken ideas of oneself. Clarification of the mind is yoga. The personal needs a base, a body to identify oneself with, just as a color needs a surface to appear on. The seeing of the color is independent of the color. It is the same whatever the color. One needs an eye to see a color. The colors are many. The eye is single. The impersonal is like the light in the color and also in the eye. Yet simple single, indivisible, and unperceivable, except in its manifestations. Not unknowable, but unperceivable, unobjectable, inseparable. The absolute or life you talk about, is it real or a mere theory to cover up our ignorance? Both. To the mind, a theory, in itself, is a reality. It is reality in its spontaneous and total rejection of the false. Just as light destroys darkness by its very presence, so does the Absolute
destroy imagination. To see that all knowledge is a form of ignorance is itself a movement of reality. The witness is not a person. The person comes into being when there is a basis for it, an organism, a body. In it, the absolute is reflected as awareness. Pure awareness becomes self-awareness. When there is a self, self-awareness is the witness. When there is no self to witness, there is no witnessing either. It is all very simple. It is the presence of the person that complicates. See that there is no such thing as a permanently separate person. And all becomes clear. Awareness, mind, matter, they are one reality in its two aspects as immovable and movable. And the three attributes of inertia, energy, and harmony. What comes first, consciousness or awareness? Awareness becomes consciousness when it has an object. The object changes all the time. In consciousness there is movement. Awareness by itself is motionless and timeless, here and now. In pure consciousness, nothing ever happens. Nothing is happening. Imagine a big building collapsing. Some rooms are in ruins, some are intact. But can you speak of the space as ruined or intact? It is only the structure that suffered and the people who happened to live in it. Nothing happened to space itself. Similarly, nothing happens to life when forms break down and names are wiped out. The goldsmith melts down old ornaments to make new. Sometimes a good piece goes with the bad. He takes it in his stride, for he knows that no gold is lost. Death is natural. The manner of dying is man-made. Separateness causes fear and aggression, which again cause violence. Do away with man-made separations, and all this horror of people killing each other will surely end. But, in reality, there is no killing, and there is no dying. The real does not die. The unreal never lived. Set your mind right, and all will be right. When you know that the world is one, that humanity is one, you will act accordingly. 
But first of all, you must attend to the way you feel, think and live. Unless there is order in yourself, there can be no order in the world. In reality, nothing happens. Onto the screen of the mind, destiny forever projects its pictures, memories of former projections, and thus illusion constantly renews itself. The pictures come and go, light intercepted by ignorance. See the light and disregard the picture. Evil is the stench of a mind that is diseased. Heal your mind and it will cease to project distorted, ugly pictures. Reality cannot be momentary. It is timeless. But timelessness is not duration. As long as you pay attention to ideas, your own or of others, you will be in trouble. But if you disregard all teachings, all books, anything put into words, and dive deeply within yourself, and find yourself, this alone will solve all your problems and leave you in full mastery of every situation, because you will not be dominated by your ideas about the situation. Take an example. You are in the company of an attractive woman. You get ideas about her, and this creates a sexual situation. A problem is created and you start looking for books on continence or enjoyment. Were you a baby, both of you could be naked and together without any problem arising. Just stop thinking you are bodies and the problems of love and sex will lose their meaning. With all sense of limitation gone, fear, pain, and the search for pleasure all cease. Only awareness remains. The self is near, and the way to it is easy. All you need do is do nothing. Your sadhana, spiritual practice, is to be. The doing happens. Just be watchful. Where is the difficulty in remembering that you are? You are all the time. What is your procedure for clearing the mind of the unnecessary? What are your means, your tools for the purification of the mind? The mind exists in two states, as water and as honey. The water vibrates at the least disturbance. 
while the honey, however disturbed, returns quickly to immobility. You may have chronic fever and shiver all the time. It is desires and fears that make the mind restless. Free from all negative emotions, it is quiet. You think you are coming and going, passing through various states and moods. I see things as they are, momentary events presenting themselves to me in rapid succession, deriving their being from me, yet definitely neither me nor mine. Among phenomena, I am not one, nor subject to any. I am independent, so simply and totally, that your mind, accustomed to opposition and denial, cannot grasp it. I mean literally what I say. I do not need to oppose or deny because it is clear to me that I cannot be the opposite or denial of anything. I am just beyond, in a different dimension altogether. Set your intellect aside. Don't use it in these matters. Why do you talk of action? Are you acting ever? Some unknown power acts, and you imagine that you are acting. You are merely watching what happens without being able to influence it in any way. You are like a patient under anesthesia on whom a surgeon performs an operation. When you wake up, you find the operation over. Can you say you have done something? You have no choice, only the illusion of it. My guru told me, trust me, I tell you, you are divine. Take it as the absolute truth. Your joy is divine. Your suffering is divine too. All comes from God. Remember it. Always. You are God. Your will alone is done. I did believe him and soon realized how wonderfully true and accurate were his words. I did not condition my mind by thinking, I am God. I am wonderful, I am beyond, I simply followed his instruction, which was to focus the mind on pure being, I 
am and stay in it. I used to sit for hours with nothing but the I am in my mind. And soon peace and joy and a deep all embracing love became my normal state. In it all disappeared, myself, my guru, the life I lived, the world around me. Only peace remained and unfathomable silence. Your expectation of something unique and dramatic, of some wonderful explosion, is merely hindering and delaying your self-realization. You are not to expect an explosion, for the explosion has already happened at the moment when you were born, when you realized yourself as being, knowing, feeling. There is only one mistake you are making. You take the inner for the outer and the outer for the inner. What is in you, you take to be outside you and what is outside you take to be in you. The mind and feelings are external, but you take them to be intimate. You believe the world to be objective, while it is entirely a projection of your own psyche. That is the basic confusion, and no new explosion will set it right. You have to think yourself out of it. There is no other way. Watch your thoughts as you watch the street traffic. People come and go. You register without response. It may not be easy in the beginning, but with some practice, you will find that your mind can function on many levels at the same time, and you can be aware of them all. It is only when you have a vested interest in any particular level that your attention gets caught in it and you black out on other levels. Even then, the work on the blacked out levels goes on outside the field of consciousness. Do not struggle with your memories and thoughts. Try only to include in your field of attention the other, more important questions, like, Who am I? How did I happen to be born? Whence this universe around me? What is real and what is momentary? No memory will persist if you lose interest in it. It is the emotional link that perpetuates the bondage. You are always seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, always after happiness and peace. Don't you see that it is your very search for happiness that makes you feel miserable? Try the other way, indifferent to pain and pleasure neither asking nor refusing, give all your attention to the level on which I am is present. Soon you will realize that peace and happiness are in your very nature, and it is only seeking them through some particular channels that disturbs. 
avoid the disturbance, that is all. To seek, there is no need. You would not seek what you already have. You, yourself, are God, the supreme reality. To begin with, trust me. Trust the teacher. It enables you to make the first step. And then your trust is justified by your own experience. In every walk of life, initial trust is essential. Without it, little can be done. Every undertaking is an act of faith. Even your daily bread you eat on trust. By remembering what I told you, you will achieve everything. I am telling you again. You are the all-pervading, all-transcending reality. Behave accordingly. Think, feel, and act in harmony with the whole, and the actual experience of what I say will dawn upon you in no time. No effort is needed. Have faith and act on it. Please see that I want nothing from you. It is in your own self-interest that I speak, because above all, you love yourself. You want yourself secure and happy. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't deny it. It is natural and good to love oneself. Only you should know exactly what you love. It is not the body that you love. It is life. Perceiving, feeling, thinking, doing, loving, striving, creating. It is that life you love, which is you, which is all. Pay no attention to thoughts. Don't fight them. Just do nothing about them. Let them be, whatever they are. Your fighting them gives them life. Just disregard. Look through. Remember to remember, whatever happens, happens because I am. All remind you that you are. Take full advantage of the fact that to experience, you must be. You need not stop thinking. Just cease being interested. It is disinterestedness that liberates. Don't hold on. That is all. The world is made of rings. The hooks are all yours. Make straight your hooks, and nothing can hold you. Give up your addictions. There is nothing else to give up. Stop your routine of acquisitiveness your habit of looking for results, and the freedom of the universe is yours. Be effortless. What needs doing, do it. Don't resist. Your balance must be dynamic, based on doing just the right thing, from moment to moment. Don't be a child, unwilling to grow up. 
stereotyped gestures and postures will not help you. Rely entirely on your clarity of thought, purity of motive, and integrity of action. You cannot possibly go wrong. Go beyond and leave all behind. You want something like a round-the-clock ecstasy. Ecstasies come and go, necessarily, for the human brain cannot stand the tension for a long time. A prolonged ecstasy will burn out your brain, unless it is extremely pure and subtle. In nature, nothing is at standstill. Everything pulsates, appears, and disappears. Heart, breath, digestion, sleep and waking, birth and death. Everything comes and goes in waves. rhythm, periodicity, harmonious alternation of extremes is the rule. No use rebelling against the very pattern of life. If you seek the immutable, go beyond experience. When I say, remember I am, all the time. I mean, come back to it repeatedly. No particular thought can be mind's natural state, only silence. Not the idea of silence, but silence itself. When the mind is in its natural state, it reverts to silence spontaneously after every experience. Or rather, every experience happens against the background of silence. Now, what you have learned here becomes the seed. You may forget it, apparently, but it will live, and in due season sprout, and grow, and bring forth flowers and fruits. All will happen by itself. You need not to do anything, only don't prevent it. What is love? Is it not a state of being rather than a state of mind? Must you know that you love in order to love? Did you not love your mother unknowingly? Your craving for her love for an opportunity to love her, is it not the movement of love? Is not love as much a part of you as consciousness of being? You sought the love of your mother because you loved her.
but she would not let me. She could not stop you. Then why was I unhappy all my life? Because you did not go down to the very roots of your being. It is your complete ignorance of yourself that covered up your love and happiness and made you seek for what you have never lost. Love is will. The will to share your happiness with all. Being happy. Making happy. This is the rhythm of love. You began as a child and you will end as a child. Whatever you have acquired in the meantime, you must lose and start at the beginning. A child kicks, let it kick, just look at the kicking. And if you are too afraid of society to kick convincingly, look at that too. I know, it is a painful business, but there is no remedy except one, the search for remedies must cease. If you are angry or in pain, separate yourself from anger and pain and watch them. Externalization is the first step to liberation. Step away and look. The physical events will go on happening, but by themselves they have no importance. It is the mind alone that matters. Whatever happens, you cannot kick and scream in an airline office or in a bank. Society does not allow it. If you do not like their ways, or are not prepared to endure them, don't fly or carry money. Walk, and if you cannot walk, don't travel. If you deal with society, you must accept its ways, for its ways are your ways. Your needs and demands have created them. Your desires are so complex and contradictory. No wonder the society you create is also complex and contradictory. If you could only keep quiet clear of memories and expectations, you would be able to discern the beautiful pattern of events. It is your restlessness that causes chaos. You want immediate results. We do not dispense magic here. Everybody makes the same mistake, refusing the means, but wanting the ends. You want peace and harmony in the world, but refuse to have them in yourself. Follow my advice implicitly 
and you will not be disappointed. I cannot solve your problem by mere words. You have to act on what I told you and persevere. It is not the right advice that liberates, but the action based on it. Just like a doctor who, after giving the patient an injection, tells him, Now, keep quiet. Do nothing more, just keep quiet. I am telling you, you have got your injection. Now, keep quiet quiet. Just keep quiet. You have nothing else to do. My guru did the same. He would tell me something and then say, Now, keep quiet. Don't go on ruminating all the time. Stop. Be silent. All that needs doing can be done in peace and silence. There is no need to get upset. If you just try to keep quiet, all will come. The work, the strength for work, the right motive. Must you know everything beforehand? Don't be anxious about your future. Be quiet now, and all will fall into place. The unexpected is bound to happen, while the anticipated may never come. Don't tell me you cannot control your nature. You need not control it. Throw it overboard. Have no nature to fight or to submit to. No experience will hurt you, provided you don't make it into a habit. Of the entire universe, you are the subtle cause. All is because you are. Grasp this point firmly and deeply and dwell on it repeatedly. To realize this as absolutely true is liberation. Nature is neither pleasant nor painful. It is all intelligence and beauty. Pain and pleasure are in the mind. Change your scale of values and all will change. Pleasure and pain are mere disturbances of the senses. Treat them equally, and there will be only bliss. And the world is what you make it. By all means, make it happy.
Only contentment can make you happy. Desires fulfilled breed more desires. Keeping away from all desires and contentment in what comes by itself is a very fruitful state, a precondition to the state of fullness. Don't distrust its apparent sterility and emptiness. Believe me, it is the satisfaction of desires that breeds misery. Freedom from desires is bliss. Remember the instruction, whatever you come across, go beyond. It is like climbing a mountain, not a step can be missed. One step less, and the summit is not reached. The person is always the object. The witness is the subject. And their relation of mutual dependence is the reflection of their absolute identity. You imagine that they are distinct and separate states. They are not. They are the same consciousness at rest and in movement. Each state conscious of the other. Beyond the mind, all distinctions cease. As body, you are in space. As mind, you are in time. But are you mere body? with a mind in it? Have you ever investigated? You see people suffer and you seek the best way of helping them. The answer is obvious. First, put yourself beyond the need of help. Be sure your attitude is of pure goodwill, free of expectation of any kind. Those who seek mere happiness may end up in sublime indifference while love will never rest. As to the method, there is only one. You must come to know yourself, both what you appear to be and what you are. Clarity and charity go together. Each needs and strengthens the other. The world is not objective, and the sorrow of it is not avoidable. Compassion is but another word for the refusal to suffer for imaginary reasons.
It is always the false that makes you suffer. The false desires and fears. The false values and ideas. The false relationships between people. Abandon the false and you are free of pain. Truth makes happy. Truth liberates. You are neither the body nor in the body. There is no such thing as body. You have grievously misunderstood yourself. To understand rightly, investigate. This is your misconception. Inquire. Investigate. Doubt yourself and others. To find truth, you must not cling to your convictions. If you are sure of the immediate, you will never reach the ultimate. Your idea that you were born and that you will die is absurd. Both logic and experience contradict it. The entire universe contributes incessantly to your existence. Hence, the entire universe is your body. In that sense, I agree. Realize your real self, and even drugs will have no power over you. I make no claims of consistency. You think absolute consistency is possible. Prove it by example. Do not preach what you do not practice. Without awareness, the body would not last a second. There is in the body a current of energy, affection, and intelligence which guides, maintains, and energizes the body. Discover that current and stay with it. Find the spark of life. Life itself is timeless. Behave as if what I say is true and judge by what actually happens. I know what you are and I am telling you. Trust me for a while. The body and the mind are only symptoms of ignorance of misapprehension. Behave as if you were pure awareness, bodiless and mindless, spaceless and timeless, beyond where and when and how. Dwell on it. Think of it. Learn to accept its reality. Don't oppose it and deny it all the time. 
keep an open mind at least. Yoga is bending the outer to the inner. Make your mind and body express the real which is all and beyond all. By doing you succeed, not by arguing. The absolute precedes time. Awareness comes first. A bundle of memories and mental habits attracts attention. Awareness gets focalized and a person suddenly appears. Remove the light of awareness, go to sleep or swoon away and the person disappears. The person flickers. Awareness contains all space and time. The absolute is I know the source of all experience. From moment to moment, the little I need to know to live my life, I somehow happen to know. First, know your own mind, and you will find that the question of other minds does not arise at all, for there are no other people. You are the common factor, the only link between the minds. Being is consciousness. I am applies to all. Don't you see that the supreme reality is what makes everything possible? There is trouble only when you cling to something. When you hold on to nothing, no trouble arises. The relinquishing of the lesser is the gaining of the greater. Give up all, and you gain all. Then life becomes what it was meant to be pure radiation from an inexhaustible source. In that light, the world appears dimly like a dream. Let the dream unroll itself to its very end. You cannot help it, but you can look at the dream as a dream. Refuse it the stamp of reality. My heart wants you awake. I see you suffer in your dream and I know that you must wake up to end your woes. When you see your dream as dream, you wake up. But in your dream itself, I am not interested. Enough for me to know that you must wake up. You need not bring your dream to a definite conclusion or make it noble or happy or beautiful. All you need is to realize that you are 
dreaming. Stop imagining. Stop believing. See the contradictions, the incongruities, the falsehood, and the sorrow of the human state, the need to go beyond. Within the immensity of space floats a tiny atom of consciousness, and in it the entire universe is contained. In the dream, you love some and not others. On waking up, you find you are love itself, embracing all. Personal love, however intense and genuine, invariably binds. Love in freedom is love of all. When you are love itself, you are beyond time and numbers. In loving one, you love all. In loving all, you love each. One and all are not exclusive. I am beyond all names and shapes. You are too much concerned with past and future. It is all due to your longing to continue, to protect yourself against extinction. And as you want to continue, you want others to keep you company. Hence your concern with their survival. But what you call survival is but the survival of a dream. Death is preferable to it. There is a chance of waking up. Freedom from all desire is eternity. All attachment implies fear, for all things are transient, and fear makes one a slave. This freedom from attachment does not come with practice. It is natural. When one knows one's true being, Love does not cling. Clinging is not love. There is nothing to gain. Abandon all imaginings and know yourself as you are. Self-knowledge is detachment. All craving is due to a sense of insufficiency. When you know that you lack nothing, that all there is, is you and yours, desire ceases. There is nothing to practice to know yourself, be yourself. To be yourself, stop imagining yourself to be this or that. Just be. Let your true nature emerge. Don't disturb your mind with seeking.
What have you to wait for when it is already here and now? You have only to look and see. Look at yourself, at your own being. You know that you are and you like it. Abandon all imagining, that is all. Do not rely on time. Time is death. Who waits, dies. Life is now, only. Do not talk to me about past and future. They exist only in your mind. Where action is needed, action happens. Man is not the actor. His is to be aware of what is going on. His very presence is action. The window is the absence of the wall, and it gives air and light because it is empty. Be empty of all mental content, of all imagination and effort, and the very absence of obstacles will cause reality to rush in. If you really want to help a person, keep away. If you are emotionally committed to helping, you will fail to help. You may be very busy and be very pleased with your charitable nature, but not much will be done. A man is really helped when he is no longer in need of help. All else is just futility. By all means, do. But what you can do is limited. The self alone is unlimited. Give limitlessly of yourself. All else you can give in small measures only. You alone are immeasurable. To help is your very nature. Even when you eat and drink, you help your body. For yourself, you need nothing. You are pure giving, beginningless, endless, inexhaustible. When you see sorrow and suffering, be with it. Do not rush into activity. Neither learning nor action can really help. Be with sorrow and lay bare its roots. Helping to understand is real help. Your body is short of time, not you. Time and space are in the mind only. You are not bound. Just understand yourself, that itself is eternity. When an ordinary man dies, what happens to him? According to his belief, it happens. As life before death is but imagination, so is life after. The dream continues. And what about the Yanni? The Yanni does not die because he was never born. Until I met my guru, I knew so many things. Now I know nothing. 
for all knowledge is in dream only and not valid. I know myself and I find no life nor death in me, only pure being, not being this or that, but just being. As all waves are in the ocean, so are all things physical and mental in awareness. Hence, awareness itself is all important, not the content of it. Deepen and broaden your awareness of yourself and all the blessings will flow. You need not seek anything. All will come to you most naturally and effortlessly. The five senses and the four functions of the mind, memory, thought, understanding, and selfhood, the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. The two aspects of creation, matter and spirit. All are contained in awareness. Reincarnation implies a reincarnating self. There is no such thing. The bundle of memories and hopes, called the I, imagines itself existing everlastingly and creates time to accommodate its false eternity. To be, I need no past or future. All experience is born of imagination. I do not imagine. So no birth or death happens to me. Only those who think themselves born can think themselves reborn. You are accusing me of having been born. I plead not guilty. All exists in awareness. And awareness neither dies nor is reborn. It is the changeless reality itself. All the universe of experience is born with the body and dies with the body. It has its beginning and end in awareness. But awareness knows no beginning nor end. If you think it out carefully and brood over it for a long time, you will come to see the light of awareness in all its clarity and the world will fade out of your vision. It is like looking at a burning incense stick. You see the stick and the smoke first. When you notice the fiery point, you realize that it has the power to consume mountains of sticks and fill the universe with smoke.
awareness takes the place of consciousness. In consciousness there is the I who is conscious, while awareness is undivided. Awareness is aware of itself. The I am is a thought, while awareness is not a thought. There is no I am aware in awareness. Consciousness is an attribute, while awareness is not. One can be aware of being conscious, but not conscious of awareness. God is the totality of consciousness, but awareness is beyond all being as well as not being. There can be no transition from consciousness to awareness, for awareness is not a form of consciousness. Consciousness can only become more subtle and refined, and that is what happens after death. There is no such thing as unconsciousness, for unconsciousness is not experienceable. We live in one world, only I see it as it is, while you don't. You see yourself in the world, while I see the world in myself. To you, you get born and die, while to me, the world appears and disappears. Our world is real, but your view of it is not. There is no wall between us, except the one built by you. There is nothing wrong with the senses. It is your imagination that misleads you. It covers up the world as it is, with what you imagine it to be something existing independently of you, and yet closely following your inherited or acquired patterns. There is a deep contradiction in your attitude, which you do not see, and which is the cause of sorrow. You cling to the idea that you were born into a world of pain and sorrow. I know that the world is a child of love, having its beginning, growth, and fulfillment in love. But I am beyond love, even. You are the immensity and infinity of consciousness. With the enlightened man, the content of his consciousness undergoes a radical transformation but he is not misled, he knows the changeless. The paper 
is not the writing, yet it carries the writing. The ink is not the message, nor is the reader's mind the message, but they all make the message possible. There is only seeing. Both the seer and the seen are contained in it. Don't create differences where there are none. Before you were born, you expected to live according to a plan which you yourself had laid down. Your own will was the backbone of your destiny. I am like a cinema screen, clear and empty. The pictures pass over it and disappear, leaving it as clear and empty as before. In no way is the screen affected by the pictures, nor are the pictures affected by the screen. The screen intercepts and reflects the pictures. It does not shape them. It has nothing to do with the rolls of films. These are as they are, lumps of destiny. Paramda, but not my destiny, the destinies of the people on the screen. To myself, I am neither perceivable nor conceivable. There is nothing I can point out and say, this I am. You identify yourself with everything so easily. I find it impossible. The feeling I am not this or that, nor is anything mine, is so strong in me that as soon as a thing or a thought appears, there comes at once the sense, this I am not. I find that somehow, by shifting the focus of attention, I become the very thing I look at and experience the kind of consciousness it has. I become the inner witness of the thing. I call this capacity of entering other focal points of consciousness love. You may give it any name you like. Love says, I am everything. And wisdom says, I am nothing. Between the two, my life flows. Since at any point of time and space, I can be both the subject and the object of experience. I express it by saying that I am both and neither, and beyond both. What makes you say these things? You ask, and the answer comes. I watch myself. I watch the answer and see no contradiction. It is clear to me that I am telling you the truth. It is all very simple. 
Only you must trust me, that I mean what I say, that I am quite serious. As I told you already, my guru showed me my true nature, and the true nature of the world. Having realized that I am one with, and yet beyond the world, I became free from all desire and fear. I did not reason out that I should be free. I found myself free, unexpectedly, without the least effort. This freedom from desire and fear has remained with me since then. Another thing I noticed was that I do not need to make an effort. The deed follows the thought, without delay and friction. I have also found that thoughts become self-fulfilling. Things would fall in place smoothly and rightly. The main change was in the mind. It became motionless and silent, responding quickly, but not perpetuating the response. Spontaneity became a way of life. The real became natural, and the natural became real. And above all, infinite affection, love, dark and quiet, radiating in all directions, embracing all, making all interesting and beautiful, significant and auspicious. Man's fivefold body has potential powers beyond our wildest dreams. Not only is the entire universe reflected in man, but also the power to control the universe is waiting to be used by him. The wise man is not anxious to use such powers, except when the situation calls for them. He finds the abilities and skills of the human personality quite adequate for the business of daily living. Some of the powers can be developed by specialized training, but the man who flaunts such powers is still in bondage. The wise man counts nothing as his own. Pain is physical. Suffering is mental. Beyond the mind, there is no suffering. Pain is merely a signal that the body is in danger and requires attention. Similarly, suffering warns us that the structure of memories and habits, which we call the person, is threatened by loss or change. Pain is essential for the survival of the body, but none compels you to suffer. Suffering is due entirely to clinging or resisting. It is a sign of our unwillingness to move on, to flow with life. As a sane life is free of pain, so is a saintly life free from suffering. The urge to find oneself is a sign that you are getting ready. The impulse always comes from within. 
unless your time has come, you will have neither the desire nor the strength to go for self-inquiry wholeheartedly. How do I find a guru whom I can trust? Your own heart will tell you. There is no difficulty in finding a guru, because the guru is in search of you. The guru is always ready. You are not ready. You have to be ready to learn, or you may meet your guru and waste your chance by sheer inattentiveness and obstinacy. Take my example. There was nothing in me of much promise. But when I met my guru, I listened, trusted, and obeyed. The only way you can judge is by the change in yourself when you are in his company. If you feel more at peace and happy, if you understand yourself with more than usual clarity and depth, it means you have met the right person. Take your time, but once you have made up your mind to trust him, trust him absolutely and follow every instruction fully and faithfully. It does not matter much if you do not accept him as your guru and are satisfied with his company only. Satsang alone can also take you to your goal, provided it is unmixed and undisturbed. But once you accept somebody as your guru, listen, remember, obey. What is the motive? Why does the guru take so much trouble? Sorrow and the ending of sorrow. He sees people suffering in their dreams, and he wants them to wake up. Love is intolerant of pain and suffering. The patience of a guru has no limits, and therefore it cannot be defeated. The guru never fails. The entire universe is your guru. You learn from everything if you are alert and intelligent. Were your mind clear and your heart clean, you would learn from every passerby. It is because you are indolent or restless that your inner self manifests as the outer guru and makes you trust him and obey. Is a guru inevitable? It is like asking, is a mother inevitable? To rise in consciousness from one dimension to another, you need help. The help may not always be in the shape of a human person. It may be a subtle presence or a spark of intuition, but help must come. The inner self is watching and waiting for the son to return to his father. At the right time, he arranges everything affectionately and effectively. 
Where a messenger is needed or a guide, he sends the guru to do the needful. You have brought in duality where there is none. There is the body and there is the self. Between them is the mind in which the self is reflected as I am. Because of the imperfections of the mind, its crudity and restlessness, lack of discernment and insight, it takes itself to be the body, not the self. All that is needed is to purify the mind so that it can realize its identity with the self. When the mind merges in the self, the body presents no problems. It remains what it is, an instrument of cognition and action, the tool and the expression of the creative fire within. The ultimate value of the body is that it serves to discover the cosmic body, which is the universe in its entirety. As you realize yourself in manifestation, you keep on discovering that you are ever more than what you have imagined. Is there no end to self-discovery? As there is no beginning, there is no end. But what I have discovered by the grace of my Guru is, I am nothing that can be pointed at. I am neither a this nor a that. This holds absolutely. What is lower and what is higher? Look at it in terms of awareness. Wider and deeper consciousness is higher. All that lives works for protecting, perpetuating, and expanding consciousness. This is the world's sole meaning and purpose. It is the very essence of yoga ever raising the level of consciousness, discovery of new dimensions with their properties, qualities, and powers. In that sense, the entire universe becomes a school of yoga. Is perfection the destiny of all human beings, of all living beings, ultimately. Once a living being has heard and understood that deliverance is within his reach, he will never forget, for it is the first message from within. It will take root and grow, and in due course take the blessed shape of the Guru. The mind goes astray, the mind returns home. Even the word astray is not proper. The mind must know itself in every mood. Nothing is a mistake unless repeated. Keep the I am in the focus of awareness. Remember that you are. Watch yourself ceaselessly and the unconscious will flow into the conscious without any special effort on your part. There are no steps 
to self-realization. Pain is not acceptable. Why not? Did you ever try? Do try, and you will find in pain a joy which pleasure cannot yield. For the simple reason that acceptance of pain takes you much deeper than pleasure does. The personal self, by its very nature, is constantly pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. The ending of this pattern is the ending of the self. The ending of the self with its desires and fears enables you to return to your real nature, the source of all happiness and peace. The perennial desire for pleasure is the reflection of the timeless harmony within. It is an observable fact that one becomes self-conscious only when caught in the conflict between pleasure and pain, which demands choice and decision. It is this clash between desire and fear that causes anger, which is the great destroyer of sanity in life. When pain is accepted for what it is, a lesson and a warning, and deeply looked into and heeded, the separation between pain and pleasure breaks down. Both become experience, painful when resisted, joyful when accepted. Accept both as they come. Enjoy both while they last. Let them go as they must. The bliss is in the awareness of it, in not shrinking or in any way turning away from it. All happiness comes from awareness. The more we are conscious, the deeper the joy. Acceptance of pain, non-resistance, courage, and endurance. These open deep and perennial sources of real happiness, true bliss. This is the great work of awareness. It removes obstacles and releases energies by understanding the nature of life and mind. Intelligence is the door to freedom, and alert attention is the mother of intelligence. Everything has a beginning and an end, and so does pleasure. Don't anticipate and don't regret, and there will be no pain. It is memory and imagination that cause suffering. Of course, pain after pleasure may be due to the misuse of the body or the mind. The body knows its measure but the mind does not. Its appetites are numberless and limitless. Watch your mind with great diligence, for there lies your bondage and also the key to freedom. When the mind takes over, remembers and anticipates, it exaggerates, it distorts, it overlooks. The past is projected into the future, and the future betrays the expectations. 
the organs of sensation and action are stimulated beyond capacity, and they inevitably break down. The objects of pleasure cannot yield what is expected of them, and get worn out or destroyed by misuse. It results in excess of pain where pleasure was looked for. Naturally, selfishness is always destructive. Desire and fear both are self-centered states. Between desire and fear, anger arises. With anger, hatred. With hatred, passion for destruction. War is hatred in action, organized and equipped with all the instruments of death. Is there a way to end these horrors? When more people come to know their real nature, their influence, however subtle, will prevail and the world's emotional atmosphere will sweeten up. People follow their leaders and when among the leaders appear some great in heart and mind and absolutely free from self-seeking, their impact will be enough to make the crudities and crimes of the present age impossible. A new golden age may come and last for a time and succumb to its own perfection for ebb begins when the tide is at its highest. Which world do you have in mind? Our common world in which we live. Are you sure we live in the same world? I do not mean nature, the sea and the land, plants and animals. They are not the problem. Nor the endless space, the infinite time, the inexhaustible power. Do not be misled by my eating and smoking, reading and talking. My mind is not here. My life is not here. Your world of desires and their fulfillment of fears and their escapes is definitely not my world. I do not even perceive it except through what you tell me about it. It is your private dream world, and my only reaction to it is to ask you to stop dreaming. Of course, facts are real. I live among them. But you live with fancies, not with facts. Facts never clash. While your life and world are full of contradictions. Contradiction is the mark of the false. The real never contradicts itself. For instance, you complain that people are abjectly poor, yet you do not share your riches with them. You mind the war next door, but you hardly give it a thought when it is in some far-off country. The shifting fortunes of your ego determine your values. I think. I want. I must, are made into absolutes.
Insanity is universal. Sanity is rare. Yet there is hope. Because the moment we perceive our insanity, we are on the way to sanity. This is the function of the Guru, to make us see the madness of our daily living. Life makes you conscious, but the teacher makes you aware. Man is stupid, selfish, and cruel. Man is also wise, affectionate, and kind. Why does not goodness prevail? It does, in my real world. In my world, even what you call evil is the servant of the good and therefore necessary. It is like boils and fevers that clear the body of impurities. Disease is painful, even dangerous, but if dealt with rightly, it heals or kills. In some cases, death is the best cure. A life may be worse than death, which is but rarely an unpleasant experience, whatever the appearances. Therefore, pity the living, never the dead. This problem of things, good and evil in themselves, does not exist in my world. The needful is good, and the needless is evil. In your world, the pleasant is good, and the painful is evil. What is necessary? To grow is necessary. To outgrow is necessary. To leave behind the good for the sake of the better is necessary. To what end? The end is in the beginning. You end where you start. In the Absolute. Why all this trouble then, to come back to where I started? Whose trouble? Which trouble? Do you pity the seed? that is to grow and multiply till it becomes a mighty forest? Do you kill an infant to save him from the bother of living? What is wrong with life, ever more life? Remove the obstacles to growing and all your personal, social, economic, and political problems will just dissolve. The universe is perfect as a whole, and the parts striving for perfection is a way of joy. Willingly sacrifice the imperfect to the perfect, and there will be no more talk about good and evil. Yet we are afraid of the better and cling to the worse. This is our stupidity, verging on insanity. A yani may meet with difficulties but they do not make him suffer. Bringing up a child from birth to maturity may seem a hard task, 
but to a mother, the memories of hardships are a joy. There is nothing wrong with the world. What is wrong is the way you look at it. It is your own imagination that misleads you. Without imagination, there is no world. You are the space, Akash, in which it moves, the time in which it lasts, the love that gives it life. Cut off imagination and attachment, and what remains? In my world, Love is the only law. I do not ask for love. I give it. Such is my nature. Some repetitive routine is inevitable. Even animals and plants have their timetables. Everything moves according to its nature. Where is the need of a policeman? Every action creates a reaction, which balances and neutralizes the action. Everything happens, but there is a continuous canceling out. And in the end, it is as if nothing happened. Explanations are meant to please the mind. They need not be true. Reality is indefinable and indescribable. The objective universe has structure, is orderly and beautiful. Nobody can deny it. But structure and pattern imply constraint and compulsion. My world is absolutely free. Everything in it is self-determined. Therefore, I keep on saying that all happens by itself. There is order in my world too, but it is not imposed from outside. It comes spontaneously and immediately because of its timelessness. Perfection is not in the future. It is now. There is nothing wrong with your world. It is your thinking yourself to be separate from it that creates disorder. The moment you allow your imagination to spin, it at once spins out a universe. There is only imagination. The intelligence and power are all used up in your imagination. It has absorbed you so completely that you just cannot grasp how far from reality you have wandered. No doubt, imagination is richly creative. Universe within universe are built on it. Yet, they are all in space and time, past and future, 
which just do not exist. If you are in the right state, whatever you see will put you into samadhi. After all, samadhi is nothing unusual. When the mind is intensely interested, it becomes one with the object of interest. The seer and the seen become one in seeing. The hearer and the heard become one in hearing. The lover and the loved become one in loving. Every experience can be the ground for samadhi. Are you always in a state of samadhi? Of course not. Samadhi is a state of mind, after all. I am beyond all experience, even of Samadhi. I am the great devourer and destroyer. Whatever I touch dissolves into void. I need samadhis for self-realization. You have all the self-realization you need, but you do not trust it. Have courage. Trust yourself. Go. Talk. Act. Give it a chance to prove itself. With some, realization comes imperceptibly but somehow they need convincing. They have changed, but they do not notice it. Such non-spectacular eases are often the most reliable. Can one believe himself to be realized and be mistaken? Of course. The very idea, I am self-realized, is a mistake. There is no I am this, I am that in the natural state. If you are earnest, you will find that in the end you will get fed up with roaming and regret the waste of energy and time. To find yourself you need not take a single step. Do not rush into activity. Neither learning nor action can really help. It is not what you do, but what you stop doing that matters. Do nothing. Just be. In being, all happens naturally. The present I am is as false as the I was and I shall be. It is merely an idea in the mind, an impression left by memory, and the separate identity it creates is false. This habit of referring to a false center must be done away with. The notion I see, I feel, I think, I do, must disappear from the field of consciousness. What remains when the false is no more is real. You need not chase the I am to kill it. You cannot. All you need 
is a sincere longing for reality. We call it Atma Bhakti, the love of the Supreme, or Moksha Sankalpa, the determination to be free from the false. Without love and will inspired by love, nothing can be done. Merely talking about reality without doing anything about it is self-defeating. There must be love in the relation between the person who says I am and the observer of that I am. As long as the observer, the inner self, the higher self, considers himself apart from the observed, the lower self despises it and condemns it. The situation is hopeless. It is only when the observer accepts the person as a projection or manifestation of himself and takes the self into the self, so to say the duality of I and this goes and in the identity of the outer and the inner, the supreme reality manifests itself. Affectionate awareness is the crucial factor that brings reality into focus. How can there be two selves in one body? The I am is one. There is no higher I am and lower I am. All kinds of states of mind are presented to awareness and there is self-identification with them. One may be conscious, for every being is conscious, but one is not aware. What is included in awareness becomes the inner and partakes of the inner. You may put it differently. The body defines the outer self, consciousness the inner, and in pure awareness the Supreme is contacted. There is no I apart from the body, nor the world. The three appear and disappear together. At the root is the sense I am. Go beyond it. The idea, I am not body, is merely an antidote to the idea, I am the body, which is false. What is that I am? Unless you know yourself, what else can you know? Find out the I am common to both and go beyond. Go beyond your concepts and ideas. In the silence, free of desire and thought, the truth is found. Again, earnestness is the golden key. The void speaks, the void remains. Reality is one for both of us, but for you, 
it is a prison, and for me, it is a home. In the Supreme, the witness appears. The witness creates the person and thinks itself as separate from it. The witness sees that the person appears in consciousness, which again appears in the witness. This realization of the basic unit is the working of the Supreme. It is the power behind the witness, the source from which all flows. It cannot be contacted unless there is unity and love and mutual help between the person and the witness. Unless the doing is in harmony with the being and the knowing. The Supreme is both the source and the fruit of such harmony. As I talk to you, I am in the state of detached but affectionate awareness, Turiya. When this awareness turns upon itself, you may call it the Supreme State. But the fundamental reality is beyond awareness, beyond the three states of becoming, being, and not being. It is your childishness you are returning to. You are not fully grown up. There are levels left undeveloped because unattended. Just give full attention to what in you is crude and primitive, unreasonable and unkind, altogether childish, and you will ripen. It is the maturity of heart and mind that is essential. It comes effortlessly when the main obstacle is removed, inattention, unawareness. In awareness, you grow. There is only life. There is nobody who lives a life. Life itself is desireless, but the false self wants to continue pleasantly. Therefore, it is always engaged in ensuring one's continuity. Life is unafraid and free. As long as you have the idea of influencing events, liberation is not for you. The very notion of doership, of being a cause, is bondage. Contemplate life as infinite, undivided, ever-present, ever-active, until you realize yourself as one with it. It is not even very difficult, for you will be returning only to your own natural condition. Once you realize that all comes from within, that the world in which you live has not been projected onto you, but by you, your fear comes to an end. Without this realization, you identify yourself with the externals, like the body, mind, society, nation, and humanity, even God or the Absolute. But these are all escapes from fear. 
It is only when you fully accept your responsibility for the little world in which you live and watch the process of its creation, preservation, and destruction that you may be free from your imaginary bondage. Why should I imagine myself so wretched? You do it by habit only. Change your ways of feeling and thinking. Take stock of them and examine them closely. You are in bondage by inadvertence. Attention liberates. You are taking so many things for granted begin to question. The most obvious things are the most doubtful. Ask yourself such questions as, Was I really born? Am I really so and so? How do I know that I exist? Who are my parents? Have they created me or have I created them? Must I believe all I am told about myself? Who am I anyhow? You have put so much energy into building a prison for yourself. Now, spend as much on demolishing it. In fact, demolition is easy, for the false dissolves when it is discovered. All hangs on the idea, I am. Examine it very thoroughly. It lies at the root of every trouble. It is a sort of skin that separates you from the reality. The real is both within and without the skin. But the skin itself is not real. This I am idea was not born with you. You could have lived very well without it. It came later, due to your self-identification with the body. It created an illusion of separation where there was none. It made you a stranger in your own world and made the world alien and inimical. Without the sense of I am, life goes on. There are moments when we are without the sense of I am, at peace and happy. With the return of the I am, trouble starts. You must deal with the I sense if you want to be free of it. Watch it in operation and at peace, how it starts and when it ceases, what it wants and how it gets it, till you see clearly and understand fully. After all, all the yogas, whatever their source and character, have only one aim to save you from the calamity of separate existence, of being a meaningless dot in a vast and beautiful picture. You suffer because you have alienated yourself from reality, and now you seek an escape from this alienation. You cannot escape from your own obsessions you can only cease nursing them. 
it is because the I am is false that it wants to continue. Reality need not continue. Knowing itself indestructible, it is indifferent to the destruction of forms and expressions. To strengthen and stabilize the I am, we do all sorts of things, all in vain. For the I am is being rebuilt from moment to moment. It is unceasing work, and the only radical solution is to dissolve the separative sense of I am such and such a person, once and for good. Being remains, but not self-being. No ambition is spiritual. All ambitions are for the sake of the I am. If you want to make real progress, you must give up all idea of personal attainment. The ambitions of the so-called yogis are preposterous. A man's desire for a woman is innocence itself compared to the lusting for an everlasting personal bliss. The mind is a cheat. The more pious it seems, the worse the betrayal. If your awareness is clear and full, a mistake is less probable. Go beyond the I am the body idea, and you will find that space and time are in you and not you in space and time. Once you have understood this, the main obstacle to realization is removed. To know that you are neither in the body nor in the mind, though aware of both, is already self-knowledge. All effort leads to more effort. Whatever was built up must be maintained. Whatever was acquired must be protected against decay or loss. Whatever can be lost is not really one's own. And what is not your own, of what use can it be to you? In my world, nothing is pushed about. All happens by itself. All experience is in space and time, limited and temporary. He who experiences existence is also limited and temporary. I am not concerned either with what exists or with who exists. I take my stand beyond, where I am both and neither. Just as the shape of a gold ornament does not affect the gold, so does man's essence remain unaffected. Mere knowledge is not enough. The knower must be known. Without the knowledge of the knower, there can be no peace. How does one come to know the knower? 
I can only tell you what I know from my own experience. When I met my guru, he told me, You are not what you take yourself to be. Find out what you are. Watch the sense, I am. Find your real self. I obeyed him. Because I trusted him, I did as he told me. All my spare time I would spend looking at myself in silence. And what a difference it made, and how soon. It took me only three years to realize my true nature. My guru died soon after I met him, but it made no difference. I remembered what he told me and persevered. The fruit of it is here with me. I know myself as I am in reality. I am neither the body, nor the mind, nor the mental faculties. I am beyond all these. Are you just nothing? Come on, be reasonable. Of course I am, most tangibly. Only I am not what you may think me to be. This tells you all. It tells me nothing, because it cannot be told. You must gain your own experience. You are accustomed to dealing with things, physical and mental. I am not a thing, nor are you. We are neither matter nor energy, neither body nor mind. Once you have a glimpse of your own being, you will not find me difficult to understand. We believe in so many things on hearsay. We believe in distant lands and people, in heavens and hells, in gods and goddesses, because we were told. Similarly, we were told about ourselves, our parents, name, position, duties, and so on. We never cared to verify. The way to truth lies through the destruction of the false. To destroy the false, you must question your most inveterate beliefs. Of these, the idea that you are the body is the worst. With the body comes the world. With the world, God, who is supposed to have created the world, and thus it starts. Fears, religions, prayers, sacrifices, all sorts of systems, all to protect and support the child man, frightened out of his wits by monsters of his own making. Realize that what you are cannot be born nor die, and with the fear gone, all suffering ends. What the mind invents, the mind destroys, but the real is not invented and cannot be destroyed. The witness attitude is also faith. It is faith in oneself. 
you believe that you are not what you experience, and you look at everything as from a distance. There is no effort in witnessing. You understand that you are the witness only, and the understanding acts. You need nothing more. Just remember that you are the witness only. If in the state of witnessing you ask yourself, who am I? The answer comes at once, though it is wordless and silent. Cease to be the object and become the subject of all that happens. Once having turned within, you will find yourself beyond the object. When you have found yourself, you will find that you are also beyond the subject, that both the subject and the object exist in you, but you are neither. As long as you deal in terms, real, unreal, awareness is the only reality that can be. But the Supreme is beyond all distinctions, and to it the term real does not apply, for in it all is real, and therefore need not be labeled as such. It is the very source of reality. It imparts reality to whatever it touches. It just cannot be understood through words. Even a direct experience, however sublime, merely bears testimony, nothing more. The universal mind, Chitakash, makes and unmakes everything. The supreme, Paramakash, imparts reality to whatever comes into being. To say that it is the universal love may be the nearest we can come to it in words. Just like love. It makes everything real, beautiful, desirable. Why desirable? Why not? Where from come all the powerful attractions that make all created things respond to each other, that bring people together if not from the Supreme? Shun not desire, see only that it flows into the right channels. Without desire, you are dead, but with low desires, you are a ghost. What is the experience which comes nearest to the Supreme? Immense peace and boundless love. Realize that whatever there is true, noble and beautiful in the universe, it all comes from you, that you yourself are at the source of it. The gods and goddesses that supervise the world may be most wonderful and glorious beings, yet they are like the gorgeously dressed servants who proclaim the power and the riches of their master.
How does one reach the supreme state? By renouncing all lesser desires. As long as you are pleased with the lesser, you cannot have the highest. Whatever pleases you keeps you back until you realize the unsatisfactoriness of everything, its transiency and limitation, and collect your energies in one great longing, even the first step is not made. On the other hand, the integrity of the desire for the Supreme is by itself a call from the Supreme. Nothing, physical or mental, can give you freedom. You are free once you understand that your bondage is of your own making, and you cease forging the chains that bind you. Krishnamurti says that a guru is not needed. Somebody must tell you about the supreme reality and the way that leads to it. Krishnamurti is doing nothing else. To find a living guru is a rare opportunity and a great responsibility. One should not treat these matters lightly. You people are out to buy yourself heaven and you imagine that the guru will supply it for a price. You seek to strike a bargain by offering little but asking much. You cheat nobody except yourselves. Just sitting near you, can it be considered spiritual practice? Of course. The river of life is flowing. Some of its water is here, but so much of it has already reached its goal. You know only the present. I see much further into the past and future, into what you are and what you can be. I cannot but see you as myself. It is in the very nature of love to see no difference. How can I come to see myself as you see me? It is enough if you do not imagine yourself to be the body. It is the I am the body idea that is so calamitous. It blinds you completely to your real nature. Even for a moment, do not think that you are the body. Give yourself no name, no shape. In the darkness and the silence, reality is found. It is enough to know that there is suffering, that the world suffers. By themselves, neither pleasure nor pain enlighten. Only understanding does. Once you have grasped the truth that the world is full of suffering, that to be born is a calamity, you will find the urge and the energy to go beyond it. Pleasure puts you to sleep, and pain wakes you up. If you do not want to suffer, don't go to sleep. You cannot know yourself through bliss alone, for bliss is your very nature. You must face the opposite, what you are not, to find enlightenment.
Does not the knower know itself? The mind is discontinuous. Again and again it blanks out, like in sleep or swoon or distraction. There must be something continuous to register discontinuity. Memory is always partial, unreliable, and evanescent. It does not explain the strong sense of identity pervading consciousness, the sense I am. Find out what is at the root of it. While looking with the mind, you cannot go beyond it. To go beyond, you must look away from the mind and its contents. In what direction am I to look? All directions are within the mind. I am not asking you to look in any particular direction. Just look away from all that happens in your mind and bring it to the feeling, I am. The I am is not a direction. It is the negation of all direction. Ultimately, even the I am will have to go, for you need not keep on asserting what is obvious. Bringing the mind to the feeling I am merely helps in turning the mind away from everything else. Where does it all lead me? When the mind is kept away from its preoccupations, it becomes quiet. If you do not disturb this quiet and stay in it, you find that it is permeated with a light and a love you have never known. And yet, you recognize it at once as your own nature. Once you have passed through this experience, you will never be the same man again. The unruly mind may break its peace and obliterate its vision, but it is bound to return, provided the effort is sustained. Until the day when all bonds are broken, delusions and attachments end, and life becomes supremely concentrated in the present. What difference does it make? The mind is no more. There is only love in action. How shall I recognize this state when I reach it? There will be no fear. Surrounded by a world full of mysteries and dangers, how can I remain unafraid? Your own little body, too, is full of mysteries and dangers. Yet you are not afraid of it, for you take it as your own. What you do not know is that the entire universe is your body. And you need not be afraid of it. You may say you have two bodies, the personal 
and the universal. The personal comes and goes. The universal is always with you. Entire creation is your universal body. You are so blinded by what is personal that you do not see the universal. This blindness will not end by itself. It must be undone skillfully and deliberately. When all illusions are understood and abandoned, you reach the error-free and perfect state in which all distinctions between the personal and the universal are no more. Knowing yourself as the dweller in both the bodies, you will disown nothing. The entire universe will be your concern. Every living thing you will love and help most tenderly and wisely. There will be no clash of interests between you and others. All exploitation will cease absolutely. Your every action will be beneficial. Every movement will be a blessing. It is all very tempting, but how am I to proceed to realize my universal being? You have two ways. You can give your heart and mind to self-discovery, or you accept my words on trust and act accordingly. In other words, either you become totally self-concerned or totally unself-concerned. It is the word totally that is important. You must be extreme to reach the supreme. Realize yourself as the ocean of consciousness in which all happens. This is not difficult. A little of attentiveness, of close observation of oneself, and you will see that no event is outside your consciousness. Where is the need of changing anything? The mind is changing anyhow all the time. Look at your mind dispassionately. That is enough to calm it. When it is quiet, you can go beyond it. Do not keep it busy all the time. Stop it and just be. If you give it rest, it will settle down and recover its purity and strength. Constant thinking makes it decay. If my true being is always with me, how is it that I am ignorant of it? Because it is very subtle and your mind is gross full of gross thoughts and feelings. Calm and clarify your mind, and you will know yourself as you are. Do I need the mind to know myself? You are beyond the mind, but you know with your mind. It is obvious that the extent depth and character of knowledge depend on what instrument you use. Improve your instrument and your knowledge will improve. To know perfectly I need a perfect mind. A quiet mind is all you need.
all else will happen rightly once your mind is quiet. Do understand that you are destined for enlightenment. Cooperate with your destiny. Don't go against it and don't thwart it. Allow it to fulfill itself. All you have to do is to give attention to the obstacles created by the foolish mind. What you take to be the I and the I am is not you. To know that you are is natural. To know what you are is the result of much investigation. You will have to ignore the entire field of consciousness and go beyond it. For this, you must find the right teacher and create the conditions needed for discovery. Generally speaking, there are two ways, external and internal. Either you live with somebody who knows the truth and submit yourself entirely to his guiding and molding influence, or you seek the inner guide and follow the inner light wherever it takes you. In both cases, your personal desires and fears must be disregarded. You learn either by proximity or by investigation, the passive or the active way. You either let yourself be carried by the river of life and love represented by your guru, or you make your own efforts, guided by your inner star. In both cases, you must move on. You must be earnest. Rare are the people who are lucky to find somebody worthy of trust and love. Most of them must take the hard way, the way of intelligence and understanding, of discrimination and detachment. This is the way open to all. Once you say, I want to find truth, all your life will be deeply affected by it. All your mental and physical habits, feelings and emotions, desires and fears, plans and decisions will undergo a most radical transformation. Do I need experience? You already have all the experience you need. Otherwise, you would not have come here. You need not gather any more. Rather, you must go beyond experience. Whatever effort you make, whatever method, sadhana, you follow, will merely generate more experience, but will not take you beyond, nor will reading books help you. They will enrich your mind, but the person you are will remain intact. If you expect any benefits from your search, material, mental or spiritual, you have missed the point. Truth gives no advantage. It gives you no higher status, no power over others. All you get is truth. 
and the freedom from the false. Surely truth gives you the power to help others. This is mere imagination, however noble. In truth, you do not help others because there are no others. You divide people into noble and ignoble, and you ask the noble to help the ignoble. You separate, you evaluate, you judge and condemn. In the name of truth, you destroy it. Your very desire to formulate truth denies it because it cannot be contained in words. Truth can be expressed only by the denial of the false in action. For this, you must see the false as false and reject it. Renunciation of the false is liberating and energizing. It lays open the road to perfection. The false is limited in time and space and is produced by circumstances. Whatever is conceived by the mind must be false, for it is bound to be relative and limited. The real is inconceivable and cannot be harnessed to a purpose. It must be wanted for its own sake. Self-interest and self-concern are the focal points of the false. Your daily life vibrates between desire and fear. Watch it intently and you will see how the mind assumes innumerable names and shapes, like a river foaming between boulders. Trace every action to its selfish motive and look at the motive intently till it dissolves. Discard every self-seeking motive as soon as it is seen and you need not search for truth. Truth will find you. One must survive. You can't help surviving. The real you is timeless and beyond birth and death. And the body will survive as long as it is needed. It is not important that it should live long. A full life is better than a long life. If you seek reality, you must set yourself free of all backgrounds, of all cultures, of all patterns of thinking and feeling. Even the idea of being man or woman or even human should be discarded. The ocean of life contains all, not only humans. So, first of all, Abandon all self-identification. Stop thinking of yourself as such and such, so and so, this or that. Abandon all self-concern. Worry not about your welfare, material or spiritual. Abandon every desire, gross or subtle. Stop thinking of achievement of any kind. You are complete here 
And now you need absolutely nothing. It does not mean that you must be brainless and foolhardy, improvident or indifferent. Only the basic anxiety for oneself must go. That which makes you think you are a human is not human. It is but a dimensionless point of consciousness, a conscious nothing. All you can say about yourself is I am. You are pure being, awareness, bliss. To realize that is the end of all seeking. You come to it when you see all you think yourself to be as mere imagination and stand aloof in pure awareness of the transient as transient, imaginary as imaginary, unreal as unreal. It is not at all difficult, but detachment is needed. It is the clinging to the false that makes the true so difficult to see. Once you understand that the false needs time and what needs time is false, you are near the reality, which is timeless, ever in the now. Eternity in time is mere repetitiveness, like the movement of a clock. It flows from the past into the future endlessly, an empty perpetuity. Reality is what makes the present so vital, so different from the past and future, which are merely mental. If you need time to achieve something, it must be false. The real is always with you. You need not wait to be what you are. Only you must not allow your mind to go out of yourself in search. When you want something, ask yourself, do I really need it? And if the answer is no, then just drop it. Nothing can make you happier than you are. All search for happiness is misery and leads to more misery. The only happiness worth the name is the natural happiness of conscious being. Experience leaves only memories behind and adds to the burden which is heavy enough. You need no more experiences. The past ones are sufficient. And if you feel you need more, look into the hearts of people around you. You will find a variety of experiences which you would not be able to go through in a thousand years. Learn from the sorrows of others and save yourself your own. It is not experience that you need, but the freedom from all experience. Don't be greedy for experience. You need none. To deal with yourself, you need nothing. Be what you are, conscious being, and don't stray away from yourself. You 
You are not even a human being. You just are a point of awareness. Coextensive with time and space and beyond both. The ultimate cause itself uncaused. If you ask me, who are you? My answer would be nothing in particular. Yet, I am. Every existence is my existence. Every consciousness is my consciousness. Every sorrow is my sorrow, and every joy is my joy. This is universal life. Yet, my real being, and yours too, is beyond the universe, and therefore beyond the categories of the particular and the universal. It is what it is, totally self-contained and independent. You must give yourself time to brood over these things. The old grooves must be erased in your brain without forming new ones. You must realize yourself as the immovable behind and beyond the movable, the silent witness of all that happens. Destiny must fulfill itself. You will go through it without resistance facing tasks as they come, attentive and thorough, both in small things and big. But the general attitude will be of affectionate detachment, enormous goodwill without expectation of return, constant giving without asking. In marriage, you are neither the husband nor the wife. You are the love between the two. You are the clarity and kindness that makes everything orderly and happy. It may seem vague to you, but if you think a little, you will find that the mystical is most practical for it makes your life creatively happy. Your consciousness is raised to a higher dimension from which you see everything much clearer and with greater intensity. You realize that the person you became at birth and will cease to be at death is temporary and false. You are not the sensual, emotional, and intellectual person, gripped by desires and fears. Find out your real being. What am I is the fundamental question of all philosophy and psychology. Go into it deeply. All that lives works for protecting, perpetuating, and expanding consciousness. This is the world's sole meaning and purpose. It is the very essence of yoga, ever raising the level of consciousness 
discovery of new dimensions with their properties, qualities, and powers. The seeker is he who is in search of himself. Soon he discovers that his own body he cannot be. Once the conviction, I am not the body, becomes so well grounded that he can no longer feel, think, and act for and on behalf of the body, he will easily discover that he is the universal being, knowing, acting, that in him and through him the entire universe is real, conscious, and active. This is the heart of the problem. Either you are body conscious and a slave of circumstances, or you are the universal consciousness itself and in full control of every event. Yet, consciousness, individual or universal, is not my true abode. I am not in it. It is not mine. There is no me in it. I am beyond. Though it is not easy to explain how one can be neither conscious nor unconscious, but just beyond. I cannot say that I am in God or I am God. God is the universal light and love, the universal witness. I am beyond the universal even. I am what I am, neither with form nor formless, neither conscious nor unconscious. I am outside all these categories. You cannot find me by mere denial. I am as well everything as nothing, nor both nor either. These definitions apply to the Lord of the universe, not to me. I am complete and perfect. I am the beingness of being, the knowingness of knowing, and the fullness of happiness. You cannot reduce me to emptiness. I am offering you exactly what you need, awakening. You are not hungry, and you need no bread. You need cessation, relinquishing, disentanglement. What you believe you need is not what you need. Your real need, I know, not you. You need to return to the state in which I am, your natural state. Anything else you may think of is an illusion and an obstacle. Believe me, you need nothing except to be what you are. You imagine you will increase your value by acquisition. It is like gold imagining that an addition of copper will improve it. Elimination and purification, renunciation of all that is foreign to your nature is enough. All else is vanity. It is the mind that tells you that the mind is there. Don't be deceived. All the endless arguments about the mind are produced by the mind itself for its own protection 
continuation and expansion. Listen to what I keep on telling you and do not move away from it. Think of it all the time and of nothing else. Having reached that far, abandon all thoughts, not only of the world, but of yourself also. Stay beyond all thoughts in silent being awareness. It is not progress, for what you come to is already there in you, waiting for you. Experience, however sublime, is not the real thing. By its very nature, it comes and goes. Self-realization is not an acquisition. It is more in the nature of understanding. Once arrived at, it cannot be lost. On the other hand, consciousness is changeful, flowing, undergoing transformation from moment to moment. Do not hold on to consciousness and its contents. Consciousness held ceases. To try to perpetuate a flash of insight or a burst of happiness is destructive of what it wants to preserve. What comes must go. The permanent is beyond all comings and goings. Go to the root of all experience, to the sense of being. Beyond being and not being lies the immensity of the real. Try and try again. Tirelessly, I draw their attention to the one incontrovertible fact, that of being. Being needs no proofs. It proves all else. If only they go deeply into the fact of being and discover the vastness and the glory to which the I am is the door and cross the door and go beyond their life will be full of happiness and light. Believe me, the effort needed is as nothing when compared with the discoveries arrived at. There is such a way, open to all, on every level, in every walk of life. Everybody is aware of himself. The deepening and broadening of self-awareness is the royal way. Call it mindfulness, or witnessing, or just attention. It is for all. None is unripe for it and none can fail. No doubt, striving for the improvement of the world is a most praiseworthy occupation. Done selflessly, it clarifies the mind and purifies the heart. But soon man will realize that he pursues a mirage. Local and temporary improvement is always possible and was achieved again and again 
under the influence of a great king or teacher. But it would soon come to an end, leaving humanity in a new cycle of misery. It is the nature of all manifestation that the good and the bad follow each other and in equal measure. The true refuge is only in the unmanifested. Are you not advising escape? On the contrary, the only way to renewal lies through destruction. You must melt down the old jewelry into formless gold before you can mold a new piece. Only the people who have gone beyond the world can change the world. It never happened otherwise. The few whose impact was long-lasting were all knowers of reality. Reach their level and then only talk of helping the world. It is not the rivers and mountains that we want to help, but the people. There is nothing wrong with the world, but for the people who make it bad. Go and ask them to behave. Desire and fear make them behave as they do. Exactly. As long as human behavior is dominated by desire and fear, there is not much hope. And to know how to approach people effectively, you must yourself be free of all desire and fear. Certain basic desires and fears are inevitable, such as are connected with food, sex, and death. These are needs, and, as needs, they are easy to meet. Even death is a need. Having lived a long and fruitful life, you feel the need to die. Only when wrongly applied, desire and fear are destructive. By all means, desire the right and fear the wrong. But when people desire what is wrong and fear what is right, they create chaos and despair. What is right and what is wrong? Relatively, what causes suffering is wrong. What alleviates it is right. Absolutely, what brings you back to reality is right, and what dims reality is wrong. When we talk of helping humanity, we mean a struggle against disorder and suffering. You merely talk of helping. Have you ever helped, really helped a single man? Have you ever put one soul beyond the need of further help? Can you give a man character based on full realization of his duties and opportunities at least, if not on the insight into his true being? When you do not know what is good for yourself, how can you know what is good for others? It is you that need my body to talk to you. I am not my body, nor do I need it. I am the witness only. I have no shape of my own. You are so accustomed to thinking of yourselves as bodies having consciousness that you just cannot imagine consciousness as having bodies. Once you realize that bodily existence 
is but a state of mind, a movement in consciousness, that the ocean of consciousness is infinite and eternal, and that when in touch with consciousness, you are the witness only. You will be able to withdraw beyond consciousness altogether. We are told there are many levels of existence. Do you exist and function on all the levels? While you are on earth, are you also in heaven? I am nowhere to be found. I am not a thing to be given a place among other things. All things are in me, but I am not among things. You are telling me about the superstructure while I am concerned with the foundations. The superstructures rise and fall, but the foundations last. I am not interested in the transient, while you talk of nothing else. The Bhagavad Gita says, the sword does not cut it. It is literally so. It is in the nature of consciousness to survive its vehicles. It is like fire. It burns up the fuel, but not itself. Just like a fire can outlast a mountain of fuel, so does consciousness survive innumerable bodies. Be aware of being conscious and seek the source of consciousness. That is all. Very little can be conveyed in words. It is doing what I tell you that will bring light, not my telling you. The means do not matter much. It is the desire, the urge, the earnestness that counts. You can see both the image and the mirror. You are neither. Who are you? Don't go by formulas. The answer is not in words. The nearest you can say in words is, I am what makes perception possible. The life beyond the experiencer and his experience. Learn to separate yourself from the image and the mirror. Keep on remembering, I am neither the mind nor its ideas. Do it patiently and with conviction and you will surely come to the direct vision of yourself as the source of being, knowing, loving, eternal, all-embracing, all-pervading. You are the infinite, focused in a body. Now you see the body only. Try earnestly and you will come to see the infinite only.
all experience is necessarily transient, but the ground of all experience is immovable. Nothing that may be called an event will last, but some events purify the mind and some stain it. Moments of deep insight and all-embracing love purify the mind, while desires and fears, envy and anger, blind beliefs and intellectual arrogance pollute and dull the psyche. Is self-realization so important? Without it, you will be consumed by desires and fears, repeating themselves meaninglessly in endless suffering. Most people do not know that there can be an end to pain, but once they have heard the good news, obviously going beyond all strife and struggle is the most urgent task that can be. You know that you can be free, and now it is up to you. There is nothing to do, just be. Do nothing, be. No climbing mountains and sitting in caves. I do not even say be yourself since you do not know yourself. Just be. Having seen that you are neither the outer world of perceivables nor the inner world of thinkables, that you are neither body nor mind, just be. There are no steps to self-realization. There is nothing gradual about it. It happens suddenly and is irreversible. You rotate into a new dimension, seen from which the previous ones are mere abstractions. Just like on sunrise you see things as they are, so on self-realization you see everything as it is. The world of illusions is left behind. There can be progress only in the preparation, sadhana. Realization is sudden. The fruit ripens slowly but falls suddenly and without return. You will recognize that you have returned to your natural state by a complete absence of all desire and fear. After all, at the root of all desire and fear is the feeling of not being what you are. Just as a dislocated joint pains only as long as it is out of shape and is forgotten as soon as it is set right, so is all self-concern a symptom of mental distortion, which disappears as soon as one is in the normal state. Hold on to the sense, I am, to the exclusion of everything else. 
When thus the mind becomes completely silent, it shines with a new light and vibrates with new knowledge. It all comes spontaneously. You need only hold on to the I am. Just like emerging from sleep or a state of rapture, you feel rested, and yet you cannot explain why and how you come to feel so well. In the same way, on realization, you feel complete, fulfilled, free from the pleasure-pain complex, and yet not always able to explain what happened, why and how. You can put it only in negative terms. Nothing is wrong with me any longer. Don't try to convey it to others. If you can, it is not the real thing. Be silent and watch it expressing itself in action. How can anybody tell you what you shall become when there is no becoming? You merely discover what you are. All molding oneself to a pattern is a grievous waste of time. Think neither of the past nor of the future. Just be. Changes are inevitable in the changeful, but you are not subject to them. You are the changeless background against which changes are perceived. If you watch carefully, you will find that even your daily consciousness is in flashes, with gaps intervening all the time. What is in the gaps? What can there be but your real being that is timeless? Mind and mindlessness are one to it. The only proper place is within. The outer world neither can help you nor hinder. No system, no pattern of action will take you to your goal. Give up all working for a future. Concentrate totally on the now. And be concerned only with your response to every movement of life as it happens. If you are earnest, you will find that in the end, you will get fed up with roaming and regret the waste of energy and time. To find yourself, you need not take a single step. There can be no experience of the Absolute, as it is beyond all experience. 
On the other hand, the self is the experiencing factor in every experience, and thus, in a way, validates the multiplicity of experiences. The world may be full of things of great value, but if there is nobody to buy them, they have no price. The Absolute contains everything experienceable, but without the experiencer, they are as nothing. That which makes the experience possible is the Absolute. That which makes it actual is the Self. There can be no experience without desire for it. There can be gradation between desires, but between the most sublime desire and the freedom from all desire, there is an abyss which must be crossed. The unreal may look real, but it is transient. The real is not afraid of time. To the real, the unreal is not. It appears to be real only because you believe in it. Doubt it, and it ceases. When you are in love with somebody, you give it reality. You imagine your love to be all-powerful and everlasting. When it comes to an end, you say, I thought it was real, but it wasn't. Transiency is the best proof of unreality. What is limited in time and space, and applicable to one person only, is not real. The real is for all and forever. Above everything else, you cherish yourself. You would accept nothing in exchange for your existence. The desire to be is the strongest of all desires and will go only on the realization of your true nature. When the sun shines, colors appear. When it sets, they disappear. Where are the colors without the light? All thinking is in duality. In identity, no thought survives. You must unlearn everything. God is the end of all desire and knowledge. All desires must be given up, because by desiring you take the shape of your desires. When no desire remains, you revert to your natural state. You cannot know perfection. You can know only imperfection. For knowledge to be, there must be separation and disharmony. You can know what you are not. 
but you cannot know your real being. You can be only what you are. The entire approach is through understanding, which is in the seeing of the false as false. But to understand, you must observe from the outside. There can be no knowledge of the unmanifested. The potential is unknowable. Only the actual can be known. The knower knows the known. Do you know the knower? Who is the knower of the knower? You want to know the unmanifested. Can you say you know the manifested? The total is open and available, but you will not take it. You are attached to the little person you think yourself to be. Your desires are narrow, your ambitions petty. After all, without a center of perception, where would be the manifested? Unperceived, the manifested is as good as the unmanifested. And you are the perceiving point, the non-dimensional source of all dimensions. Know yourself as the total. There is enough space in a point for an infinity of universes. There is no lack of capacity. Self-limitation is the only problem. But you cannot run away from yourself. However far you go, you come back to yourself and to the need of understanding this point, which is as nothing, and yet the source of everything. You create the world, and then worry about it. Becoming selfish makes you weak. No need of practice, no need of any acts of renunciation. Just turn your mind away, that is all. Desire is merely the fixation of the mind on an idea. Get it out of its groove by denying it attention. Whatever may be the desire or fear, don't dwell upon it. Try and see for yourself. Here and there you may forget, it does not matter. Go back to your attempts till the brushing away of every desire and fear of every reaction becomes automatic. You can have all the emotions you want, 
but beware of reactions, of induced emotions. Be entirely self-determined and ruled from within, not from without. Merely giving up a thing to secure a better one is not true relinquishment. Give it up because you see its valuelessness. You have to give up everything to know that you need nothing, not even your body. Your needs are unreal and your efforts are meaningless. You imagine that your possessions protect you. In reality, they make you vulnerable. Realize yourself as away from all that can be pointed at, as this or that. You are unreachable by any sensory experience or verbal construction. Turn away from them. Refuse to impersonate. You must keep it in mind and ponder over it and try to understand the state of mind which makes me say what I say. I speak from truth. Stretch your hand and take it. You are not what you think yourself to be, I assure you. The image you have of yourself is made up from memories and is purely accidental. You have never been, nor shall ever be, a person. Refuse to consider yourself as one. But, as long as you do not even doubt yourself to be a Mr. So-and-so, there is little hope. When you refuse to open your eyes, what can you be shown? You are already perfect, here and now. You imagine yourself to be what you are not. Stop it. It is the cessation that is important, not what you are going to stop. Nothing compels. You are as you believe yourself to be. Stop believing. Nothing compels me. I do what needs doing. But you do so many unnecessary things. It is your refusal to examine that creates karma. It is the indifference to your own suffering that perpetuates it. Leave it all behind you. Forget it. Go forth, unburdened with ideas and beliefs. Abandon all verbal structures, all relative truth, all tangible objectives. The absolute can be reached by absolute devotion only. Don't be half-hearted. The real is simple. 
open, clear, kind, beautiful, and joyous. It is completely free of contradictions. It is ever new, ever fresh, endlessly creative. Being and non-being, life and death, all distinctions merge in it. The mind is what it thinks. To make it true, think true. In reality, there is only perception. The perceiver and the perceived are conceptual. The fact of perceiving is actual. The absolute is the birthplace of perceiving. It makes perception possible. But too much analysis leads you nowhere. There is in you the core of being which is beyond analysis, beyond the mind. You can know it in action only. Express it in daily life and its light will grow ever brighter. The legitimate function of the mind is to tell you what is not. But if you want positive knowledge, you must go beyond the mind. In the entire universe, is there one single thing of value? Yes, the power of love. The goal is shown by the guru. Obstacles are discovered by the disciple. The guru has no preferences, but those who have obstacles to overcome seem to be lagging behind. In reality, the disciple is not different from the guru. He is the same dimensionless center of perception and love in action. It is only his imagination and self-identification with the imagined that encloses him and converts him into a person. The guru is concerned little with the person. His attention is on the inner watcher. It is the task of the watcher to understand and thereby eliminate the person. While there is grace on one side, there must be dedication to the task on the other. The person is merely the result of a misunderstanding. In reality, 
There is no such thing. Feelings, thoughts, and actions race before the watcher in endless succession, leaving traces in the brain and creating an illusion of continuity. A reflection of the watcher in the mind creates the sense of I, and the person acquires an apparently independent existence. In reality, there is no person, only the watcher identifying himself with the I and the mind. The teacher tells the watcher, you are not this, there is nothing of yours in this, except the little point of I am, which is the bridge between the watcher and his dream. I am this, I am that, is dream. While pure I am has the stamp of reality on it. You have tasted so many things, all came to naught. Only the sense I am persisted, unchanged. Stay with the changeless among the changeful, until you are able to go beyond. Neither ignorance nor illusion ever happened to you. Find the self to which you ascribe ignorance and illusion, and your question will be answered. You talk as if you know the self and see it to be under the sway of ignorance and illusion. But, in fact, you do not know the self, nor are you aware of ignorance. By all means, become aware. This will bring you to the self and you will realize that there is neither ignorance nor delusion in it. It is like saying, if there is a sun, how can darkness be? As under a stone there will be darkness, however strong the sunlight, so in the shadow of the I am the body consciousness, there must be ignorance and delusion. But why did the body consciousness come into being? Don't ask why, ask how. It is in the nature of creative imagination to identify itself with its creations. You can stop it any moment by switching off attention. Or through investigation. First, you create a world. Then, the I am becomes a person who is not happy for various reasons. He goes out in search of happiness, meets a guru who tells him you are not a person. Find who you are. He does it and goes beyond. Why did he not do it at the very start? It did not occur to him. He needed somebody to tell him.
Why do Indian teachers advocate inactivity? Most of people's activities are valueless, if not outright destructive. Dominated by desire and fear, they can do nothing good. Ceasing to do evil precedes beginning to do good. Hence, the need for stopping all activities for a time to investigate one's urges and their motives. See all that is false in one's life. Purge the mind of all evil and then only restart work beginning with one's obvious duties. Of course, if you have a chance to help somebody, by all means do it, and promptly too. Don't keep him waiting till you are perfect. But do not become a professional do-gooder. What are the fruits of self-awareness? You grow more intelligent. In awareness, you learn. In self-awareness, you learn about yourself. Of course, you can only learn what you are not. To know what you are, you must go beyond the mind. Is not awareness beyond the mind? Awareness is the point at which the mind reaches out beyond itself into reality. In awareness, you seek not what pleases, but what is true. Have you felt the all-embracing emptiness in which the universe swims like a cloud in the blue sky? Destroy the wall that separates the I am the body idea and the inner and the outer will become one. Am I to die? Physical destruction is meaningless. It is the clinging to sensate life that binds you. If you could experience the inner void fully, the explosion into the totality would be near. All changes in consciousness are due to the I am the body idea. Divested of this idea, the mind becomes steady. There is pure being. Free of experiencing anything in particular. But to realize it, you must do what your teacher tells you. Mere listening, even memorizing, is not enough. If you do not struggle hard to apply every word of it in your daily life, don't complain that you made no progress. All real progress is irreversible. Ups and downs merely show that the teaching has not been taken to heart and translated into action fully. As long as you believe yourself to be a body, 
you will ascribe causes to everything. I do not say things have no causes. Each thing has innumerable causes. It is as it is because the world is as it is. Every cause in its ramifications covers the universe. When you realize that you are absolutely free to be what you consent to be, that you appear to be because of ignorance or indifference, you are free to revolt and change. You allow yourself to be what you are not. You are looking for the causes of being what you are not. It is a futile search. There are no causes, but your ignorance of your real being, which is perfect and beyond all causation. For whatever happens, the entire universe is responsible, and you are the source of the universe. You concentrate, you meditate, you torture your mind and body, you do all sorts of unnecessary things, but you miss the essential, which is the elimination of the person. To me, all delay is a waste of time. You can skip all the preparation and go directly for the ultimate search within. Of all the yogas, it is the simplest and the shortest. Immobility and silence are not inactive. The flower fills the space with perfume, the candle with light. They do nothing, yet they change everything by their mere presence. You can photograph the candle, but not its light. You can know the man, his name and appearance, but not his influence. His very presence is action. Everybody wants to be active, but where do his actions originate? There is no central point. Each action begets another, meaninglessly and painfully, in endless succession. The alternation of work and pause is not there. First, find the immutable center where all movement takes birth. Just like a wheel turns round an axle so must you always be at the axle, in the center, and not whirling at the periphery. How do I go about it in practice? Whenever a thought or emotion of desire or fear comes to your mind, just turn away from it. By suppressing my thoughts and feelings, I shall provoke a reaction. I am not talking 
of suppression. Just refuse attention. It has nothing to do with effort. Just turn away. Look between the thoughts rather than at the thoughts. When you happen to walk in a crowd, you do not fight every man you meet. You just find your way between. When you fight, you invite a fight. But when you do not resist, you meet with no resistance. When you refuse to play the game, you are out of it. How long will it take me to get free of the mind? It may take a thousand years, but really, no time is required. All you need is to be in dead earnest. Here, the will is the deed. If you are sincere, you have it. After all, it is a matter of attitude. Nothing stops you from being a yani here and now, except fear. You are afraid of being impersonal, of impersonal being. It is all quite simple. Turn away from your desires and fears and from the thoughts they create, and you are at once in your natural state. Leave your mind alone. That is all. Don't go along with it. After all, there is no such thing as mind apart from thoughts which come and go, obeying their own laws, not yours. They dominate you only because you are interested in them. It is exactly as Christ said. Resist not evil. By resisting evil, you merely strengthen it. There is nothing to renounce. Enough if you stop acquiring. To give up, you must have and to have you must take. Better don't take. It is simpler than to practice renunciation, which leads to a dangerous form of spiritual pride. All this weighing, selecting, choosing, exchanging, it is all shopping in some spiritual market. What is your business there? What deal are you out to strike? When you are not out for business, what is the use of this endless anxiety of choice? Restlessness takes you nowhere. Something prevents you from seeing that there is nothing you need. The sense 
I am a person in time and space is the poison. In a way, time itself is the poison. In time, all things come to an end and new are born, to be devoured in their turn. Do not identify yourself with time. Do not ask anxiously, what next? What next? Step out of time and see it devour the world. Say, well, it is in the nature of time to put an end to everything. Let it be. It does not concern me. I am not combustible, nor do I need to collect fuel. Can the witness be there without things to witness? There is always something to witness. If not a thing, then its absence. Witnessing is natural and no problem. The problem is excessive interest leading to self-identification. Whatever you are engrossed in, you take to be real. What is pure, unalloyed, unattached, is real. What is tainted, mixed up, dependent, and transient, is unreal. Do not be misled by words. One word may convey several and even contradictory meanings. The I am that pursues the pleasant and shuns the unpleasant is false. The I am that sees pleasure and pain as inseparable sees rightly. The witness that is enmeshed in what he perceives is the person. The witness who stands aloof unmoved and untouched is the watchtower of the real. The point at which awareness inherent in the unmanifested contacts the manifested. There can be no universe without the witness. There can be no witness without the universe. Leave the desirables to those who desire. Change the current of your desire from taking to giving. The passion for giving, for sharing, will naturally wash the idea of an external world out of your mind, and of giving as well. Only the pure radiance of love will remain beyond giving and receiving. In love, there is not even the one. How can there be two? Love is the refusal to separate, to make distinctions. Before you can think of unity, you must first create duality. When you truly love, you do not say, I love you. Where there is mentation, there is duality. Why 
Why don't you create your own environment? The world has only as much power over you as you give it. Rebel. Go beyond duality. Make no difference between East and West. Do nothing. Be yourself. Stay out. Look beyond. When you know your true being, you have no problems. Fearlessness comes by itself when you see that there is nothing to be afraid of. When you walk in a crowded street, you just bypass people. Some see you, some you just glance at, but you do not stop. It is the stopping that creates the bottleneck. Keep moving. Disregard names and shapes. Don't be attached to them. Your attachment is your bondage. What should I do when a man slaps me on my face? You will react according to your character, inborn or acquired. A jeweler who wants to refashion an ornament first melt it down to shapeless gold. Similarly, one must return to one's original state before a new name and form can emerge. Death is essential for renewal. Awareness is dynamic. Love is being. Awareness is love in action. By itself, the mind can actualize any number of possibilities. But unless they are prompted by love, they are valueless. Love precedes creation. Without it, there is only chaos. True action does not displace, it transforms. A change of place is mere transportation. A change of heart is action. Just remember, nothing perceivable is real. Active is not action. Action is hidden, unknown, unknowable. You can only know the fruit. Is not God the all-doer? Why do you bring in an outer doer? The world recreates itself out of itself. It is an endless process the transitory, begetting the transitory. It is your ego 
that makes you think that there must be a doer. You create a god in your own image, however dismal the image. Through the film of your mind, you project a world and also a god to give it cause and purpose. It is all imagination. Step out of it. This is the mystery of imagination, that it seems to be so real. You may be celibate or married, a monk or a family man. That is not the point. Are you a slave of your imagination? Or are you not? Whatever decision you take, whatever work you do, it will be invariably based on imagination, on assumption parading as facts. Here I am sitting in front of you what part of it is imagination? The whole of it. Even space and time are imagined. Does it mean that I don't exist? I too do not exist. All existence is imaginary. Is being too imaginary? Pure being, filling all and beyond all, is not existence, which is limited. All limitation is imaginary. Only the unlimited is real. When I look through the mind, I see numberless people. When I look beyond the mind, I see the witness. Beyond the witness, there is the infinite intensity of emptiness and silence. How to deal with people? Why make plans? And what for? Such questions show anxiety. Relationship is a living thing. Be at peace with your inner self and you will be at peace with everybody. Realize that you are not the master of what happens. You cannot control the future, except in purely technical matters. Human relationship cannot be planned. It is too rich and varied. Just be understanding and compassionate, free of all self-seeking. You cannot avoid action. It happens like everything else. You must be free first 
to be free in the world, you must be free of the world. Otherwise, your past decides for you and your future. Between what had happened and what must happen, you are caught. Call it destiny or karma, but never freedom. First, return to your true being and then act from the heart of love. The person is of little use. It is deeply involved in its own affairs and is completely ignorant of its true being. It is the witness that makes realization desirable and attainable. The person by itself will not become the witness. It is like expecting a cold candle to start burning in the course of time. The person can stay in the darkness of ignorance forever, unless the flame of awareness touches it. Who lights the candle? The Guru. His words. His presence. In India, it is very often the mantra. Once the candle is lit, the flame will consume the candle. Why is the mantra so effective? Constant repetition of the mantra is something the person does, not do for one's own sake. The beneficiary is not the person just like the candle which does not increase by burning. Can the person be aware of itself by itself? Yes, it happens sometimes as a result of much suffering. The Guru wants to save you the endless pain. Such is his grace. Even when there is no discoverable outer guru, there is always the sadguru, the inner guru, who directs and helps from within. The words outer and inner are relative to the body only. In reality, all is one. The person may be conscious, but is not aware of being conscious. When the darkness is questioned, it dissolves. The desire to question is planted by the Guru. In other words, the difference between the person and the witness is as between not knowing and knowing oneself. The very desire to be ready means that the Guru had come and the flame is lit. It may be a stray word or a page in a book. The Guru's grace works mysteriously. It is not the person that is doing sadhana. The person is in unrest and resistant to the very end. 
It is the witness that works on the person, on the totality of its illusions, past, present, and future. The proof of the truth lies in its effect on the listener. The effect need not necessarily be an experience. It can be a change in character, in motivation, in relationship to people and oneself. Trances and visions induced by words or drugs or any other sensory or mental means are temporary and inconclusive. The truth of what is said here is immovable and everlasting. And the proof of it is in the listener in the deep and permanent changes in his entire being. It is not something he can doubt, unless he doubts his own existence, which is unthinkable. I am, and I know I am. You cannot ask for further proof. When the words are spoken, there is silence. When the relative is over, the absolute remains. The silence before the words were spoken, is it different? from the silence that comes after? The silence is one, and without it, the words could not have been heard. It is always there, at the back of the words. Shift your attention from words to silence. and you will hear it. The mind craves for experience, the memory of which it takes for knowledge. The yani is beyond all experience, and his memory is empty of the past. He is entirely unrelated to anything in particular. But the mind craves for formulations and definitions, always eager to squeeze reality into a verbal shape. Of everything, it wants an idea. For without ideas, the mind is not. Reality is essentially alone, but the mind will not leave it alone and deals instead with the unreal. And yet, it is all the mind can do. Discover the unreal as unreal. There is no such state as seeing the real. Who is to see what? You can only be the real, which you are anyhow. The problem is only mental. Abandon false ideas. That is all. There is no need of true ideas. There aren't any.
Why then are we encouraged to seek the real? The mind must have a purpose to encourage it to free itself from the unreal. It is promised something in return. In reality, there is no need of purpose. Being free from the false is good in itself. It wants no reward. It is just like being clean, which is its own reward. The reward of self-knowledge is freedom from the personal self. You cannot know the knower, for you are the knower. I know that I am all. I do not need to keep on repeating, I am all, I am all. Only when you take me to be a particular, a person, I protest. As you are a man all the time, so I am what I am all the time. Whatever you are changelessly, that you are beyond all doubt. You identify yourself with your desires and become their slave. To me, desires are things among other things, mere clouds in the mental sky, and I do not feel compelled to act on them. The knower is the unmanifested, the known is the manifested. The known is always on the move, it changes, it has no shape of its own, no dwelling place. The knower is the immutable support of all knowledge. Each needs the other, but reality lies beyond. The Yani cannot be known, because there is nobody to be known. When there is a person, you can say something about it. But when there is no self-identification with the particular, what can be said? You may tell Ayani anything. His question will always be, about whom are you talking? There is no such person. Just as you cannot say anything about the universe because it includes everything, so nothing can be said about a yani, for he is all and yet nothing in particular. You need a hook to hang your picture on when there is no hook on what will the picture hang? To locate a thing, you need space. To place an event, you need time. But the timeless and spaceless defies all handling. It makes everything perceivable, yet itself it is beyond perception. The mind cannot know what is beyond the mind. But the mind is known 
by what is beyond it. The Yani knows neither birth nor death. Existence and non-existence are the same to him. When your body dies, you remain? Nothing dies. The body is just imagined. There is no such thing. Time will come to an end. This is called the great death, the death of time. The universe is your personal experience. How can it be affected? You might have been delivering a lecture for two hours. Where has it gone? when it is over. It has merged into silence, in which the beginning, middle, and end of the lecture are all together. Time has come to a stop. It was, but is no more. The silence after a life of talking and the silence after a life of silence is the same silence. Immortality is freedom from the feeling I am. Yet it is not extinction. On the contrary, it is a state infinitely more real, aware, and happy than you can possibly think of. Only self-consciousness is no more. The mind has its limits. It is enough to bring you to the very frontiers of knowledge and make you face the immensity of the unknown. To dive in it is up to you. What about the witness? Is it real or unreal? It is both, the last remnant of illusion, the first touch of the real. The moment you say, I am, the entire universe comes into being along with its creator. Duality lasts as long as it is not questioned. The Trinity, Mind, Self, and Spirit, when looked into, becomes unity.
everybody desires to be, to survive, to continue, for no one is sure of himself. But everybody is immortal. You make yourself mortal by taking yourself to be the body. Attachment destroys courage. The giver is always ready to give. The taker is absent. Freedom means letting go. People just do not care to let go of everything. They do not know that the finite is the price of the infinite, as death is the price of immortality. Spiritual maturity lies in the readiness to let go of everything. The giving up is the first step. But the real giving up is in realizing that there is nothing to give up for nothing is your own. It is like deep sleep. You do not give up your bed when you fall asleep. You just forget it. Awareness with an object we call witnessing. In reality, there is only one state. When distorted by self-identification, it is called a person. When colored with the sense of being, it is the witness. When colorless and limitless, it is called the Supreme. Existence is momentary, always in time and space, while reality is changeless and all-pervading. As a person, your existence is momentary. But are you a person only? Are you a person at all? All the paths take you to the purification of the mind. The impure mind is opaque to truth. The pure mind is transparent. Truth can be seen through it easily and clearly. Variety and diversity do not create separation. You imagine reality 
to stand apart from names and forms, while to me, names and forms are the ever-changing expressions of reality and not apart from it. You ask for the proof of truth, while to me, all existence is the proof. You separate existence from being and being from reality, while to me, it is all one. However much you are convinced of the truth of your waking state, you do not claim it to be permanent and changeless, as I do when I talk of mine. Yet I see no difference between us, except that you are imagining things, while I do not. You will find you know nothing for sure. You trust on hearsay. To know the truth, you must pass through your own experience. You are asking for truth, but in fact, you merely seek comfort, which you want to last forever. Now, nothing, no state of mind can last forever. In time and space, there is always a limit because time and space themselves are limited. And in the timeless, the words forever have no meaning. The same with the proof of truth. In the realm of non-duality, everything is complete. Its own proof meaning, and purpose. Where all is one, no supports are needed. 